So, Marina, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. I'm Sue Tutty, and I'm the chair of the Auckland Faculty Board for the College of GPs. Just before we get going, I would like to do a, a few thank yous, really, and to thank our speakers who have very generously given up their time today to prepare and deliver these presentations today. I'd also like to thank Camp Counties Manukau DHB for their help in organising the programme and the Goodfellow Unit for their work in facilitating this event, and particularly to Louise, who's our moderator today. And finally, I would like to thank all our members for supporting this event and coming along today. The Auckland Faculty Board has put together two educational events a year for, that are free to our members. An update towards the beginning of the year that is on topics that have recently changed and it's based loosely on the pathways and the pathways that have been updated. And that's the event that we're hosting today. And then later in the year, around September or October, we'll be running the series that you're perhaps more used to that has followed through on a specialty each year. So this year, that event will be on the 24th of September and will be on women's health. Some of you may remember our event last year on pediatrics. So we hope to have this one face to face and see you all there. We assume our GPs are, are well aware of the pathways. This is the pathways and you can see the URL at the top to get onto those. And out the side, there's um, information about the pathways. So the first one is about um, learning more about the pathways, about using them. And you can see under that one, that there's a, a link to um, Sorry, I'll go back one. There's a link to useful websites. And because Health Pathways is now embedded into our practice management system, I often use that one to actually go to other pathways like DermNet or POAC. So it's really, really useful to have that link there. You'll find all sorts of things on pathways that are, that are, are, are useful. And actually there's a pathway page on GP liaisons that you'll find all of us on there as well. So all sorts of things. Um, I find now, you know how it used to be, if you want to know something, go to Google. Now it's in primary care. If you want to know something, go to Pathways. <laughs> so what is Health Pathways? How to use them, how to put shortcuts and bookmarks, how to send feedback. If you find something on Pathways you don't agree with, let us know because Pathways are dynamic and they will change according to the feedback we get. So send that through to us. And then we've got some people on this webinar that don't belong to Auckland. So there's other pathways that have been regionalized to your regions. And there's some contacts there of how to link yourself into those pathways. So that's all I wanted to say this morning before we get going. Um, we'll get started on our presentations now. I'm sorry that there's no opportunity for questions today. It's such a fast moving platform and we've got so many different speakers that I hope you'll all enjoy the content for today, but we can't cope with questions in this format. We look forward to being able to do face to face again in the future. There's going to be some breaks through the morning, so a chance to stretch your legs and get some fresh air, but not for too long. Grab your coffee and come back for the next session. So I hope you enjoy your day and we'll get started now. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Kia ora, everyone. I'm Dr. Louise Kugler from the Goodfellow Unit, and I'll be moderating today, as Sue said. Um, thank you for joining us, and it's great to have you here. Um, there have actually been some last minute program changes, for which I apologise, but everyone will know someone who's unwell at the moment. So um, we have had a program change, and Ollie has very kindly offered to to, to do some QA, Q and A's, which um, so we'll be very pleased about. So our third session this morning will be Q and A on diabetic topics and questions. So you can use the Q and A function for this. Um, this will be the only session that we have Q and A's for. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Ollie Schmiedel. Ollie is a consultant endocrinologist, diabetologist and general medicine physician at Auckland DHB. 
and he's a service clinical director of the Auckland Diabetes Centre. He's involved in education, training and service development projects with a strong focus on supporting primary care. He also works in private at Green Lane Medical Specialists. So we have Ollie for the next hour. Ollie, kia ora and welcome this morning. Good morning, welcome kia ora. So I just start sharing my slides and then we should be all good. Yeah, so what I was thinking this morning, I start with a case, go straight in, and we'll use a case to ask a couple of questions to, to see how actually we can use the pathways. And then I will focus the next um, half an hour, 40 minutes on the new medication, because I guess there are a number of questions that people really want to ask about them. So this is a case I actually saw this week. It's a um, 70 year old European lady who had type two diabetes for a while, as you can read there, and she has a number of obesity related complications, but she also has obesity with a BMI of 46 and a number of obesity related complications as for example, atrial fibrillation, hypertension, dyslipidemia. She's on large doses of insulin and metformin, but actually not on any of the new medication. She's anticoagulated for atrial fibrillation. She has blood pressure and lipid treatment and a rate controlling medication. And she was assessed for a bariatric surgery a number of years ago. And because at this time the EGFR was 42, she was declined from surgery. These are her previous lab results. So her H1C was not too good. She had quite significant CKD stage three kidney failure, but only minimal microalbuminuria and a decent cholesterol control. And that was a referral really, she hadn't had a medical review for a while. She was on large doses of insulin, weight of, of concern, and apparently she had also emotional eating. So when I saw her, it was her BMI, her blood pressure, and she had a little bit pitting edema, but otherwise her chest was clear. She was in atrial fibrillation and there were no added heart sounds. What I didn't put in here, she had an echo probably four or five years ago that showed mild right-sided failure. So she also had pain at the first MTP joint on the left foot. She had moderately to poor controlled type two. She had um, only borderline micromanuria, as I mentioned here in red, which is an important finding. So she had fatty liver disease or a biochemical evidence of fatty liver disease, good lipid control, and a progressive decline in her EGFR down to 34. The urate was raised together with a clinical picture, and she had a mild raised CRP. So, now, how can one use the pathways in this clinical context? Now, you probably have used the pathways more than I have used, but I believe there are probably two bits that you can use them for. And I guess the main idea is for management. I believe that you still have to assess patients as you would do as a comprehensive assessment. And when you need particular management decisions, then the pathways are a great tool to have. And I will show you how one can go down this way. So yes, assessment in a clinical context, her obesity is a driver for many of her problems, but it isn't the only thing. And as, when I spoke to her, she felt a little bit fobbed off about, everyone says, oh, your problems are weight related. But actually when you look beyond the label of obesity, there's a lot of things to consider and then you come actually into obesity related complications and uh, diabetes related complications and then it all starts falling into place makes a little bit more sense and for her the red flags were really uh, she didn't have a medication review she was on large doses of insulin she had progressive renal failure and she had dyspnea and autopnea in the context of atrial fibrillation of, of obesity which is clearly a significant increased risk of mortality. So management really belongs into a renal management and there your guidelines would help. Cardiac management, again, the guidelines would help. Um, medication choices for diabetes, as I will show you, will help. And of course, gout is also on the pathways. 
And in her context, of course, what I always do, just to put a little bit in here, I always assess their eating behaviors. And she had mainly increased hunger and reduced satiation, actually minimal emotional eating. And I always put obesity in the context of how people relate to it, how they internalize it, and uh, what they can do about it, and how, how much support structures they have. So that are your pathways. So there's a pathway for insulin, pathway for renal, for cardiac, for non-insulin medications, and for gout. Now, I don't have the time to go into them all together, but um, it's great to actually go through and you will find a very detailed, with lots of links way of going through, and most people have probably used them. Now, what it also links you to is to the NZSSD new guidelines. Now, the links are active, but I thought it might be easier if I actually show you just what the guidelines look like. So these are the guidelines from NZSSD together with the Ministry of Health. And as you can see on the right hand side, very similar than in the pathways, you have a drop down menu for all of the different management tools. Right? So from screening over lifestyle, insulin, non-insulin, management of complications, sick day management, pregnancy driving, everything is actually on there. And Oh, so at the beginning of the top, you see management and insulin. These are actually real uh, helpful one page diagrams that guide you through. So here's, for example, uh, about the management of diabetes. And you can see the initial steps. And then you assess whether there is renal disease, heart failure, cardiovascular disease. And then you go down the pinkish orange part where you assess basically whether it's an SGLT2 or a GLP-1 agonist as your uh, second line treatment. And if it is not present, then you go to the right side and you have here basically second and third line agents. And again, you assess based on your findings, i.e. risk of hypoglycemia, and need for cardiovascular benefit weight, which medication you would use. And as you can see, insulin has made it into a third line agent there. And that is a very helpful bit about starting insulin. I often get asked by primary care how to start insulin. And you can actually go through in your own time. It is all available on the uh, links, uh, when to start insulin, how to start insulin, how much insulin to start, which insulin to start, when to start it, and then you can go down um, when you need more insulin, when you go away from your once daily background insulin to either a basal plus or a mixed insulin. And a good point I want to just highlight there, when you come over 0.5 units per kilogram of a background insulin, it's time to put a mealtime insulin in. Because I often see people who are on uh, very large doses of only once daily insulin and gain weight and do not achieve good control. So once you come to a decent dose of background insulin, it's a time to put a mealtime insulin in. And this guide really helps you which one to use. And at the bottom, I cut a little bit off, you see also other practical tips, how to titrate insulin. So it's a real good guide and I encourage people to go and look at and read it through in their own time. Now, that's, I wanted to ask you this question. I realized it isn't interactive. So what I hope that you can think back about the case I just presented and see what would you choose? Would you increase or change your insulin? Would you start here on empagliflozin? Would you start here on vildagliptin? Or would you choose dulaglutide? Uh, sorry, there's a spelling in there. So, What's about a heart failure? Is this preserved or reduced ejection fraction? Do uh, you have any clinical indication which one it could be and which medication would help the best? Or uh, are there other possible reasons why she's short of breath? And what are the questions about her renal failure? Is this diabetic nephropathy? She had diabetes for a long time. Is this obesity related focal cemental glomerulosclerosis or other forms of kidney disease? And of course, how would you treat her gout, which she probably needs to be treated at this time. So what I was thinking is you had a moment in time to make up your mind which 
management option you would use for this particular patient. Then now I will give you the background information and then we come at the end of the talk back to this question and see whether in the Q&A sessions you actually can answer yourself or whether you have further questions with regarding to the management of this particular case. So it gives you a little bit open thinking space. So just a background information about um, what we have available really started off last year. So it's a great opportunity because we now have modern diabetes treatment available after many years. We have a great need for it because we have large numbers of people with type 2 diabetes. Many of them are not treated to target. Uh, Maori and Pacific, the mortality is higher and especially renal mortality is significantly higher. Dialysis use is much higher. And so not only have we the need and now the medication, but we also have great teaching and background tools to actually help primary care to use the medication. And just a little bit in there, we're doing at the moment uh, work with the um, PHOs and secondary care services to actually see what the uptake of the new medication is in primary care. So yes, the link on the bottom is a slide uh, which I will show you. Um, sorry, this is a slide, uh, this, the link to the uh, slides I just showed you for the NZSSD. So this is a link that uh, type 2 diabetes, nzssd.org.nz, where you find what I just showed you. And just to say, we are aligned with international standards at the moment. This is the uh, international guideline came out in 2019. And a couple of years ago, we were just in a little green corner where we had available on medication. And now we actually have the full range of medication. And as you can see, again, you have cardiovascular, you have people who want to minimize hypoglycemia and people who want to lose weight. So very similar than the uh, NZ SSD guidelines. Now, on a practical uh, term, how do you choose medication? Well, it's a mix and match kind, because you can add a lot of medication together. And that's kind of a good concept to think about. So you have on the pancreas, either your insulin, which you can give, or you have a sulfonylurea, which increases insulin secretion. You have on the gut, you have your GLP-1 uh, inhibitors or your DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 agonists or DPP-4 inhibitors. You have on the liver, the picture dropped out there, sorry. You have your metformin, which increases hepatic glucose production and actually reduces insulin resistance in the liver. You have your S32 inhibitors on the kidney. You have your TZDs on the muscle. And it's of course controlled over the brain, especially eating behavior, feeding behavior, food intake, all those things are of course controlled as well. So you have different areas where you can use medication. And that I really put it into groups. So, and that's important when you put the groups in because you can say you have a medication from each group. You cannot have DPP-4 and GLP-1 agonist together. When you put insulin and SUs together, you need to know that you can get hypoglycemia. You can have metformin and TZDs together and SGLT2s work differently. So they are a separate group. So you could have a medication from each of the group and that gives you a whole broader range how you can actually manage type two diabetes. Now coming a few more slides, a little bit deeper about the uh, SGLT2. So that's a normal, handling of glucose on the kidney. So the majority of glucose that get filtered get reabsorbed in the proximal tubule and only a small amount gets excreted in the urine. Uh, now in the, or when you use SGLD2 inhibitors, you basically inhibit uh, a enzyme that allows reabsorption of glucose and sodium, as the name says, and therefore you will have a significant amount of glucose in the urine 
and you will also excrete extra salt and water follows salt. So you will have also the diuretic effect that you see with the S22 inhibitors. So you get glucose urea and therefore you can also imagine, you know why you get the side effects that you see with the, with the medication. Now, it is not only sodium and glucose handling, but it's also what is actually very important an uh, impact on glomerular pressure. And that is where you see, or that's a reason why you see improved kidney survival, why you actually see uh, the initial drop of EGFR and why you see the longer term protection of the kidney. So that actually reduces the interglomerular pressure or the hyperfiltration that you see in early diabetic kidney disease. And the medication, of course, has other impacts. So there's a whole other positive array. So you see on the glucose urea on the bottom, you see a reduction in A2NC, you see a negative calorie balance on weight loss. You see also the benefit on gout, so hyperuricosuria uh, and reducing plasma uric acid. But you also see the cardiac benefit. So you have a volume reduction, blood pressure reduction, and you have also some uh, remodeling on the heart, which reduces arrhythmias. And it already mentioned the reduced intraglomerular pressure. So that's why really these medications aren't only diabetes medication. They are taken up widely by the cardiologist and by the renal doctors. So it's basically a medication that really reaches beyond diabetes. And we now have the ability to treat diabetes, not only glucocentric, but basically with a cardiovascular lens. And these are just the studies that are behind the major medications. So as you're probably aware, we had, well, we still have dapagliflozin, we have empagliflozin now funded, but there's yes, also carnagliflozin and ertogliflozin internationally available. So the EMPA-REC trial was really one of the landmark trials for the medication. As you can see here, all the different uh, SGLD2s compared. It was a trial that had 7,000 patients in, uh, 100% had cardiovascular background history, and, and there was a number of patients who had reduced EGFR. And what these trials all showed, that they basically had um, the major outcomes, mostly cardiovascular combined outcomes, were uh, good efficiency as a class effect. They had reduced cardiovascular deaths, uh, they had reduced heart failure, uh, renal benefit and the heart failure is mostly heart failure hospitalization. And here you see the graphs, you see the combined in, uh, outcomes of empagliflozin and red reduces it. Here you see, probably most people have seen the slides, the early separation of the curves with heart failure hospitalization. And here you see the other two as well, so the overall primary outcome and even the deaths from any uh, cause significantly reduced. And these are large post-marketing studies from international trials. You can see 200,000 people in these post-marketing studies and the significant benefit on all-cause mortality and equally an all-cause um, significant benefit, 300,000 patients on heart failure. So in the trials, as well as in clinical practice, good data that this medication works well. And that's just another reminder of what I already showed you is that it has a significant impact on hyperfiltration that is a part of early diabetic kidney disease. So it protects your kidneys, but it has also another impact on uh, sodium and potassium handling. And the exciting bit is it actually reduces potassium. And I will show you some slides in a moment where there is actually good evidence that it reduces hyperkalemia, which is often a effect of treating people with heart failure with ACE, ARBs, or spironolactone. Here you actually reduce potassium and you prevent hyperkalemia. So these are the um, big studies that 
followed um, really the emperor trial and we have the emperor reduced and emperor preserved as well as the DARPA heart failure study. So that's why different studies that were studies where you didn't had um, all patients need to have type two diabetes. Roughly 50% of the patients enrolled in these studies had diabetes. The other 50% did not have diabetes. Those were studies mainly for heart failure. So you can see here, um, I just put a, a few words in that there's a difference between heart failure with reduced and heart failure with preserved ejection fractions. Reduced is your myocardial ischemia and um, preserved ejection fraction is a long-term process, 10 to 15 years, where you get a multi-system, a systemic multi-organ reserve dysfunction due to fibrosis, microvascular changes. So that's really what you had in the traditional right heart failure. And that is important to say it develops slowly in the background over many years. And therefore treating early is actually important. That's why like when you had the case at the beginning, the heart failure that develops over many years, if you use this medication earlier, you actually achieve much better long-term outcome. So that is just giving you a couple of background data just to see what the outcome were of the two studies. So Emperor reduced, they had all an ejection fraction less than 40%. Their pre-specified outcome was um, heart failure hospitalization, deaths and renal decline, and around 30% relative risk reduction for heart failure and 25 for the composite outcome. So the emperor preserved was interesting because these are people who had benefit up to an ejection fraction of 60%. And we don't have many medications. The only other medication that we really have in this group is diuretics. So now you have people with relatively preserved left ventricular function who have heart failure, get often what we call traditionally right heart failure or with autopnea, peripheral edema, and here you see a significant benefit on 10 milligrams of empagliflozin only. So their main outcome was a 26% reduction in the primary outcome and an 18% in the cardiovascular outcome. And the main benefit was really if people had pre-existing heart failure, probable vascular disease on AF. So that's where you see the biggest reduction. And another trial that was run here as one of the centers in Auckland where it was sotagliflozin, which is a dual SGLT2, one and two inhibitor. And again, that's a medication that works actually also in patients who have preserved ejection fraction. This medication is not available in New Zealand. And a couple more slides about the kidney, as I mentioned already. Um, it has an impact on the glomerular dynamics, really. And there it works quite nicely in synergism with A's and R's. So it basically, one works on the afferent, one works on the afferent vessel in the glomerular, and together they reduce glomerular pressure. So it's great to combine them. Uh, because you get less tubular workflow, you also get reduced oxygen, oxygen consumption and you reduce acute kidney injury. So I'm always cautious in the acute kidney stage, but here you can actually also see from these two studies, Credence and DARPA CKD, that it actually also confirmed benefit in acute kidney injury. And from experience, my nephrology colleagues are far more aggressive with this medication than we are in the diabetes world. And as I mentioned already, uh, it has an impact on potassium excretion. So it uh, reduces the need for potassium binders and you get less hyperkalemia in people who are on ACE and ARPS or mineral corticotraceptor antagonists. You also have a benefit on hematocrit. So there's one because you have a diuretic effect, hemoconcentration, but you also get an increased production of erythropoietin and therefore you can start your EPO, what you get in uh, renal impairment or your renal anemia, you can start your EPO later. And you see a, a reduction in blood pressure. 
That's important. We had a number of patients who get hypotensive, uh, falling over, um, got autostatic problems. So you might need to reduce diuretics, especially when people are on multiple diuretics and you add an SGRD2 inhibitor. And that is the um, DAPA CKD outcome data. So what basically was DAPA glyphosate looking into patients with kidney disease. And this was a group of patients who had down an EGFR down to 15. And what was the interesting finding here? That there was no difference um, whether the patient had diabetes, prediabetes, or no diabetes at all. And actually the greatest numerical benefit, even if it was not significant, was actually in prediabetes. So prediabetes, again, early start is really vital to get the most out of this medication. And it works in different uh, forms of kidney disease. So it works in FSGS, diabetic nephropathy, different glomerulopathies. It doesn't work in hypertensive nephropathy. And it works independent of the stage of your kidney, even down to uh, CKD stage four. But one thing what you need to be aware that at this stage, it isn't anymore a diabetes medication. So when you go under an EGFR of 30, it does very little to your improved glycemic control. It's mainly a medication for heart failure and kidney preservation. This is a diagram just showing you about the drop in the EGFR. So you see the initial drop in EGFR is presenting, presenting very well. But you see then roughly after a year, the two lines cross. The darker line is your SGLD2 inhibitor and the gray line is placebo. Yeah. Okay. So this is um, just a question. People, a lot of people ask me, um, what about the drop in EGFR? How much do I need to be concerned or worried about? So the drop really starts two weeks after initiation. So that's the time when you want to do your electrolyte measurements. I generally allow a, a drop after 10 up to 10%. So seven to 8% is roughly the mean. It is independent from where you start, whether you start of an EGFR of 45 or 25, uh, you will see a similar drop. And interestingly, interestingly enough, the people who have the biggest drop, they get actually the biggest benefit in terms of reduction of protein urine. And as I already showed you, the two lines cross after approximately 12 months. So based on this data, DARPA glyphosate is licensed in the UK, for example, uh, up to an EGFR, down to an EGFR of 15. As I mentioned already, it's not really any more glycemic benefit at this level. And it works most in people, or the greatest benefit you get in people who have heart failure, prone vascular disease, and atrial fibrillation. And as I put down here, uh, patients with atrial fibrillation uh, they have a six-fold increase in cardiovascular deaths and hospitalization, and uh, DARPA, as well as empagliflozin, is of particular benefit for this group of, uh, with regards to morbidity and mortality. Of course, we're all aware about the side effects, and I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. So infection, urinary tract infection, thrush, and I generally say one is allowed. If you get recurrent, you stop it. Um, hypoglycemia, especially when you're on insulin or SUs. Uh, euglycemia ketoacidosis, rarely seen, but we have guidelines how to prevent it, especially when people fast for a longer period or come to the hospital for a procedure. Volume depletion, I mentioned already, a reduction about your diuretics and rare complications such, uh, such as from yeast gangrene, which is an infection of the groin. Now, switching tack, I'm just thinking about time. Um, so the second medication that is now available um, is dulaglutide. So it's a, a GLP-1 receptor agonist funded last year. We have the same criteria for special authority as you probably all know. And you can combine the two medication. 
they get additional benefit, i.e. that we have, can only use one is a uh, financial decision, but actually they work. The benefit is not massive additional, but yes, you get dual benefit. As you know, it's a once weekly injection comes in one dose in a preset pen, so fairly self-explanatory and easy to use. So this is quite a busy slide, but the following slides will illustrate it a little bit better. So it, the GLP-1 is a natural hormone produced by the L cells in the small bowel. When food hits the small bowel, this hormone is released and has multiple effects on the pancreas, on the stomach, and on the brain. And so it increases insulin secretion, reduces glucagon secretion, uh, helps actually on the, for the beta cells regeneration, and it also has, as I mentioned, the effect on the stomach. It slows gastric emptying, the food stays for longer, people feel fuller, uh, which helps with weight loss. It reduces appetite on the hypothalamus. It has cardiac and kidney benefits as we have similar benefits here than we have seen or we see SGLT2s. So we have import, improved cardiac output and improved naturesis. But the kidney benefits of this medication group are not fully established. So, and I would probably go through this nicer, better illustrated in the next slides. And I put the slide in because it's important to understand the mechanism and what it basically shows. On the left-hand side, you see the uh, glucose response, uh, oral versus intravenous glucose response matched. On the right hand side, you see the C peptide as a marker of insulin. So when you take glucose orally, you get a much bigger insulin or C peptide response. And that is due to these incretins. When food hits the small bowels, this is released and then it has an impact on your pancreas. This effect is reduced in patients with type 2 diabetes. And so you can basically give the hormone back, or you, what you have is your DPP4 inhibitors that you basically allow the natural GLP1, which only has a half life of two or three minutes, to be active for longer. So that's why you cannot combine them because they work on the same mechanism. So it just shows you a little cartoon, uh, the things I already mentioned, so the impact on the pancreas, the impact on the stomach, and the impact on the brain. Now, this medication, interesting enough, it's a large post hoc uh, meta-analysis, showed that this GLP-1 agonist can actually be more efficacious than insulin. And we see this one, especially in the obese people. So when you add more insulin uh, to obese people, you get often a marginal benefit and you see additional weight gain. And these people, who, when you start a GLP-1, you see weight loss and often more significant uh, improvement in HbA1c. And this is just a couple of slides from the study. You see it works also in people who are older or people who have higher starting HP1C. So this is a large study that we were involved in New Zealand, in Auckland. And so Rewind had around 5,000 patients to laglutide. And they had a cardiovascular outcome. They were a good match to different age groups. People were already on protective treatment. And you can see here the significant improvement in HP1C maintained. You can see a reduction in the overall MACE, significant benefit. You see a significant benefit on stroke, but you don't see a significant benefit on the cardiovascular death and non-fat lemma. That's an important thing. So MACE is significant, stroke is significant, but cardiovascular death and non-fat lemma is not. 
Now, this is a group of all the different uh, GLP-1 agonists. And you see rewind here, I don't know whether I see my, my cursor, but you see rewind here just misses the cutoff. So uh, leader liraglutide is, and sustained semaglutide is probably the strongest. But the interesting thing, what you see here, that, oh, that you see rewind actually in primary prevention has nearly significant benefit. And we do actually primary prevention with our special authority because we allow uh, the medication for myoric Pacific without established cardiovascular disease. And the other interesting thing, when Rewind was analyzed by centers, actually our area here in the Pacific area had the biggest benefit when um, dulaglutide was added. So it will be interesting watching the space, what will actually happen with our cardiovascular outcome, our diabetes control once we had two or three years experience of the medication. So as I said before, there's minimal benefit on um, EGFR or microaminuria. Um, so just some practical bits. So you get GI effect as a main side effect, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. It is generally happening in the first few days, resolves. So what I do is I extend the period. So if people get more than four days of nausea, then I extend it to two weekly dosing. And then after a while, I uh, go back to weekly dosing. I also prescribe an antiemetic for the first few days. So some people get injection site reaction. I've seen it a couple of times. You have to rotate around. And rare side effects is pancreatitis and gallstones. Medullary thyroid cancer numa was only seen in, in rodent studies when the rodents got much higher doses. So as you see here, so that is nausea. Nausea really abates after a, a few weeks. So the thing is you prescribe antiemetic, you extend the period, and then most people will be able to keep it, con con continue with it. And just summarize slide. So you we talked about the impact on weight on glucose. Um, we discussed the cardiovascular impact and um, it is now funded. As I said to you, you've probably all seen it as a simple injector, uh, fairly self-explanatory. Our nurse shows patients so easy to be started in primary care. And because people don't actually have to inject themselves, the little spring does it. The most important thing is that people hold it long enough because there's quite a time lag when before the needle is in, you hear two clicks. Practical testing uh, is good when you, before you use it in your surgery. So that's what we tell everyone and their great little um, leaflets from the good fellow and other places that actually given to patients, tell them what to do. And the one practical thing, what I always tell patients when they start on this medication, they're not only looking for side effects, they're looking actually for the benefits. And what I ask to them is, say, look out for you feeling fuller and not being able to finish your meal and that you feel less hungry and follow these sensations. That, that you get more benefit from the medication because people are actively looking out for these symptoms, a benefit that it gets. So we already mentioned about the device, we've all seen it. In the interest of time, rushing a little bit through. So where can we use it? Down to an EGFR of 15, not for children, not for pregnancy, not for type one, that's important. So fluid, Depletion, nausea is mainly the risk here. So in the elderly or people on multiple diuretics, be cautious, but not a contraindication. And we talked about possible side effects or uh, concerns. And as I already mentioned at the very beginning, we need to stop wildagliptin when we start to lie glutide. When people are on insulin, it is important to consider reducing insulin by 10 to 15%. If your H1C is less than 64, if it's above 64, you may not need to. Uh, think about diuretics and hypertensives. 
um, gives you appropriate advice, as I already mentioned to you, with the eating changes. And so some other practical things, so when to use switch medication, so dulaglutide really if you uh, want to reduce weight and uh, when you're in the context of stroke and cardiovascular disease, empagliflozin when it is about heart failure, renal outcome. And there you can basically go down the list and say which site really you would like to use a medication. And that's the last slide really for me to say, um, we are at the start of an exciting area in this gut hormone treatment. So we had for a little while exenatide and exenatide LAR, first generation of these two one agonists. Now we have uh, one of the second generation uh, GLP-1 agonist, we have to laglutide, as I just showed you. Now, um, overseas, also in Australia, uh, semaglutide is now available, which is a much more powerful medication, and you can get weight loss up to 16% for all comers. And again, like all these medications, they come at a lower dose for diabetes and a higher dose for weight management. And then um, internationally, you already have fourth generation uh, GLP-1s, so these are dual gut hormones. They have a GLP-1 and GIP, and tirsepitide is one of the studies that's in final uh, trials now. And that does a very aggressive H1C lowering. And um, so uh, last, I want to say, yes, there are studies that you can combine GLP-1s and SGL-2. And what I do when I think it's beneficial, I ask patients to pay for the less expensive and get the more expensive and special authority. So watch this space. And coming back to the last slide, really, now based on the patient I mentioned at the beginning, what would you choose? I tell you what I did, and then you can maybe decide what you wanted to do. So change of insulin, yes, she probably was too much um, background insulin, so she could get a premix insulin, but that wasn't my first choice. So um, Wildegliptin wouldn't really do much for her for all her other problems. So I left with empagliflozin or dulaglutide. Now, I choose dulaglutide. And the simple fact was I did not have investigations about her kidney. As you have seen, there is the, or there was a very low proteinuria. So this patient probably didn't have diabetic nephropathy or uh, FSGS. So therefore I felt dulaglutide is a safe option. However, once I have an investigation of her kidney, I probably would add the SGLT2 inhibitor. Now, what about her heart failure? She probably had heart failure with preserved ejection fractions, so their empathy flows and clearly would be uh, your choice. But she could have lots of other reasons for a shortness of breath obstructive sleep apnea, obesity related hyperventilation syndrome, uh, anxiety, other bits that can cause. And this is important, especially in the obese people, to rule this one out. And as I talked about a kidney disease as well, and I started your treatment for a gout. So if you want to read more, there's a few other bits of publishers. Really. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ollie. That was a fantastic talk and so informative. Um, we've got a number of questions, and if you did have questions, please pop them in the Q&A. Um, a lot around special authorities and why we have such a restricted special authority, and do you know whether or not that will be opened up to include people without diabetes but with heart failure or other ethnicities? Do you have any ideas about these? Um, two points. Here. First, I would say we are actually in a good space because we now have access to medication. And I always, when people ask me this, when I explain, it is a small country. So there is, of course, a way where you have to cut it. And I feel there are two sides to the special authority criteria. One is that there's a um, restriction, but on the other way, it makes it actually easier as well because you have one 
of each group to go to. So it is easier to start one as if you had three or four GLP-1 agonists, which one to use, it would make it much harder. So it actually allows management and primary care. Um, yes, we were arguing that you should have access to both on top of each other, but um, that was, I think, a financial decision. And the decision that we have a Murray Pacific uh, criteria was a first in the pharma books, really. It was never an ethnicity guided um, criteria, which is interesting because we're going into primary prevention here. But I, I guess everyone is probably seeing it the same way. Uh, we have a seven or eight year mortality difference between Murray and European. We have a much greater um, obesity, diabetes, kidney disease problem in Pacifica communities. Yes, there's a problem with type 2 in the Indian community. I'm fully aware of this. So I guess as a starting point, and we will see how actually um, using ethnicity as an entry criteria, how this has an impact long term. And that's why I say we're doing at the moment a monitoring tool when you're looking into how we actually uh, use these medications, we're auditing it and we'll feed back to primary care. So yes, pros and cons for this one. Great, thank you. Um, just a question about genital urinary side effects with the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, often women will get bothersome candidiasis. Is there anything that you can do to prevent this? Um, yes, um, first is history really. So if you have someone who had previous history of urine tract infection, then you will more likely to encounter another one. If you have someone who has kidney stones or other reasons, prostatic problems, you're more likely to encounter a problem, especially in the male. So you look into your history. So certain histories would preclude me using them. Second one is I um, say the first you can treat. If you get recurrent one, it would be time to stop. I seen them quite a bit and I've seen a number of uh, people ending up in hospital with urine tract infection. So I think it is um, when you start the medication, you check your usernies um, roughly a fortnight after and you instruct the patient. And that's the most important. So you look for your history and your instruct them about symptoms about UTI. And then uh, if they get it, they get a urine sample, they get an antibiotic, they withhold the medication. And if it's a once off and you don't have any other red flag, you restart. If it's a second time happened, the medication is gone. Thank you. Just a couple of questions about pancreatitis. Um, how frequently does pancreatitis occur? How often or what is the time delay? Is there a time delay um, or a common time that it would occur after starting these medications? And if you have high triglycerides, is this a problem with pancreatitis? Does it predispose? Yeah, um, great questions. So there's no time point um, where it can happen any time after you started the medication. The likelihood is very small. So, and the mechanism is not related to triglycerides as far as I'm aware. So it has nothing to do with triglycerides. However, if you had pancreatitis in the past, it would be a contraindication. So if you had, for example, pancreatitis due to hypertriglycidemia or a gallstones, which is slightly different gallstones because if your gallbladder is out, you probably won't get it again. But if you had a history of pancreatitis, that would be a contraindication. <clears throat> Lots of questions about epif... I can never say it. Uh, go. Ah. Thank you. Um, wondering if a patient has an EGFR of, say, 32 with type 2 diabetes and then the EGFR drops down to 20, 29, but mm -hmm. it's within that 10 percent and then remains stable, can we continue this medication or would this then be contraindicated? Very good question. Um, in, pro in secondary care, we definitely continue. Now, the question is um, whether 
how confident you feel. Now, what I would say is if you have a patient at this level of EGFR, you should have a kidney doctor involved anyway, because diabetic nephropathy is unpredictable and you can get a rapid fall. So if your uh, EGFR hits around 35, 30, you need to refer to kidney doctors. It's actually quite late. A lot of kidney doctors want it when you are already at a level of 40. So at this point, you will have a kidney doctor involved in the management of your patient. Uh, and what we do in secondary care, yes, we continue. Because as I showed you, the benefit is a long-term benefit on kidney protection. You have the underlying physiology, the underlying mechanism why it protects kidneys. So yes, I continue at this level. For primary care, I would say make sure the patient is involved somewhere with renal input. And if you feel unsure, ask the nephrologist, but most of them would continue at this level. Great. And just a couple of questions about the SGLT2 inhibitors. These are cautioned in those over 85 years. Is this because of lack of evidence or the long-term benefit is not uh, there or volume depletion? What are the considerations for this age group? It's actually um, more or less all of the above. So um, there is less evidence in the older group. We have um, better medication in the older group. Uh, for example, DPB4 inhibitors have much better uh, benefit in this older group. It's often a different form of type 2 diabetes. It's often a milder form. It's often less associated with um, obesity. So therefore, there are other medications that work better there's less evidence and there are more risk factors, especially for urinary tract infection, for dehydration, for hypotension. So therefore in this age group, it wouldn't be my choice. And also you don't often want a tight control anymore. So therefore I think for this age group, really the choice would be DPP4, metformin if the kidneys are still okay, and then maybe a little bit background insulin. So that would be a really the choice there. Just a question about hypoglycemia. Glycemia. So mm -hmm. once a patient's established on an SGLT2 inhibitor, is there a time beyond which we wouldn't expect hypoglycemic attacks? No. Um, hypoglycemia can happen in a diabetic's life anytime. Okay. There are lots of reasons why people get hypoglycemia. They lose weight, they change their medication, they go on some funny diets. So hypoglycemia can happen at any time. That's why you need to continue monitoring blood sugar. Fantastic. So I just get this light from this. I just need to get my plants. Just, sun just came up. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. And just sick day management with the SGLT2 inhibitors, can you just comment on that for us? At what point would we stop these? Stop them? Why Why we want to stop them? If someone is unwell, say, oh, unwell. Okay. Mm -hmm. or could you give us some guidance? Yes, sick day. All right. So that's a very good point as well. So what we normally tell people is um, when you off food, i.e. if you don't eat for more than 48 hours, whatever the reason for this one is, i.e. you have diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, uh, I stop them. Um, I do not stop them when people go on a low carb diet because most people don't adhere to low carb. Anyhow, so that's why it must be someone who's on a really strict ketogenic diet where there's a possibly small risk. But I would say uh, important is when people do not eat for 48 hours, then I would stop them. If there's a significant risk of dehydration, then I would stop them. We stop them before any procedures. We're just working at the moment on a guideline to look into um, how early we stop them for colonoscopy, gastroscopy, uh, but there are guidelines around, so it's like two days uh, before the colonoscopy when people start with the bowel prep. It is a day before uh, upper GI endoscopy. Um, before surgery, the medication gets stopped. So that's basically the one. But for primary care, the main thing is the general unwellness or not eating um, for two days. That's what I normally tell people. And then restarting the molly? Restarting is um, as soon as they're better, as soon as they start eating again. Uh, that will basically, because the best way to think about it is actually the mechanistic 
point, what are you worried about? You're worried about dehydration and you're worried about the rare side effect of euglycemic ketoacidosis. But dehydration is probably the major risk there with hypertension. So therefore, if people um, have a GI problem, once this has settled, you can restart the medication. If someone has COVID, please don't start, uh, stop it uh, because often people get hyperglycemia when they have COVID. So please continue this one through. Okay, that's an interesting point. Thank you. Uh, just a question about type one diabetics. Is there a role for trulicity in these? Patients? No, Thank neither you. of the medication is um, licensed for type one. Um, so now there are trials, that's true, which use GLP-1s in type one, but that is probably, um, I don't use them this way, um, more a discussion with your specialist physician. I would basically strongly advise against using them because it will cause problems. So I think type ones need to have the insulin titrated and managed. And there's also no additional benefit because we don't have any uh, cardiovascular benefit data for uh, type one patients. Uh, there's very little benefit if you have obesity on type one. That's probably the only group where it could fit in and where they have studies overseas, but I would strongly caution. And the SGLT2s are contraindicated in type one because uh, of the euglycemic ketoacidosis. Again, there are small studies overseas who do this one, but we don't have the, the tight monitoring loops to uh, allow us this. So I would caution of using either of them in type one. Fantastic, and coming to an end now, our last question, um, how would you increase, or how soon would you increase Jardians from say 10 to 25 milligrams when initiating a medication? Right, so it's basically very individualized, I would say. So it depends a little bit what you're treating. Um, the additional glucose benefit from 10 to 25 is relatively marginal. The bigger um, benefit you get for your cardiovascular. So if you want to do it for kidney and for cardiovascular purpose, you probably can uh, titrate it up after four to six weeks. Um, for diabetes, you put it in the context, see how much people actually respond to the medication, what kind of benefits you get from it. But yes, there's no hard and fast rule, I would say four to six weeks. Fantastic. Thank you, Ollie, for joining us this morning. It's been a pleasure having you here and it's been a great opportunity to ask those questions. So thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. That's great. Thank you, everyone. Great. We're moving on to what's new in radiology. And I'd like to introduce um, Paul Dawkins. Paul is a respiratory physician at Middlemore Hospital and an honorary senior lecturer at the University of Auckland. He's the clinical lead for the lung cancer group at Middlemore and chairs the New Zealand Ministry of Health National Lung Cancer Working Group. Welcome today, Paul. It's lovely to have you here. Uh, good morning. Um, I hope you can see my presentation. Uh, as uh, introduced, I'm uh, a uh, respiratory physician at Middlemore Hospital, and I also chair the Northern Regional uh, Lung Cancer Stream and the uh, National Lung Cancer Working Group. So as you're probably aware, lung cancer in New Zealand is a big problem. There's uh, over 2,000 New Zealanders diagnosed with it each year, and it is the leading cancer killer in New Zealand with around 1,800 deaths per year. Uh, and it's only really recently receiving the attention it deserves. Uh, it can occur in never smokers, especially women and East, uh, people of East Asian origin. Uh, probably 10 to 15 percent of lung cancer we see are in never smokers. And uh, it is a big problem in Maori with two or three times, two to three times the incidence of lung cancer compared with New Zealand European uh, and three times the age adjusted mortality. And Maori as a group have the highest lung cancer rates of uh, any uh, 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 indigenous people or indeed any ethnic group worldwide. 
So on the National Lung Cancer Working Group, we came up with early detection guidelines in 2017. And there's sort of four pillars of it that, have, uh, that are coloured here. So the first of all is getting the public aware. If the, pub if the public don't come through the door with the problems, we're never going to pick it up. So this is all about education, getting people to attend uh, uh, GP practices or, or, um, uh, or, or whatever. Uh, to get uh, attention if they have symptoms that may suggest lung cancer. Uh, the second pillar at the top right is the professional. So there's no point the patients coming in up to the GP surgery if the uh, GP or practice nurse doesn't recognise that the symptoms that are being reported to them are important. So it is about educating um, the providers about what to look for. Uh, and the bottom left, it's very important that early detection pathways are linked to the high suspicion of cancer uh, pathways uh, so that they can be seen in secondary care quickly once those symptoms have been picked up. And then the fourth is that it's important that we monitor and evaluate uh, our uh, performance. Uh, and as uh, a report, uh, a QPI report that I was uh, involved with in um, lung cancer outcomes shows there's big variation across the country and that shouldn't happen uh, in a country particularly as small as New Zealand. We shouldn't see this amount of variation in outcomes. So what are the symptoms? Well, the number one cough, a cough that's been going on for more than three weeks. Uh, you should be thinking, why is this happening? And a basic chest X-ray at that point in time uh, would seem sensible, particularly if there are, are risk factors. Uh, Hemoptysis is a, is a key uh, um, symptom that, you, that needs attention. And there are some other symptoms uh, for, such as chest or shoulder pain related to pleural involvement, breathlessness, hoarseness of voice from the laryngeal nerve involvement, uh, weight loss more than 10%, unresolving chest infections. If the patient's back and forth for antibiotics, you might you need to think about getting a, a chest X-ray. And then uh, the symptoms suggested of metastasis, uh, either to liver, um, bone, brain, or skin, which are the typical met metastatic sites. Uh, and in terms of co emphasizing cough, this is this is key to all the um, public education initiatives. And this is one in Midland area. Cough, cough, cough uh, on the back of the bus. And this is what we need to stress to uh, to our um, uh, patients that if they have a cough, that don't go away. Come, come and see us. Uh, in the uh, UK, they had a cough, cough, cough campaign as well, and uh, the, the bus stops um, coughed at people, and so people looked and saw the ad in the inside of the bus shelter. Uh, so what are the red flags? Well, um, uh, which where you need to get the patient into hospital as opposed to making a, an e-referral. Well, hemopsis more than 100 mils uh, needs to go to hospital. Uh, uh, to ED. Signs of airway obstruction, so that's, that suggests that the larger airway, like the trachea, is compromised, needs attention, and that's stridor insp inspiratory noise. Signs of SVC obstruction, so you've got a puffy face, you've got dilated fixed JVPs, um, need, needs uh, quick attention and should come to hospital. And then, uh, of course, symptoms of spinal cord compression from, from METs. Uh, where, you, where you could be uh, compromising them in the long terms in terms of, uh, of, of paraplegia that needs, that needs attention. So what are the risk factors that we need to look at? Well, uh, smoking and secondhand smoking, key number one, uh, but there are some other um, risks associated uh, with lung cancer. So heavy marijuana use is um, and, and so you need to ask about that as well as smoking. Occupational exposures, particularly asbestos, but also other things like silica and coal are linked in association with smoking. A personal history of lung cancer, if you've had lung cancer before, you're more likely to get it again. And then also family history of it, if they're first degree relatives, is, is, is a strong, uh, strong risk factor. Previous uh, head and neck cancers related to smoking, they've, they've got a high incidence of, um, of lung cancers as well. And then COPD is closely linked uh, and is a, is a separate independent risk factor from, from the smoking itself. So what investigations should we get? Well, the chest X-ray is a key one. Um, and there's good evidence from audits that the delays in chest X-rays are an issue and, and that patients have attended GPs, sometimes two or three occasions before they've, they've got the diagnostic chest X-ray. Now you can walk in at Middlemore with a form. Um, now we 
recognise that Middlemore is not ideally situated for, for the catchment area. It's right on the north of it, on the border with Auckland DHB, and if you uh, are a GP in Franklin and your patient's in Waiuku, um, um, or Pocono, <laughs> it's pretty difficult. And so there's some attention to approved access to diagnostics. This, is a, this I know is a barrier, and there's a certain budget for this that GPs um, need for the ultrasounds. Uh, but it is being addressed. Um, POAC, it's not, not so appropriate. For point when the point of POAC is to avoid hospital admission, but if you think your chest X-ray is, is, is linked to uh, avoiding hospital admission, you could get it through that way. Uh, blood tests are always useful to send off in advance. Um, the GPs are very good at this, but the one that's often forgotten is the COAG, though, because if we need a biopsy, we need COAG. So unfortunately, we have to often send the patients back for another blood test to get the COAG. So it's worth thinking about that if you're referring. A patient with lung cancer, if you get the coags, it saves them two sets of blood tests. And then if you've got spirometry, great, uh, it's not essential. We, we can do it uh, at, uh, at our place. And um, just bear in mind psychosocial assessments. Um, the patients uh, will be, and family, uh, Farno will be stressed out about this. And um, there's some attention uh, needs to be paid to this as well as to uh, cultural um, factors. So how do you make an urgent referral? Well, there's an e-referral system through the high suspicion of cancer pathway. You just flag it as such. Um, you don't have to particularly tick the urgent box. People do, but um, it's you, 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 that's irrelevant, really. We, if it's high suspicion of cancer, it will be marked as such. Uh, there is an ECOG assessment. We find that useful, actually. Uh, so you've got ECOG uh, zero is normal compared with peers. Uh, one. Um, uh, um, imp impaired uh, compared with peers, two uh, up and um, impaired and up and about for more than 50% of the day, three is impaired and not up and about for more than 50% of the day, and four is bed or chair bound. So that's very useful for when we're gauging if they're on a curative track or not. Inform the patient, obviously, because we get a, a, an appointment out of the blue cancer clinic, it's a, a bit of a shock. Uh, and there's no need to request in our region a CT scan or PET CT scan. In fact, don't, because it will delay the process. We have a, an upfront PET CT process if they're potentially curable by surgery or radical radiation. So we'll take a look at the referral and the X-ray. And if it looks potentially curable, they'll go straight for a PET CT and bypass a CT scan. If you request a CT scan first, you might end up having both, which is uh, um, double the radiation for the patient, a waste of resources and introduces delay. So we have a good system here. Just get the chest X-ray, refer on. You don't need to get a CT scan. It's not every uh, region of New Zealand has that uh, upfront PET system, but we're lucky enough in Auckland region that's been agreed uh, that uh, we can do that. Um, and also, it's an, it's an, even though you might think it's too late, it's not too late to explore smoking cessation. If, if patients stop smoking, even with a diagnosis of cancer, there's evidence of improved outcomes. So moving on to lung cancer screening, which is different. I've talked about early detection, picking up patients early with the symptoms. Population screening is, is different. And this is picking up asymptomatic people. Uh, and we don't have a program in New Zealand, but we have some pilots. Now, the screening is done by low dose CT scanning. We know that this is effective from two large trials, uh, one uh, in America, which is uh, the uh, National Lung Screening Trial, which is a decade old now, showed a 20% relative risk reduction from lung cancer mortality and 6.7% in all-cause mortality. The Nelson study, which is a Dutch-Belgian study uh, with improved um, imaging algorithms and risk assessment scoring compared with the uh, NLST, had a 24% relative risk reduction in lung cancer in males at 10 years, but in women it was between 39 and 61%, depending on the time point studied. So um, a great benefit in, in for females of being, of being scanned. Uh, so there's good evidence there, uh, but there's little uh, in the literature about um, um, focusing uh, screening on indigenous people. Uh, and this is um, with uh, the 
the terrible uh, outcomes here for Maori. This is something of interest here. And there are uh, a couple of pilots happening uh, in Auckland region. Um, one uh, led by Sue Krengel is uh, focusing on the Maori population getting low dose CT scanning. And that's being done in Auckland White and Mata region at the moment, it's being extended in phase two uh, to cover other DHBs, including counties and, and probably Northland as well. Uh, so um, the, the other the other um, program is in Midland, where they're exploring uh, uh, the low dose CT screening again, uh, focusing on the Maori population. So what's the problem with it, lung cancer screening? Well, there's no easy to measure biomarker. So in uh, colonic cancer, you've got the fecal occult bloods and the CEAs, uh, prostate, you've got PSA, quite quite easy to measure, but there's no blood test you can do, not as yet anyway, uh, in lung cancer. We're trying to research some, but um, the, the, the biomarker, which is the CT scan, is, is, is clearly more difficult to get to more expensive than a blood test. There's no symptom-based approach here, so um, if you wait till they've got symptoms, it's probably too late. You want to catch them before they have symptoms. Uh, and that's different to early detection that I was talking about earlier, which is where you're looking for early symptoms. If we really want to make a difference in lung cancer, we have to, we have to catch the cancer before it becomes symptomatic. It involves radiation. So this is a problem, you know, or you don't want to give people radiation when it's unnecessary and you don't want to do it. You've got to think about how often you want to do it. Uh, it's very expensive, not just the scanners, but the radiographers, radiologists reporting it, the infrastructure that's required in getting patients through the scanner. There's access issues, so geographic issues, transport issues, and then equity issues. So um, you, you've got to get the screening to the people who need it most. So these are often socioeconomically deprived groups, um, um, ethnic groups like Maori, Pacific, um, who may be uh, less uh, inclined or less able to engage with medical services. So, so if, if you set up a screening program and it's only the worried well that go to it, it's not going to achieve any objective. So these are all things we need to think about when we're setting up our um, lung cancer screening program. So what would a screening program look like relevant to New Zealand? Well, you've got to come, it's always a compromise, a toss up between numbers captured uh, with lung cancer versus the cost effectiveness. So you have to have very, very good risk assessment tools uh, so that you, you are targeting the population that might need it most. You're not doing scans on everybody with low risk, which clearly would uh, below any uh, budget. So the highest risk populations, well, you know, age um, generally is 55 to 75. It's usually dropped for um, uh, indigenous populations. Uh, so in Canada, in the First Nations populations, they screen from 50. Um, uh, so you've got the smoking history, um, ethnicity, uh, and then other factors such as um, which in the, in the risk factor model, the PLCO model, which might include um, uh, prints of COPD, uh, history of cancer, occupational factors, etc. And then you've got to think about the mode of delivery. Most of our scans are in metropolitan areas uh, and either in the hospitals or in the, the private providers. Uh, and we've got to think about how we reach our populations. Uh, for instance, a mobile scanner might work quite well that you can put on the back of a bus and drive up to Northland or whatever it is. And then you've got to think about formal invitation from a central programme versus opportunistic of just catching patients when they when you come across them and thinking, well, you fit the risk criteria. Let's if you heard about lung cancer screening, let's get you under the scanner. And you might have heard in the UK, the Manchester study where they parked up um, the bus in the Sainsbury's car park, which is the equivalent of um, New World uh, and uh, in socioeconomically deprived areas. Uh, uh, in order to try and capture people. And, uh, and then you, need, you might need to target your engagement. So the pilots in New Zealand that are taking place at the moment are targeting specifically the Maori population because they have the worst outcomes. And then if we find out it, it's worked well in that population, then um, we hope that it can be broadened out uh, to a population-based uh, screening program. And the uh, Ministry of Health is now uh, committed to this and said that they want to roll the programme out, uh, they hope in the next five years, we'd, we'd like to hear them say two years, but that, that's the timeline they're, they're looking at at the moment and these pilots are, are going to inform that. 
So what are the take home messages? Uh, well, first of all, lung cancer is New Zealand's biggest cancer killer. So it should be forefront of our, in our minds. Uh, we should be aware of symptoms that may suggest lung cancer in people with risk factors. Uh, and I would stress to you, cough more than three weeks is the most important one uh, to think about. Uh, red flag symptoms that I've mentioned, so large volume hemoptysis, um, SVC obstruction, um, signs of spinal cord compression, uh, uh, stride or etc. Go to ED um, because they, they need attention. Uh, the most important thing is to get a chest x-ray in early stage. Access to diagnostics. Um, I've had uh, some discussion with the GP leaders in, in, in the region, such as Cam Campbell Brebner, uh, in, in, in order to see how we can remove the barriers to getting chest x-rays in our, in our region. Uh, as I said, uh, Middlemore Walk-In is, is a great resource, but we recognise that a lot of patients won't want to make the journey and do the parking uh, and we need to think about how we can get these uh, chest x-rays uh, easily for our patients. Uh, you make the high suspicion of cancer referral through the e-referral system, we will grade it within 24 hours and we'll decide on a CT or CT PET scan at the time of grading. So don't uh, just, once you've um, got your chest x-ray and you, and, you, and you think this, this needs attention, just refer on immediately. Uh, Population-based low-dose CT screening is on the horizon and there are local pilots underway targeting the Maori population. And that's um, all I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, just a quick question. You have mentioned the three-week cough. There are many um, coughs out there, especially at the moment post-COVID, that are lots longer than three weeks. I wonder if you can just comment about what we do there. Yeah, that's a good question. And what we found during the COVID-19 epidemic is that our cancer referrals dropped. And that's because instead, they, when uh, patients were attending the GP with a cough, they got a COVID swab, they didn't get a chest X-ray. So the problem is if we're attributing cough to COVID-19 or any other respiratory viruses around, we're going to miss lung cancer. So what I would say to you, if your patient's got a cough long, longer than three weeks, by all means get a rats test, but send them for a chest X-ray because otherwise you'd be sitting on lung cancer. You don't know whether that's cough due to lung cancer or not. And if they've got lung, if they've got risk factors, so, you know, they're um, 35 year old plus smoker, ex-smoker, they've had a cough for more than three weeks, um, they should get a chest X-ray. And even if, uh, if they've had a cough more than three weeks with an infection, you probably need to get a chest X-ray anyway, because it could have developed, uh, you know, an empyema or some complication from their COVID or their respiratory virus infection that might need attention irrespective of whether it's a lung cancer. So I would stress to you, chest X-rays are fairly easy to get, but, uh, you know, to refer for um, cough on three weeks, um, I would get one. You know, there are some exceptions, you know, some, you know, the chronic coughs that they've been coughing for, for years and nasal symptoms and things like that. Um, but, you know, even those peak people, you need to think about, well, I, am I, you know, and some changes about that long-term cough, uh, you probably ought to get a chest X-ray as well, because these people, if they've got risk factors, may at some point develop a lung cancer. So what I'd say is it's an easy investigation to get. Um, don't let COVID influence that. <laughs> Yes, yes, there's a lot being put down to COVID at the moment. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, thank you for your time today and for your enlightening talk. Uh, we're just going Pleasure, to move to a, quick, to a quick break. We've got a 10 minute break and we'll be back at 10.05. Thanks everyone. Welcome back everyone. I'm Dr. Louise Kugler from the Goodfellow Unit and it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Boberg. We're going to discuss what's new in dermatology or specifically skin lesions. Chris is a gypsy with a special interest in skin cancer. He's the fellow, a fellow of the Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners and a fully accredited member and the current president of the New Zealand Skin Cancer Doctors Society with a strong professional interest and a broad experience in the detection of melanoma and skin cancer management. He is the co-chair of Melnet New Zealand and the chair and organising on the organising committee for the New Zealand Melanoma Summits. Hi, Chris. Welcome Hi, how are we? Today. Lovely great. to be here. I'll hand over to you now. Great, great to be here. So look, welcome everybody on here. It's a tremendous number of over 300 people and it's just such a good opportunity to talk about this. Time is a bit limited today. It's only half an hour to cover melanoma 
and non-melanoma skin cancer and other things with regarding the pathways, which are the key thing. So I'm going to go through melanoma first a little bit longer of two presentations um, and uh, reinforcing the key things in early detection and how the pathways help uh, and some very key messages. And then I might flick into the non-melanoma discussion and just cherry pick some key messages for you before we all have to finish with time. So we've got to keep the time, so we'll keep moving. So I've been introduced well, and thank you very much for that. I'm a busy fellow, and I love this thing is melanoma. It's really traversed my whole professional life. And I'm very passionate about it, but no one should die of melanoma. Remember that, and some of you have seen this, and some of you will have read this paper back in 2019 from the world gurus and experts, and there's reasons why that, that, that we shouldn't be dying because it's demoscopy. We can find melanoma at the in situ non-invasive stage. So what's the problem? The tumor is tricky. Doctors don't have demoscopy training. They need to be doing this to be, to be right up with it. And of course, in general practice, you make a massive contribution, always have um, right through my career. It's always been the case, even clinically, but now with demoscopy, it's superb because it's opportunistic. They're in front of you with their four or five problems and they're talking away and they've, they've found something on their body they don't like and they want you to see it. You can use demoscopy very quickly and decide whether it needs excision or not to know. And that's what it's all about. It's a, it's a decision to excise a suspicious lesion. And, and there's one in five chance, it'll be a melanoma in situ and it's totally survivable. Fantastic. The patients, the issue, of course, we know lots of cultural things, the myths, the down the rabbit hole things that happen with uh, with cancer and in all forms, uh, and the blocks that they put in their own pathway, uh, getting early detected, um, and it's this cultural, this den the huge denials and all these things that we're sort of up against in practice, but we do our best because, in general practice, it is about uh, continuity of care and rapport and trust, and and people will bring these things in. So the opportunistic thing is huge. Um, so it's multifactored and it's a great paper to read, but remember the key to it is no one should die of melanoma. If you're using demoscopy, pretty much we're going to find them. Have some fun. Now melanoma kills, so it's actually over 380 a year now. This is higher than the road toll and we're not doing a lot about it. And we need to really get politically active to sort this out. Melanoma is the poor cousin. Uh, and our death rates we've discovered is twice that of Australia, but we have the same incidence rates and there's a whole lot of reasons why. So quick overview of what we're gonna run through. I'm not gonna go through this in detail. We'll just keep moving, but I'm gonna cover the ground as you can see as we go. That's what the pathway looks like. Now these pathways are wonderful. Um, the, the, the skin cancer one, of course, is superb, but this is what it looks like. You can go on there. You have got a Wikipedia of skin cancer uh, assessment and management at your fingertips with these hot links that go off to the places where the latest evidence is. Uh, if you want to do that, it guides you beautifully on referral, urgent referral. Uh, it stratifies key clinical things that you need to click on to as you're going with, this, with these difficult patients that you'll be seeing with melanomas and other skin cancers, non-melanomas, you know, squamous cell cancers that are poorly differentiated and high risk. So look, it's fabulous. And it's just so wonderful we've got this. Um, so please use it, use it, use it, have it open on your desktop. Now this, this, this part of the pathway links to the most brilliant uh, dermatology um, uh, site, Melnet, which of course we must pay homage to Professor Amanda Oakley in, in Waikato, who's been world accoladed with this. It's used for patients and for teaching and for learning. Uh, as a GP, I have that open on my as a link all the time. Um, it's, fan, it's just an absolute huge array of knowledge. So the, the pathway get, is taking you to all these places. You're there. It is wonderful. So please use it. Right. So we're moving right. And I've got to go qu quicker today because there's not a lot of time. So the highest incidence, 35 to 45 per 100,000. The Gold Coast is over 75 per 100,000, funnily enough, but we know why. Um, fair skin and lots of sun and a lot of retirees and age. Melanoma comprises 10% of all skin cancers, so it's a lot more than you think, and New Zealand's a world record. Variation rates do vary between DHBs. Interestingly enough, 50% of melanoma is recognised by patients we're, we're informed, and it's probably going to be a true thing. But now that days that we're going for a detection, we're doing full skin checks with demoscopy in the high-risk patient, um, you, we're finding them. You can find them the same way. New Zealand skin cancer doctors like myself, who GP special interest, who kind of advanced school, we're finding them a lot more melanoma in situ. These people have 100% survival with a five millimeter margin re-excision. It's a fabulous thing. Absolutely fabulous. Uh, mortality, four to five deaths per 100,000 per people a year. And it accounts for 80% of the, the skin cancer deaths in New Zealand. How's that? 
So melanoma um, is the thing, and it's uh, and this new information, the media are cottoning onto it. It's a great thing, and we need to move with it and get some action. You know, survival is inversely related to the lesion thickness, and the thickness is the Breslow thickness on histology, which you get uh, excising a suspicious lesion to two millimeters. It's an ellipse to two millimeters. It is not a punch biopsy ever. If you think it's Suspicious for melanoma of the lesion, you must excise to two millimeter margin. That is the gold standard, world standard. It's New Zealand's quality standard. That's what it is. And there's, there's a whole lot of really good reasons that I'm sure many of you will know, but we won't traverse, but that's what it is. Um, it's non-invasive at that stage. It is histologically in situ, fantastic. And 99 plus, probably 100% survivable on the re-excision. As it invades, it, it dives down the skin layer. You're talking one or two millimeters havoc breaks out and this is what uh, happens. It's about a year for a, a melanoma that starts superficially, sits on the skin, but gets the agility to be able to go down through the dermis and get the depth. Um, so hence, the uh, when you're looking at high-risk people, it's an annual skin check with demoscopy uh, to, to capture those pretty much. And we knew this years ago, but demoscopy has brought this to the table beautifully. So um, early key point, early detection and at melanoma non-invasive stage, it's dependent on training skills and demoscopy. Now, some of you have done are doing this and you're right into it and the numbers are growing beautifully in the last few years. COVID has brought a little bit of a halt to things, but we're up and running again. And it's wonderful to see GPs doing this. Some of you uh, haven't started or uh, unsure or just starting out your career, please learn about the stethoscope of the skin, demoscopy. It's a very simple thing, a one day fundamental course, getting you going on chaos and clues, active on Monday, come back and do the two day advanced course. So there's an online course to gather it all together for you as you go forward. And presto in a year or two, you will be an expert dem demoscopist in your practice and leading the way and finding these things. It's absolutely wonderful. Right, who are these high-risk patients? So they're basically similar with, with uh, cancer, uh, cancer of the lung. We've just heard brilliantly at 55, 50, well, it's the same for skin cancer, funnily enough. We take 50 as being the time of, of, of change pretty much for the population. After 50s, melanoma and, and non-melanoma skin cancers are exponentially growing, um, both male and female, pretty close. The males slightly win, but it's very, very similar in terms of gender. It's exponential. So that's the starting point. And age is a good, a good, a good place to start. Skin type Fitzpatrick, one to two, you know about this, the fair freckles, blue eyes, easy to burn, got a lot of burns when you're a teenager, younger, when the skin was extremely sensitive to UV, setting you up for melanoma skin cancer later in life. So the skin type I mean, in this country is really common. So it's huge. Now, people have multiple not benign moles. Uh, we love to, uh, skin cancer doctors call these nevi because we classify them and looking at benign nevi, trying to discern which ones may be suspicious of melanoma is an art form in itself. And anybody with multiple moles um, is a high risk, a lifetime risk for melanoma anyway. So it just adds into the risk factor as you go. History of atypical nevi syndrome or congenital melanotic uh, nevi that have been identified demoscopically. These people are the high risk uh, as they're younger. So the younger group that have congenital melanocytic nevi, uh, small ones, lots of them, um, and family histories, they are a high risk group too. So it comes down for those ones. UV index intensity, of course, is the highest in Australia and New Zealand, has been for decades, has been for hundreds of years. It's not going to change. It's probably going to get worse. But our behaviour, we love the outdoors, don't we? And that's what we do. So the recurrent burning and getting out there with the sun exposed to the skin is the problem, there's no question. And in the UK, they go off down to Spain and Mallorca and get bottled pink and peel and come back, and it's a successful holiday. And that's why the UK rate's probably going up uh, more than it should be. And they're about half hours at the moment. And it's apparently epidemiology, it's, it, they're heading into it. So previous history of melanoma for the person or non-melanoma skin cancer, the risk risk is, is, is elevating. Family history is huge. Um, David Whiteman, the epidemiologist in Australasia, um, predicts that uh, pretty much the gene is pretty is, is involved here and probably to 30 to 40% of melanomas may well be 
um, mediated by genes combined with, of course, UV over time. So the genes are important and the family history is extremely important. So please check it and be sure about it. And of course, the old, good old eye colors. So blue's top of the list. Uh, it goes down to green, ends up in brown. That's the stratification of risk. But blue, green eyes, you're, you're, in, you, you, you're, you're in the at-risk group. And hair color, blonde, blonde, red, or ginger. And that's a lot of us, isn't it? Changing PSL, suspicious lesion, change shape, color, size, rapidly enlarging, becoming raised or firm. It's a bad sign that some of the rare melanomas come along with a depth. They pop up and they're elevating and evolving. They're the rare ones. Uh, and you've got to get to those very quickly and excise those and get them sorted very, very fast. 95% um, are thin on the skin and they grow slowly and then they, they decide to invade. And we, we, we're going after those beauty, beautifully with demoscopy now. But these raised, you've got to be aware and practice the whole time. New raised lesion, red flag, get that patient, see them, sort them straight away. And that's very, very important. And patient concern, often patients are concerned about something that's just subtly changing to them. And it may look fine to your eye, but red flag for you, have a really good look. Full body skin checks are the gold standard, whatever. If you're busy, you're seeing the patient, you saw a lesion, you decided to, to excise it because it's suspicious good, you use demoscopy, get them back for a full skin check, 15, 20 minutes and do it properly. Uh, you go everywhere and we'll talk about that a bit later. A, B, C, D, F is very, very important. The ugly duckling um, signs, which have been around a long time there now from the Ds has gone to the Gs. So we're, it's, we're, we're, involved, we're evolving this as we go. But this is clinical look with the eye, asymmetry, border regularity, color, color variation. It's a different lesion. Uh, hence, ugly duck patients can cotton on to ugly duckling as we do. Um, it's compare, compare it with the other spots. It's a standout often lesion sitting in the sphere skin that's sun damaged. It's black, brown. It's, it, it may even be bland. Uh, but it's a lonely outlier. So these sorts of subjective terms help us clinically to go stop the bus, put the dermatoscope on this now and do a full skin check as we go. Again, as I say, ease now for evolution or elevation. We want to get these rare but ones really quickly. They they're, they're, they're really are tricky and they're difficult. Um, anything that's firm and growing, um, you know, and this, they're, they're going to be excised. There's no question. You have to have histology early. And here's a little 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 thing uh, for you. Now my screen, let me just see if I can move it a bit. No, I can't. Whoops, a daisy. Uh, go back, go back. So this is just a little exercise in um, looking at the clinical uh, lesions. And these are all ugly ducklings, stand out, lonely outliers, pretty much in fair skin. There's a tattoo there and there's, and you know, melanomas come in tattoos. Of course they do. So do other skin cancers. And these are clinically, you're gonna look at these and say, yeah, they're suspicious and I want, to, I want to take it further and you're going to be excising all of these because they all were melanomas. So clinically, it's been great over the years, but it's so much better with demoscopy. Um, you, you, um, <clears throat> 90 to 95% of melanomas are detected with a full skin check. They're slow growing, as we said, they're flat. And there's specific demoscopy clues. Now, those of you who have done the courses and are going, you'll understand this. It's the key one is called chaos and clues. And it's a simple algorithm to learn. You can learn this in a day and get cracking. Uh, there's a second one, which we teach as an advanced course, the uh, prediction without pigment, where you can find the A melanotic melanomas. We can do this now. And you can pick those up. You get the, uh, using demoscopy very, very well. So most of these we can find now and, and you can as you, as you go. Um, it's a decision to excise chaos and clues. Uh, you, it's 50% on the way you find what we term biological chaos. It's a little bit creative, but it's what it is and it is defined now. And you have that when you find that you go searching for a clue, one of nine, there are nine clues. You only have to have one clue. You've made the decision to excise this for histology to know yes or no. And one of five of them in good hands will, 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 will be a melanoma in situ. So the excision rates come down in the last decade or two. When I started out practice in the 80s, we didn't have demoscopy, of course, we had good eyes, we had keenness. We would take off 40 to 50 uh, suspicious pigmented lesions to find a melanoma. It was, it was a huge task and it was a difficult task. The future is here, we have demoscopy. And training is essential and training and peer grouping and sharing cases, oh, it's great fun, you'll love it. 
Right, we have skin cancer symposiums. Um, in my interest, I'm a director of this, of course, was in New Zealand. We used to have to travel to Australia in days gone by, but now it's all here. We bring the key lecturer, Professor Cliff Rosendale out, who is co-author of Chaos and Clues with Harold Kittler from Vienna. So these, uh, this course, we have a one day fundamental course and it's a great course for registrars or new doctors new in New Zealand or starting out, you're seeing a lot of skin cancer. And this is a great way to start. You go from nothing to something in the day, you'll be doing chaos and clues on Monday morning and you're up and running. And then you come back and revise, do the two day advanced course, revise chaos and clues and learn prediction without pigment and all the things that go with non-melanoma skin cancer that I'll quickly traverse today if we have time. There's also now over COVID, we took the opportunity to develop an interactive online course, uh, which is superb, and it's going to be actually advanced a little bit over the next year. Um, so it'll become the certificate for advanced skin, uh, skin cancer demoscopy. Um, of course, it'll be an online exam at the end for self-assessment, self-learning. It's all about that. Um, and it's a great thing, and it's we have it. We also do surgical training skills, uh, and the next one's on Sunday, the 3rd of Auckland. It'll be at uh, Vanika Papuki at North Shore Hospital. So it's medical and surgical treatment of skin cancers. So you can do the one-day course on the Saturday and come on the Sunday to do that as well and certificate, and it's great fun. Here's the chaos and clues. Sorry, it's a bit smudgy. It's just probably my computer. And Cliff on the right there. Cliff's a, a, a fine uh, colleague, and he's also a great friend now. We've done a lot together, and he's he's an amazing person. He's a superb teacher. He's really, you'll just enjoy the day so much and get so much out of it. And uh, he'll he'll he teaches that for us. There are the nine clues. I'm not haven't got really time to go through them. We're not going to teach this today. You need to have really formative learning. Those of you that do it will look at those and go, yep. And they're actually in order as they come. The algorithm, of course, fifty percent chaos. You're halfway there. Find a clue, and you're exercising. Now here's another one. Here's another photo because it's nice to have some pictures and we've got these lesions. And if you look at them all, you wonder which one is the melanoma, of course. And that's what I want you to just to do for a little minute um, and think, oh, which one or two might be a melanoma? And just 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 decide, you know, and uh, the one on the bottom right to me looked, looked very dark and things. And it's all very interesting. And so if you look at it, but the answer is this with demoscopy, they're all melanomas, the whole lot of them. Uh, and that's what it is. Demoscopy lights up the pathway. We see them. It's the world's smallest melanoma on the on the bottom here. I'm not sure whether you can see Mercutius. So go to the heel, come right down towards the big toe, about two thirds away. You see a little dot. Okay. So this is where it comes in the full skin check. And you see this little dot. The old days you just run past that. Nowadays you pop your dermatoscope on it. And what do you see? Oh my goodness gracious me, the thick and broad and trabecular disrupted network with little tiny dots on the end of it, little tiny foot's feet there. That's two clues. Look at that lesion. That's tiny lesion. It's under, under a millimeter. And that is a melanoma in situ. Amazing, isn't it? Nodular melanoma, which we talked about, second most common, evolving in the depth that comes up, comes up firm and it's raised and it's evolving and growing. It's the rare, it's the rare version of melanoma. It happens. We need to take it. It's a double, 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 triple red flag, this one. We need to deal with it. And it's a small number of melanomas. I've informed all my patients that something like this seems to be happening, come and see us. We'll see you at the end of the day, anybody. Um, and it is, it is that, it is, it is, we've got to get to these, they've got a depth, but they're the small numbers, the big numbers are the, are the flat, they're rising inside a mole, and a benign nevus as a new event or in the normal skin or demoscopy, you will find them. We've got specialized areas, the acral and subungal. So palms and soles, as you know, the skin's like corrugated and it's different. We see different patterns in demoscopy. We'll teach you all this on the courses as we go. And there's a benign furrow pattern. If you see a nevus on the sole of the foot, palms, the hands, more common in Pacific Island Maori Asian people with golden skin. For some reason, we don't know why that is. And you want to find these ones because they're bad actors. They're very aggressive. Subungal, the nail bear matrix, specialized areas, you know, the melanoma cells are right uh, right at the um, at the nail plate at the end, uh, but under the skin where the nail comes out, and that's where you've got to go go hunting if you do find uh, signs on the nail. This is tricky, it's difficult, it takes time to learn, but it's it's all there, and the mother nature's showing us these things. It's a wonderful thing. Okay, so key point, melanoma can now be detected in the early non-invasive stage, and you know the schools of dermatoscopy, stethoscope of the skin, 
is the key and the training's here it's fun it's easy and i've given you the link there and the dates and the times so that you for those of you that and if you want to refresh it's the same thing get come back and refresh the more visually you learn and it's a very visual thing uh, that's why it's probably so much fun and uh um, and we've got the world to top two teachers uh teaching this so the key point is a suspicious lesion of melanoma is in front of you uh, clinically, but hopefully you've gone to endoscopy or you have a colleague do the endoscopy or you refer this, but that lesion is suspicious. If you think it's suspicious for melanoma, you're duty bound to do an excision margin, uh, a full excision uh, ellipse with a two millimeter margin, uh, preferably a two layer close, which we'll teach you on the course. So you get a great result then. Uh, and then you wait the histology, you mark this urgent. Okay, so the pathways are clear about this and they've got it bang on. You mark it urgent and in Auckland, the histologist will see that they, they understand exactly why you need it. They will get you that report within seven days. And they're under the pump, uh, the, the pathology in Auckland, as you all know. But if it's melanoma, if you mark it urgent, you're suspicious of melanoma, do it and get that result. When you're taking the stitches out, you can sit with your patient uh, in the event it is one and plan, plan treatment from there. All done as you go. Happy, well, a happy patient because it's all happening timely and you've got the opportunity to communicate this uh, in the correct, proper way on the patient journey. And that's what we do as GPs, and we're good at it, so go, go for it. Um, in situ, you're probably going to refer that uh, from for, unless you've taken advanced training and you know how to go to a deeper margin above the fascia. And now New Zealand skin cancer doctors, doctors like myself with special interest who've done advanced training, do that for in situ lesions in most sites. Um, it's five millimeters on the face, it's out to a centimeter. So these operations can get quite big and tricky and in difficult areas. So they need to be in advanced skill set hands or in a plastic surgeon's hands. Um, Breslow, the depth, as you know, determines the margins for invasion. If it's more than a, um, a um, cent, if it's more than the Breslow uh, one millimeter, the, the multidisciplinary team in, team in Auckland will recommend Sentinel node uh, study first at the re-excision. So the re-excision is done that way. So it's always a referral and an urgent referral. Okie dokie. Um, how are we going on time? 1028. So patient communication is the key. Um, uh, I think we're going to focus on melanoma and we'll do, we'll do mel non-melanoma. I'll just make a few points at the end because time, time is going through. It's so important. So, so sorry about the spelling, but psychosocial body image, fear of dying, recurrent risk, return to normal life. All these things for patients are at the front of their mind when they hear melanoma. It's in situ. You can reassure them that the re-excision, they're going to survive pretty much 100%. It's so reassuring in the moment and it's, a, it's an emotional moment. If it's not, it's got a depth. You explain this. There's, there's some lovely uh, tools you can use online to, to look at prognosis uh, with them and talk that through and arrange the, the next step as quickly as you can. Um, these patients, it's a real shock and, and you need to be there with them and walking with them as a GP. And then when you refer them to someone like myself uh, or a plastic surgeon who does this, uh, or people like Richard Martin, general surgeons who, you know, world standard melanoma surgeons for all the difficult, complicated things, be in the loop with that, stay in the loop with these people. They need a lot of support. Uh, it's a big moment. And, uh, but the good news is most of them are in sight and most of them are gonna survive. And it's a great thing. Patient information is a great booklet from Melanoma New Zealand, the patient advocacy group, which is huge now, and they're very helpful. How are we, how are we going, Louise? Good. And um, it and SunSmart, so you you know, in general practice, this is what we do. We inform, remind, sunscreen. We know all about these things. Cover up the shade, uh, hats, glasses in the summer. These are things that are bread and butter for us as GPs to keep putting out there all the time. Uh, and we need to really politically get our Sun Smart program back in this country so people are reminded in the early spring, summertime to, to do the good behaviours to protect themselves. There's a hell of a lot we need to be doing now. It's so urgent with melanoma. Um, Organise a follow-up or the full skin check with demoscopy. The follow-ups are difficult, the studies are hard, but we know when you've got a melanoma for two years later, there's a chance of another one coming. It's quite high. So we say three, six monthly for the first skin check with demoscopy, six monthly and then two, and then yearly, that's for two years. And then you go yearly for life, which is currently now deemed at 10 years, but it's for life. Okay, so um, yeah, so 
this is pretty much where it is. Um, so we've gone through this pretty well. I've sort of covered that off by talking it through. So hey, look, have a break, take something out. In general practice, uh, it's, you, we, we're challenged, we're time poor, and surgery is a lot of fun. And over 90% of uh, skin cancers can be excised to the best standards in the world. And your surgery, as long as you've got a, a good setup and you've got all the credentials and the quality systems for your theatre and all those things in place, you, you can do a lot of this and a lot of you are. And it's a wonderful thing. Um, so diagnosis, primary care is, is really the key leader in this, and especially in New Zealand and Australia. And we've led the world as, as GPs, uh, bringing demoscopy to the table. And, uh, and, that, and we needed to because we have the epidemic of, of melanoma. What you'll see, basal cell carcinoma, 70%, squames, 25 malignant melanoma is four. And of course, Merkels are on the rise. They're coming up. Merkels are ugly looking, horrible raised lesion that's shining and mucousy, mucoid, like nothing you've seen. It's from outer space. And you just stop and look at this and go, this is really odd. It's probably a Merkel and you need to get it off and get going. Um, so just the core sets for surgery uh, every, day, every day. So in general practice, the core skill set in surgery is an ellipse to two millimeters. Not all of you will be doing that. You'll have someone to refer to in the practice, hopefully, or you'll refer to a skin cancer colleague uh, like myself, a GP, um, or whatever. You'll have a system, but please have a system because that is a real core, core set. And demoscopy is becoming a core set now. It's been defined in the registrar training program and the curriculum as of last year as being a stethoscope of the skin. It's in the quality standards for melanoma for this country. It's in all the guidelines that any doctor doing skin cancer clinical work needs to be abreast with dermatoscopy. Um, quality standards and all those things come in. And we have New Zealand Skin Cancer Doctor Society, um, which is we set up four years ago for the GPs uh, with special interest skin cancer and the advanced skill set doctors doing uh, more advanced surgery and demoscopy. And we have accreditation pathway. It's not too difficult. Uh, we, you can join as, a, as an associate member and work your way through. Um, or if you've got all your credentialing done and your certification, you come in as an accredited doctor and you're on the website and you become more known, which is lovely. And there's lots of things that the organisation is doing on behalf of uh, GPSI skin cancer doctors like ourselves. We've liaised with all the insurers and have evolved fabulous relationships with them in the last year or two. Um, so it's a great thing. So please go on the website and check that out. Um, 52 members. Well, actually, COVID helped us because when COVID came, everybody wanted to join. So we were really busy. Uh, we've got 62 now as it plays out, fully accredited members, advanced skill sets. And we've got about 100 or so doctors floating around who have basic skill sets looking at going ahead. Paul Joblin was our first, first fellow. He did a master's of skin cancer about uh, 12, 14 years ago at UQ uh, with Cliff Rosendale. So best practice skin cancer in New Zealand. And there's your dermatoscope, the Dermalite 4, the one we use mostly with the cell phone attachment behind it. And you can take your photos, track things. Um, and there's the original uh, Heine that I used to use way, way, way back and uh, looking at through the, the lens. It was birthed in Austria in the 80s uh, and it got into clinical practice in the mid 90s. We weren't quite sure how to use it. I got going in 97 and what we were seeing was chaos actually looking back and it was a great help all by itself. And the clues came later, um, but there it is. These are the famous people. And we've got Harold Kittler from Vienna on the left and lovely Cliff in the middle there on the top with Amanda and, uh, and some other people from around the world. Peter Sawyer, who flies between Queensland and Graz. Um, and Ira Zoldak, who's really defined um, Nevi for us, the life cycles of Nevi, so we can really get our head around this benign lesion and when it is, is not a benign lesion. Um, back in the 90s, we did the spot checks, GPs led, fantastic. We knew it was coming, this epidemic. And we've set up skin cancer symposiums for New Zealand now. This is for New Zealand uh, in our place, uh, using the expertise of, of Cliff and Amanda to teach uh, most of this. We bring the surgeons in to help with the surgical day. Uh, and it's, it's a great thing. And it's more affordable. You haven't got to fly to Australia. You've, you've got it all, all here now. It is in Auckland. Um, we have looked at going around the country, but it, it probably wouldn't be viable. But it's, it, it's, it's handy enough in Auckland as we go forward. So there we are, summary and take-home, melanoma site is 99% survival, early detection is the key, full body skin checks, gold standard, demoscopy of course is the gold standard, and we want you all doing demoscopy please, if you're not, just start training, get into it, and jump on the bus and love it, chaos and clues, quick and easy to learn, and the at-risk target population start at the age of 50 and then go with all the other risk factors, it all adds in, and it's, it's pretty straightforward, and shed the light. So we're getting close to probably time I think, Louise, um, 
it's 10.36. So I, what I will do is, is that right? How much more time do we have? Um, so you've got four minutes till the end of your session. So um, <laughs> um, predicted, um, you are passionate about melanoma and felt that that was most important. So thank you for covering. Yeah, I apologise for all that. So got so just if we just I'll just touch on a number of key points without opening the other slideshow. We can use it another time, of course, for non melanoma skin cancer. And there's things like punch biopsies and shades biopsies that we can do through Goodfellow through this medium for you all. And I'm sure Louise and I can get together and organize that as we go. But really, you know, the pathways, they they are this is really something. And you've got it. You've got it all at your fingertips. The wiki, you've got the patient, you've got a pathway in front of you, the patient in front of you. You, you use this pathway um, and it will be updated. It's so easy to update it, but it's such a beautiful uh, uh, collection of, of what it's all about and what you need to do and what the DHPs want to know from you for a high risk lesion and refer early. Don't hesitate to any doubt on your part. Uh, if you're stuck, you can't get a second opinion, you, you may not know, refer it early, get a good photograph of it, refer it early. Now, the thing about punch biopsies, we need we traverse this every time. We just don't want any punch biopsies of melanomas, the pigmented lesions. So rule of thumb, don't punch biopsy, diagnostic punch biopsy, a pigmented lesion. That's number one. Number two, you suspect it's melanoma, it's a two millimeter excision for a whole lot of good reasons. That, that it just it is, that is what it is to start. Number three, if you think it's a non-melanoma skin cancer, and we haven't traversed that today, but we will, um, and it's, you know, it's a red, yellow lesion scaly and it's a squamous cell and you've diagnosed that clinically as you do because you can get good at that and you will do. Um, if you want to be sure and it's in a difficult spot at cosmetically or a, a risk spot surgically uh, and you're not sure you whether you want to do the surgery, you're probably going to refer, but you want to get the diagnosis and you're pretty sure it's a non-melanoma skin cancer, go ahead and do a four millimeter punch pipe, diagnostic punch biopsy. That's fine. If it's pigmented, don't do it. Um, refer it. Um, and if you're capable of, of doing a, the surgery. And remember with non-melanoma skin cancer, the, the margins are curative, they're four millimeters. So you're looking at a big, big bit of surgery and you may well be better to refer that on to someone like myself who's skilled to do it, or the advanced skill set GPs or your, your friendly plastic surgeon. Um, so this, that's really, really important to reverse that. Shade biopsies are another problem. Um, we, we, if the lesion's benign, you know, it's a seb K, it's a, it's a skin tag of some sort on unanevis and it's ugly and it's horrible and it's in the wrong place. Patient wants you to do that. And you're pretty sure you're of that. You can do a shave and they heal up quite well. We do not want to do shave biopsies um, of, of melanomas, period, except on the face in, this, in good hands and trained hands where we know they're thin on demoscopy. We can get right underneath them and we can prove that it's a melanoma in situ as opposed to a changing the lentigo. And this is a very difficult advanced area. So that's really got to be in the advanced hands. So that's one of the times when, when the shave might be helpful. Um, but really at the end of the day, if in doubt, don't do any of these things, refer them on, get an expert opinion. And if it's serious stuff, you've done a punch biopsy and it's a non-melanoma skin cancer and it's really poorly differentiated and it's got perineural invasion, all those things, You've got to move that patient quickly to a spe to the special care, the specialist, and uh, especially on the head and neck where these non-melanoma skin cancers, mostly squames, BCCs, but they're very slow, but the squames are much faster. Your entire country with them and you need wide margins and, and quick intervention. So it, that's a very, very important key points um, on the punch biopsies. Uh, and I hope it's clarified it. Never punch biopsy a pygmy lesion, you'll be safe as and only punch biopsy if you think it's a non-melanoma skin cancer and you just wanted to diagnose it for the referral. A lot of DHPs want that actually. Well, fair enough, they, they, they've got to spend their money wisely and get these people through as quickly as they can. Um, what else have I got here? Early referral of unsure, that is rule of thumb. Look, if you're unsure in general practice, you've only got so much time and energy Refer early, get a second opinion, refer it early and move with that patient. And please, 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 all those young doctors out there, we love you dearly, but become the best demoscopist in the world. You can do it and you will, and you'll have fun doing it and you'll have the stethoscope of the skin running with practice all your lives. And the benefits are huge for your patients and for this population. So I'm gonna leave it there and I'm looking forward to catching up sometime in the future. Thanks Chris for your time um, and a wonderful presentation. And the take home I think is 
pigmented lesions don't get punch biopsy. So thank you for clarifying that for us all. Have a wonderful weekend. Take care. Thoroughly enjoyable. Bye bye. So we're moving now on to what's new in COVID, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Christine McIntosh. Christine is uh, a GP, and she's the clinical lead at the COVID care at the NRHEC. She's also well known for her GP liaison work at Counties Manukau. She's an uh, editor at the Regional Health Pathways and a senior researcher at the University of Auckland. Kia ora, Christine, and welcome. Good morning, Louise. Um, uh, really nice to be joining in this morning. And uh, I don't do all of those things at once, just want to clarify. Um, <laughs> but yes, currently I'm clinical, uh, co-clinical director at the COVID Care in the Community Programme at um, NRHCC. And um, many people will be familiar with the webinars that we've done during the year. Okay, so this morning I just really wanted to give a little bit of an update about where we're sort of seeing things going for the winter and uh, I think I, this is, this is going to be not so intensive as far as information as our previous speakers this morning and I've really enjoyed those uh, talks this morning because this is the core business of primary care, you know, diabetes management, lung cancer detection, skin cancers, I think it's um, really remembering that that is the core focus of primary care is around, you know, picking up on these things, um, doing that care and I think a lot of us have felt that COVID has taken over everything that we're doing at the moment. Um, so I think this is a little bit of about let's take a deep breath look, so let's look what's happening with winter this year and let's think about how we can make it through winter this year. I think the key challenges this winter is, um, is really recognising this winter uh, does bring some challenges, it brings some challenges for the whole health system uh, and a lot of the key focus of NRHCC at the moment in the COVID centre is really thinking about how we're building that resilience for winter um, and that's well beyond COVID. Uh, so we were all recognising that we're seeing some um, respiratory infections coming through which are not COVID now and it's, uh, it's creating I, uh, quite a lot of work because what people are going, well, is this COVID? Is it not COVID? What do we do if it's not COVID? Uh, all those sorts of scenarios. And we're going to see a lot more of the RSV, the flu and things coming through the borders. I think, and I'll show you some modelling in, uh, shortly that uh, talks about, you know, what we're expecting for the winter. Um, and, you know, I think it is a little bit daunting, um, but I think there is a lot that we can do in preparation for that. I think from the perspective of flu, um, normally we do have a large number of hospitalizations for flu in Metro Auckland. And it's worth reflecting on that. We didn't probably sort of recognize it from the primary care point of view. You know, we'd see flu, um, but they do cause a large number of hospital admissions. And we really have had a couple of years of very, very few hospital admissions from flu, very little flu in the country at all because of our closed borders. Um, but just recognising that flu itself is, um, you know, it does cause deaths and um, would normally cause around um, 500 deaths a year in New Zealand um, from flu, not with flu, um, as we talk about with COVID. Um, and we're also recognising that because of the whole COVID um, and, and lockdowns and so forth, not only do we have an MMR, MMR vaccine catch-up campaign for the 15 to 30-year-olds, but we have a lot of infants and, and young children who've also not had their MMR vaccine. And both in New Zealand, you know, we've, we've, we're behind with our MMR vaccines, but sort of the same is occurring overseas. And so we're really quite concerned about also having a measles outbreak. Just to reflect on COVID in, uh, the, uh, in the northern region and just sort of looking at um, the proportion of the population who've now we have a record that they have had COVID infection. And um, early on, um, we saw initially it particularly affecting the Pacifica population and uh, the Māori population. And now we're also seeing it travel through the different age groups. So this is looking at the age groups infected. And we can see now that the greatest increase is in infection are actually in our older age groups, which is 65 plus the 45 to 64s. That's where we're seeing the greatest increases in infections in the last few weeks. 
Um, they've recently released the modelling about what we think winter is going to look like for Omicron, as long as we keep the current through. And there's a, a, a series of scenarios that they have modelled. However, it appears that we are um, following the uh, scenario C at this point in time. As you can see, the uh, blue line there is our actual cases. And this is our hospitalizations, which also appear to be following somewhere between scenario B and scenario C. And of course, scenario C has that a little bit alarming looking peak sitting there in August. So this is, I think, the most important um, uh, thing that I'm going to show you this morning. It is a little bit frightening and it's not a ski slope in winter here. Um, this is... Uh, you can see the peak that we had for COVID back in, in the yellow there, back in uh, February, March. And you can see a little bit of a bump, and we're already seeing a slight rise in numbers um, now for that little bit of a bump. But we're expecting the big bump to occur somewhere between July and September. And that's for COVID and all the things that COVID um, care brings. But the pink there is also the other respiratory illnesses that we're starting to see come through. Um, and uh, this is actually plotting out the um, hospitalizations. But of course, what we see in primary care, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, on top of that, we also see the RSV that particularly affects our very young population and the concerns that that RSV will bring. Um, so I think that the message here is it's going to, it's looking like it's going to be quite a tricky winter around uh, respiratory infections. And uh, the message here really is let's get prepared because actually what we realise in primary care is that we've got to not only deal with the respiratory infections, but we've got to deal with all those other things that people need primary care for. So there is a lot of thinking about that resilience, um, focusing on winter wellness, there's going to be big comms campaigns out to the population, um, there is a lot of focus on flu and MMR and childhood immunisations and thinking about how we can use the COVID vaccination infrastructure to achieve those as well, so that's really trying to assist the primary care networks around getting those vaccinations in as much as possible. It's also about identifying those whānau who need additional support and making sure that we do what we can to support those families. Um, so there are, we are doing a lot of um, adapting and using the infrastructure that we've had for COVID, um, getting those targeted health path, you know, those targeted pathways, um, and really partnering with our Māori and Pacifica providers, especially around those surge plans. And, um, you know, we've really demonstrated that during the Omicron outbreak, how well that can work, um, and, and really getting that to continue to work, continue to um, adapt and, and, and really make those um, really supportive uh, pathways in place. Um, some of you will have heard me talk about the COVID triage tool, which is the risk stratification process for um, COVID that we've been using across the Auckland region. And um, there's been a lot of interest about how we can use that same sort of targeted approach for other winter illnesses. So there'll be some more developments around that. And the DHBs, of course, are also planning for what will be the additional load on hospital services. And what you can see from that previous peak is that it will not just be the Omicron and the COVID, you know, the COVID-related admissions. It will be the, all the other respiratory-related admissions that will be putting strain on the hospital system this winter. Um, as I said, there's a lot of uh, work going on around the winter wellness campaigns. It's really reinforcing those things that we know have worked well for, for COVID, which is encouraging people to continue to wear masks, um, encouraging those uh, behaviours where it's encouraging people to stay home if they are unwell, even if they don't have COVID, just so that we reduce the spread of those respiratory illnesses through the population. Um, so there are a lot of campaigns that are kicking off around, um, and you know, keeping well this winter. Ways of keeping, um, you know, reducing reducing infection in the community. There's also been changes in the access to flu vaccines, and now is the time to get those flu vaccines. And we're sitting, you know, at you know, the flu vaccination um, uh, proportions in the population is still not at a level where it would be ideal and give the greatest protection. So that really is the focus for the next month is to really get those flu vaccines up and running. 
and there are some campaigns around getting that, um, getting the flu vaccines, including getting, um, you know, uh, Whakarangaro Healthline to assist with calling people and reminding them that they're eligible for their flu vaccines and to support them to find somewhere to get their flu vaccine done. Some people will be wondering about the new Omicron variants coming through. And at this stage, um, they have been detected in New Zealand. They are coming through our borders. But at, at this stage, there's no evidence that they are more severe than the other Omicron that we've had, the BA1 and BA2 that we've had. Our predominant strain at the moment is BA2. Uh, and so there has been no need to change our public health settings or advice at this point in time. Um, I think uh, there were a lot of questions in primary care about reinfection guidance and so forth. And just to let you know that that is um, very much a focus of um, Dun Winard at the NRHCC, who is busy uh, um, provide, you know, getting ready some guidance on that reinfection guidance, because I think that's the sort of stuff that's going to be quite hard in primary care is, well, I'm still testing positive for COVID, but I've got some new symptoms as a COVID or not and things like that. So uh, while that's not in my talk today, I'd say that we are um, preparing information to provide further advice for primary care on how to do that. Um, just a reminder that we do need to keep on testing for COVID and people do need to keep on reporting when they have COVID because we have really good systems in place around uh, safety netting people who have COVID when they're at higher risk or medium and higher risk, but also around now um, those people who are eligible for antiviral therapies and making sure. So I think that the message we can give from primary care is people may not think that it makes a difference, but actually it tells their story to report their COVID infection, but it also tells the story of uh, our area, our region, and you know, uh, nationally about um, COVID in our country. And it really helps us to understand where we're at as a community. Um, just a reminder about COVID, I, you know, you can find all of this information on Health Pathways and you can see the recent updates. Um, and just, um, I don't think I really need to go over that in huge amounts of details, um, but there is COVID support that is available ongoing and um, just really uh, I guess the message I have is that people need welfare support. The quickest way they can get it is actually to ring the welfare line, the 0800 number. Um, and, and that's the quickest way to get that support. Just a reminder around um, childhood immunizations and particularly around um, COVID vaccination is not um, high amongst our tamariki. And so there is an opportunity now um, to make sure that we bring as many of our children up to date with their COVID vaccines, um, even if they've had COVID infection. So, you know, just wait that three months and then give them their dose. There's also now um, look recommended that the tamariki who are severely immunocompromised have a third primary dose. Um, now, the GP consultation is required to do that, but that's um, now recommended. Um, but there are further ad campaigns and so forth, really encouraging children to have their vaccinations. And uh, what I would encourage you to do is take a whānau approach to that. So if you get approached to do a vaccination, think about who else in the family might need vaccinations. Look at the, at the other children and infants in the family and make sure they're up to date with their vaccinations. Just uh, the next steps here, um, it, there, as I said, there is a lot of planning going on to look at how we can support primary care and secondary care, and we can actually utilize that COVID um, infrastructure that's been built up around supporting people um, more vulnerable to COVID, but actually recognizing that's an opportunity to support others. Um, and you'll hear a lot more about that in the next month or so. Um, there's a lot of work going on around supporting that MMR immunisation catch-up. It's catch-up for the uh, for the tamariki who haven't had it um, in their you know in the in the 12 a month um, vaccination, but it's also around supporting the 15 to 30 year olds to get their vaccinations as well. Um, so there's a lot of work going on using the, uh, the vaccine infrastructure to achieve that. Um, there's some campaigns, as I said, to get that flu vaccination up to date and a lot of out, uh, out ongoing outreach activities using. Um, and one of the things that's been really impactful for me over the COVID outbreak is really seeing how we can work well with the residential housing um, sector. So that's people who are in emergency housing, transitional housing, boarding houses and so forth, and those people sleep rough around Auckland and there is an enormous amount of work to support those more vulnerable populations to get vaccinated 
um, to have health assessments and so forth and being supported. Um, there's also going to be uh, new ways of looking at new tools and new models and what we have been is very data driven in our COVID response in Auckland and uh, for those people and practices in Auckland you'll know you can download your new case list from your PHO uh, at least daily and that tells you about your new cases and it will tell you those people who are at higher risk of more severe COVID and what you'll see coming through in the next week is actually you'll see some really helpful uh, fields there on those people who are uh, um, potentially eligible for uh, antiviral therapeutics for COVID and there'll be some fields there that will really help you to hone in on those people that you need to think about prescribing antivirals for and we'll be sharing more about that through medins and through the pathways. But we're also saying, well, actually, how can we use that um, leap that we've made in data sharing to really drive improved health outcomes and to drive our models of care through Auckland as well and saying, actually, are there ways that we can predict how we could use this for flu and so forth? So just a reminder, so this has really just been a review really of where the thinking is at and it's uh, and uh, you'll see a lot more coming through in the next month about where that planning has got to. There's a lot of planning regionally and with the Ministry of Health. But what I would say is we're really responding to what your um, PHO clinical leaders have asked for is a lot more information on the therapeutics for COVID. Um, uh, and so we'll be doing a uh, webinar as planned to the 14th of June where we talk a lot more about those therapeutics for winter but we're taking the opportunity to, to widen that beyond just the COVID therapeutics um, and talk about actually the other respiratory infections that will be coming through and when you might think about using other things for um, infections and um, also just looking at you know we've got now widened access um, to the monoclonal antibody for RSV for example, and also never forgetting um, strep throat as well. So I'll just wrap up there. Um, Louise, thank you. Christine, just one question before you go. Um, accessing the antivirals, some of the, there's been questions that the practitioners are having difficulty accessing those. So is there a list of pharmacies where we can access who's providing them, please? Yes, so on the health pathways under the pharmacies who are able to do COVID care in the community and deliver um, medications to families, um, you can find the, the pharmacies that are able to prescribe the, 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 therapy, the antivirals. Um, and those pharmacists have uh, agreed to uh, not only being able to deliver those antivirals, but also to undergo that medication reconciliation, just check that there are other, no other um, in, in reactions within those medications because I, I'm sure everybody who's um, looked at prescribing Paxlovid have, have worked their way through a whole list of potential interactions with those medications. So the pharmacists, the pharmacy are there to assist you with that. They are not to be left alone to do that. You do it in collaboration. Um, but those pharmacies have, um, have agreed that that's, that is part of the service that they are providing uh, and they are funded to do that too. Fantastic. Thank you for clarifying and thank you for your time today and we'll look forward to seeing you in June on the Winter Wellness Webinar. Thanks, Christine. It's my pleasure now to introduce Bruce Hamilton uh, to discuss COVID and exercise, what you need to know. Bruce is well published and has a passion for sports medicine. He's attended four Olympic and four Commonwealth Games in a medical capacity and has recently been appointed to the Commonwealth Games Federation Anti-Doping and Medical Commission. Over to you, Bruce. Hi there, my name's Bruce Hamilton and I'm a sport and exercise physician. Uh, my role, I work as the Director of Performance Health here at High Performance Sport New Zealand and with the New Zealand Olympic Committee. We're currently obviously preparing our team for uh, uh, competing at the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham in about two months time. And so returning athletes to exercise post um, COVID is a, is a hot topic for us at the moment. And I'm gonna present to you today some of the, the um, approaches that we're using in returning our athletes um, to sport. And uh, hopefully that's useful for the general population as well. It's certainly a lot of the data seems to be coming out of the elite, the experiences of the elite population. And a lot of that data is coming from the UK where obviously they've been inundated with COVID and their athletic population has not been spared that. So um, with no further ado, I'll, I'll move on and, and, um, and talk you through um, some of these areas. 
Um, I guess the first thing is, should we be concerned about exercise and COVID? And I think in this context of either people starting exercise after a COVID infection or resuming exercise after a COVID infection, the, the key words here are about prematurely returning to exercise or excessive volumes of exercise um, in that post um, COVID phase. And I guess while it's difficult to find specific evidence for this, the concerns that we have are that by starting exercise too early, starting exercise too intensely after COVID, either resuming or just starting for the first time, then there's a risk that you may prolong the illness, exacerbate um, ongoing um, organ issues that might be there. Developing long COVID is obviously a concern and any stress that we're putting the body under by doing excessive amounts of training may, may potentially um, induce a prolongation of illness and, and the development of long COVID types uh, situations. There's obviously myocarditis and pericard pericarditis considerations and pulmonary complications. And obviously, if people are starting to, and in, in the elite sport environment, certainly people are very keen to get back to full training very quickly. Um, but if we do it wrong, then there can certainly be a, a risk of prolonged absence from you know, life activities, work and exercise moving forward. Um, it's important, though, to put that in balance in that um, there are definitely physiological benefits from doing the right amount of exercise at the right time. And uh, as well as the physiological benefits, the psychological and well-being benefits of exercise are, are well described. And I won't need to be convincing anyone here of that. So I think um, we've got to keep all of that uh, in balance. And hopefully some of the approaches that I'll describe here will um, lead to that. So in terms of overarching principles, and I think this is um, the most important part of any, um, any guidelines or any approach that you have to returning um, individuals to activity, first thing is to individualize it. Um, this is critical in our environment. We really need to understand the medical history. So do do the um, patients that you're seeing, the athletes that I deal with, do they have any medical history that's actually going to put them at greater risk of returning to activity earlier, any greater risk of complications from COVID? So understanding the individual that you're working with and their own medical history, I think is, is, is the most important part of, of this whole process. Understanding, of course, whether they've got a strong training um, and exercise history or whether they are wanting to start exercise for the first time is really important when you're considering how to bring someone into an exercise program post COVID. And then of course, understanding their particular history with regard to COVID, did they have significant symptoms? Was it the symptoms that were above the neck or below the neck? Have they got any residual examination or investigation findings that may be relevant to deciding, okay, well actually is this individual ready to start exercise or not yet? Um, one of the key differentiators that's uh, talked about classically in terms of bringing, bringing people back post viral upper respiratory tract infections and that's being applied now to COVID as well in a sensible way is that if individuals have only above the neck symptoms such as sore throat, um, a little bit of nasal drip um, and, uh, and, uh, and a little bit of upper respiratory cough, then actually the ability to return them to activity can be faster than if someone's had general systemic issues such as you know, what, you know, significant fevers, a chesty cough, development of any uh, lower lower respiratory symptom um, uh, signs and, and pathology. So, so that above the head, above the neck versus below the neck is an important um, distinction that uh, can be relevant in terms of bringing people back um, as we work through it. The next thing, and I think this is equally important, is that we still be cautious. There remains a great deal of uncertainty as to COVID and the long-term implications of COVID, the long-term impacts. And um, at this stage, with that uncertainty, we're certainly promoting a cautious approach to returning individuals to exercise or starting individuals on an exercise program. And that becomes important when you consider bringing people back and the overarching principle of progressive graduated and monitoring um, that return to activity. The first step is education and making sure that each individual understands the importance of monitoring themselves and listening to the advice and taking a graduated and progressive approach. Um, I think it's, uh, there is increasingly in my, in my sort of um, outside of medical world, it seems that there is a, a, um, 
increasing acceptance that COVID is a mild illness and that um, actually we don't need to be too worried about it. Well, I think that's right in the majority of cases, but as I've sort of highlighted above, there's still a degree of uncertainty and each individual will have their own risk factors and uh, capabilities and weaknesses. So, so I think having that education up front as part of any consult where you're looking to resume exercise is really important. Then when you're starting to think about prescribing exercise, it's important to consider the, the progressions that you can make. And those are based on the duration, the frequency and the intensity. So obviously the length of time that anyone exercises, the duration starting at a very low level. So if someone's at quite a high uh, regular exerciser, you may, and they may be doing a couple of hours a day of exercise or an hour a day of exercise, knocking that down to 15 to 20, up to 30 minutes in the start as a starting point would be a reasonable sort of a starting point. The second thing you can control is the frequency. How often are they exercising? Um, don't be scared to give a significant gap between the first and second bout of exercise, the second and third bout of exercise. So you may be giving 48 or 72 hours between exercise bouts to really understand how someone's responded to that exercise before they do their next bout of exercise. And finally, the intensity, and obviously starting with low intensity, low grade exercise and using um, heart rate as a guide to that is a, is a nice way to do that. But also recognizing that you know, lifting weights is, is intense by its sheer nature. And so um, cardiovascular type exercise is a good way to keep intensity low and to start your pro progress. Finally, it's uh, in that monitoring phase is just the importance of recognizing relevant symptoms. It's really easy for people restarting exercise to put down uh, chest pains or palpitations or an elevated respiratory rate or an elevated heart rate to just deconditioning. And while that can be part of the part of the uh, uh, explanation of it, there's also this factor that that actually we do know that a certain proportion of people will develop myocarditis, an ongoing respiratory problem, and long COVID. So I think it's important that we encourage people to report back symptoms and to not just brush them off as part of a return to activity process. And we're certainly seeing that in our elite athletes now, now that we're starting to see a reasonable cohort of people coming through with um, COVID. We're certainly now turning up uh, myocarditis uh, predominantly as one of the, the concerning factors. And that may be presenting with either palpitations or some quite atypical chest pain from what we've been seeing. And finally, um, the mental health. So obviously the benefits of exercise are well, well recognized from a mental health perspective, but also the pressure that that individual may put on themselves to be exercising and just reinforcing and educating people that actually this is a slow process and that we do need to be doing this gradually in order to not create some anxiety or pressure on people to be doing that. And keeping an eye on an individual's mental health the whole way through this process is obviously uh, really important. So this, this table just gives you a, a sort of a step-by-step -step guide. It's based heavily on work um, from the, uh, the elite group, the, uh, a group of doctors working with elite athletes in the UK. It was recently updated uh, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And this is sort of our modification of it, if you like, and, and simplification of what's in the journal. But that's um, freely available, and I'd encourage people to look that up if you want to do some more reading around this space. Um, but essentially, we're looking at moving people from being having an active infection through to returning to their normal and anticipated level of um, exercise over a two to three week period in reality. Obviously during an active infection, we're encouraging people to fully rest, drink plenty of fluids and continue to eat as well as they possibly can for whatever period of time it takes to actually get over those initial um, symptoms. As individuals are starting to recover, we want to see them being able to perform their activities of daily living, including walking up to four or 500 metres without getting excessively short of breath or excessive heart rate raises, um, and really comfortable doing what they, what they need to be doing around their, their daily living before they really start to contemplate adding exercise as another stress onto their recovery process. The first step in that real genuine uh, return to exercise is adding in, as I alluded to earlier, just low-grade cardiovascular exercises, exercising at less than 70% of your maximum heart rate as a maximum, remembering, you know, less than 70% is your maximum. So if you're a 50-year-old male and your maximum heart rate's about 170, you're really looking at keeping your heart rate down below 120. 
remembering that being in this post-viral phase, actually your heart rate may be artificially elevated slightly anyway, and so it may be hard for people to keep that heart rate down. It's really important they keep within those boundaries, keep the intensity right down to allow the whole body to continue to recover while starting to get some of the benefits of exercise. We've changed that. Uh, there's certainly evidence that, you know, certainly for those above neck symptoms, which the majority of individuals are, a couple of days in that phase, as with each of these um, three phases in returning to normal activity, a couple of days may be enough, but again, being prepared to draw that out. And of course, I think that the, that's, that's two to five days of exercising. And so if, you're, if there's risk factors or the individuals um, had a particularly severe bout of COVID, then actually giving them more recovery in between those sessions is important and that may draw out the two to five days as it's, as it's illustrated here. The next step in the cardiovascular development is obviously just a progression of, of uh, intensity, increasing that heart rate, keeping an eye on that recovery, making sure that um, they've still uh, got plenty of time to recover and that they are recovering. And then as, you, as we start to enter the normal phase after you know, anywhere between four and 10 days, um, you're starting to increase the intensity, reduce the um, duration or the, uh, the recovery period and increasing the duration that individuals may want to, noting that we don't need to be getting everybody up to two hours a day. Um, that's sort of a maximum guide for those that were already uh, training to quite high level. So um, obviously that will be significantly modified depending on the nature of the individual patient you're dealing with. And then returning to normal activity, I think is a really important phase that's often overlooked as individuals are back in doing what they would consider their normal exercise levels. It's important they continue to monitor for palpitations, chest pain, artificially elevated heart rate compared to what they would expect at any given level. And that may be signs of actually not being fully recovered and needing to back off. So I would certainly at that point um, continue to encourage people to monitor themselves and if in doubt, to get it checked out. So um, one of the important things that's been highlighted um, recently is that recognition of red flags. And I've sort of illustrated a few of those on the way through, you know, shortness of breath that's for any level of exercise that's greater than what they would expect is probably a sign that there's not been a full recovery. Any chest pain or palpitations or elevated heart rate is definitely worth um, clinical review in my view. Um, excessive fatigue is often difficult to interpret um, in the post-viral phase and returning people to sport. But I think uh, it may be if individuals aren't recovering, then you definitely need to be looking at reducing the duration, reducing the intensity and increasing the recovery between training bouts such that if they're not fully recovered and they're still experiencing fatigue, then actually we may be needing to back them down that, um, that progression. Um, Psychology is, is increasingly um, a consideration, certainly for our elite athletes as we return athletes to training. And so I think having a good understanding of the individual patients that you're working with and their own mental health requirements is really important. Obviously, persistent headache and syncope, um, or even just an, an, uh, into a, a relative perceived exertion. So the RPE down in the bottom right-hand corner there are all other indications that actually there may be something going on and this individual may not be ready to be exercising at the intensity that, that um, they are. And so again, I think a key message is if in doubt, check it out. Um, we don't understand COVID fully yet. We don't understand its relationship with exercise and particularly from where we are at the moment, the cardiac considerations um, remain high on our alert list, albeit that the real prevalence of, of issues uh, does appear to be dropping compared to what the concerns were a, a year or two ago. So finally, my comment would be that prescribing exercise is a, is a great um, and important part, I think, of, of all practitioners um, working in this space. There are a lot of um, interested groups around um, the um, around the country that you can use as a resource. There are exercise physiologists, physiotherapists, um, and other groups, uh, other exercise groups, all of whom are uh, interested in the same thing that we are, which is getting people back into exercise um, in a healthy way. So I'd encourage you to use those groups and also the guidelines that are available um, through Goodfellows um, are excellent in terms of uh, where exercise and the general pathway back into um, health.
So thank you for your time. Um, hopefully that's useful. It continues to change um, as we learn more and more about COVID. Um, and certainly our experience is going up as we're starting to um, see more and more elite athletes experiencing COVID and the return to play challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. That was a fantastic talk. Our next talk is by Twila Percival on long COVID in paediatrics. Twila is a consultant paediatrician at Kids First Hospital in South Auckland. She's an honorary associate professor in the Department of Paediatrics at the University of Auckland. And she's also a member of the clinical advisory group in managing COVID care in the community. Kia ora, Twila, and welcome. Thank you very much. So good morning, everybody. Um, it was really nice listening to that that previous um, presentation. And I do feel like um, those of us in child health are a bit behind um, general practice and adult medicine with COVID. We, we're sort of learning, very much learning as we go. And um, if in doubt, check it out, I think is a really good, uh, a good place for me to start and probably gonna end as well. Um, but I guess uh, what's important to start with is that um, COVID has affected children uh, as well as adults. And though uh, the mantra is it's much milder in children and it can be asymptomatic in children, when you look at the cumulative cases that we um, see in New Zealand, you know, with Delta, almost a third of the cases in Auckland were, were children and young people. And we're seeing a similar thing um, with Omicron as well, and including children ending up in hospital. So we um, see kids in hospital with COVID as well. And we've seen more and more kids with um, Omicron ending up in hospital. And some of these children come in with actual COVID illness. So um, bronchopneumonia, bronchiolitis, a lot of croup and um, diarrhea with, with Omicron. And um, some children come in with something else and incidentally found to have um, COVID on their PCR. With Delta, we had a number of border children. So the, um, the whole of their family was really unwell in intensive care. And we admitted a number of children just because there was nobody else to look after them. And we've had very, very few um, sort of Kawasaki-like post-inflammatory COVID cases. Um, I guess what we're seeing at the moment in the, the sort of Omicron post-vaccination phase is we're seeing more under five-year-olds, as you'd expect, coming into hospital, and they tend to have a lot of upper airway symptoms and also diarrhea. Um, so even though it's probably less severe as we see in adults, um, we are still seeing hospitalized children. And some kids, of course, those with um, disability are particularly more vulnerable. <clears throat> so this is kind of the spectrum that we see with COVID. We have the mild asymptomatic children who are the great majority. We have some children who are really unwell that need oxygen, IV fluids, um, steroids. And then we have children who have a sort of a prolonged course. We have this sort of inflammatory ongoing COVID symptoms and then a few rare cases of children presenting with Kawasaki-like post-inflammatory um, COVID symptoms and children with MISC, which is the much more severe, again, Kawasaki-like syndrome with multiple organ involvement. And those um, children are fortunately quite rare. This is quite a nice picture, which I, I think if you look at the little graph underneath, it sort of shows um, most of kids in that early phase are coming in with the acute symptoms as you'd expect. And we have the children who present at four to six weeks with the post-inflammatory severe syndromes that we've, we see quite rarely in children, which is MISC or PIMS. And then there's this sort of tail of children. I guess this is similar to what you're seeing in adults with ongoing symptoms, which drag on for a bit. Um, chronic cough, chronic headache, fatigue, a bit like you've seen in adults. And I guess what we are sort of finding it hard to figure out for children is how much of a problem is this? Um, this is a, um, just a quick summary, just, just so you're aware, and I'm sure you all are aware of what to look out for, for MISC. So usually four to six weeks after COVID, and they can be asymptomatic or um, mild, and then they present with high fever, very high rate inflammatory markers and multi-system involvement. So brain, heart, lungs, guts, liver. Um, and generally, I mean, in the literature, 
this is quite rare, but there have been certainly lots of cases, so there's lots of experience from paediatricians and looking after them. Most of these children will be all right as long as they um, hospitalise fairly early and they, they get steroids. This is kind of just summarising what that graph was showing. So we have acute, then we have the sort of the post-acute um, severe inflammatory syndromes, and then we have this tail of kids and we don't quite have an idea of the prevalence or the severity of what we call post-COVID, I suppose. And um, it's, it's hard for us to say how common this is. There are um, lots and lots of studies. There's been a recent um, uh, meta-analysis which put, I think, 21 studies they looked at and the sort of overall prevalence of post-COVID, um, long COVID was thought to be around about 25%, but th that's just one study. This is a really nice recent publication from our um, friends over in Australia, where they had a COVID um, clinic following children up. Um, some of those children just had mild symptoms, a, a few were admitted, but they were able to follow them for a year. Um, and what was, what was good for us to see is, I guess, their clinical experience. So a lot of children had post-viral cough, which went on for a couple of months. Um, post-viral fatigue, I think you see this in adults, also went on for a, a couple of months. But what was nice to see is that most of the children, their 12 months, were back to baseline. So um, this is a, an experience, I guess, which a lot of um, pediatricians are seeing. So by and large, most children get better eventually. Definitions are one of the things which has made um, this estimate of prevalence uh, difficult. But this, I guess, is the accepted definition now, which is 12 weeks, a duration of 12 weeks or more, and um, unexplained by something else. So it, it, it's that 12 weeks, which is just, um, it, it is rather arbitrary, but it gives us something to hang our hat on, particularly when we're looking at research. This is um, a Scandinavian study which really looked at healthcare use. And it's quite nice because it shows, I think, what we would expect, which is in the um, four weeks after children were COVID positive, and this is across all age groups, there was this big rise in primary care use. And that's kind of what we would expect. And then it tapers off. But you can see there, it takes it probably about six months before it comes back um, down to baseline. There wasn't uh, an equivalent big rise in special services, but I guess this tells us kind of what we are seeing in, in practice. This is the CLOCK study, which is a UK study, and this uh, is, has followed um, two groups of children with surveys, a group who were COVID positive and another group who weren't COVID positive, and they matched them, ended up with probably about three and a half thousand children in each group and the response rate to the, the surveys getting sent out was under 14%. So um, not too bad, but it, it could have been better, I suppose. But I guess the, the strength of the study is it tells us that um, there is a difference. So at three months, you can see there, the children who were positive, um, less likely to have no symptoms than the children who weren't positive. And if you, the, 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 the reverse, of course, is um, children who are positive are more likely to have symptoms at three months than the children who were negative. So that the two of those are 66% and 53%. Um, what was interesting is that when you look at the particular symptoms, there was no difference in symptoms like um, mental health, overall well-being, impairment of activity or fatigue between the two groups. But there was a significant difference, as you'd expect, I think, in um, unusual chest pain, shortness of breath, and um, loss of smell. Um, so th this is a, it's a useful study because it tells us something which we know about children and young people, which is symptoms come and go for many reasons. But for the children who have, who've had COVID, um, they're not dissimilar from other kids, but I think for us as clinicians, we will be looking out for children who have issues with persistent shortness of breath or chest pain. <clears throat> so um, the big long list, which um, the kids may experience, um, 
And many of these we will see in children anyway who haven't had COVID. But I think um, as we're going forward and we're learning more and more about um, COVID and persistent symptoms in children, we're going to look out for things which stand out for us that make us think about complications. So that's going to be um, things that make us concerned about cardiac and um, respiratory, so persistent shortness of breath and um, chest pain or, or um, palpitations. So um, the other important I think, thing I think for children is to consider other diagnoses, always particularly with our young people. Um, we need to think about other possible causes for all their symptoms and I'm sure you will do that anyway. We think about complications and those red flag symptoms. By and large, um, as with the previous speaker, we try to get children to go back to what was normal for them. So getting back to school, getting back to engaging with their friends and peer activities and having fun and getting on with life. And when children have persistent symptoms of any kind, even when they're unwell, we try to do that because we know that's so much um, better for their mental health and general well-being. There's a really nice... Um, simple handout for parents on the Kids Health website about recovering from COVID with lots of really good advice for parents. I think one of the things that stands out for me with um, COVID with children is that, um, and we've seen this in the literature around trying to um, distinguish between children who've had COVID and children who are just dealing with this very long pandemic, months and months of um, tough life is the um, what I'm seeing certainly is I guess the mental health issues with children and young people which is anxiety, difficulty sleeping, worries about their parents, worries about their grandparents, loss of friends, um, school disruptions. So I think um, even though we are here talking about long COVID and COVID symptoms and recovering from COVID, I think equally in the mix for children we need to think about dealing with the pandemic and hard lockdowns and how do we help children with that and help their parents to help children with that. And I'd have to say that that um, is a big problem at the moment. And I'm sure you are seeing lots of um, families in your general practice and helping them with that. So I'm going to end there. Thank you very much and um, very nice to be part of this. Wonderful. Thank you, Twila, for joining us today on your busy day. Um, and we really appreciate that. Um, we're just going to move to a quick break. We'll be back at 11.35 discussing atrial fibrillation. Thank you. Kia ora, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Louise from the Goodfellow Unit, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan Davies from Northland. He's a stroke physician and geriatrician at the Northland DHB. He's also a clinical lead for Stroke for the Northern Region Alliance. He's the chair of the National Stroke Network and clinical lead for stroke at the Ministry of Health. He's also involved in the Health Pathways for Northland. He's talking us to us today about atrial fibrillation and what's new in this space. Kia ora, Alan, and welcome. Kia ora, and thank you, Louise, and, and, um, and, and thanks everyone for this opportunity. Um, the, um, uh, I know I sound very strokey from the from the introduction, but this is uh, this is this covers a little bit more than just just um, stroke. However, this we started a piece of work in the northern region um, last year about um, about supporting uh, management of atrial fibrillation in the community and um, re uh, rewriting the atrial fibrillation pathway was part of it. So this pathway actually was released uh, about six weeks ago. Um, and um, so this is uh, reasonably hot off the press. So um, this is the, this as, as a stroke physician, this is the sort of thing we see not infrequently. In fact, this this when you look at the um, this slide, it's uh, it's from a few years ago now in the pre clot retrieval era, and you can see a typical atrial fibrillation re related thrombus in the right middle cerebral artery. And uh, this is on the plain CT scan, and this was in a young woman. Um, so um, atrial fibrillation and strokes related to it don't uh, only occur in older people. And the thing about atrial fibrillation related, related strokes is they're big. So this this young woman was thrombolized. We didn't have clot retrieval back then. Uh, otherwise, she would have had that as well. Uh, and this is the uh, the ultimate result. Thrombolysis didn't work. It doesn't work and doesn't tend to work in clots this size. 
Um, it's asking a lot of the thrombolytic agent to dissolve something that big because um, when we do go and pull out the clots, this is the size they are. So um, when we looked at the, uh, the data from the last ARCOS study, we uh, could identify that we had a, a big scope to um, prevent a lot of these strokes occurring by, uh, by getting it up front. So atrial fibrillation arterial, it's common, um, it fixed and it's, uh, it has a significant uh, equity and ethnic uh, variation to it. So it, it fixed 20% of Māori over the age of 80. It was the cause of 30% of all ischemic strokes in ARCOS 4 study, which is back in 2012. And of that 30%, eight were on anticoagulants and most of those were subtherapeutic. So um, a lot of these strokes uh, would, would have been preventable. And in terms of the equity, Māori and Pacific have atrial fibrillation uh, onset, 10 years younger than non-Māori and non-Pacific. And Māori and Pacific people have strokes on average 15 years younger than uh, non-Māori and non-Pacific. So we have a significant issue there in terms of, of its spread through our populations. And of course, atrial fibrillation related strokes are expensive. But there are other consequences too. If you have atrial fibrillation, you're more likely to die. Um, you're more likely to have strokes, as we talked about. You're more likely to have um, uh, left ventricular dysfunction and heart failure. So it's not just the stroke as being the adverse consequence of atrial fibrillation, there's the cardiac adverse consequences as well you're more likely to suffer cognitive decline irrespective of the stroke history. Uh, depression has increased. More than 60% of people notice impaired quality of life and a significant number of people will find themselves in hospital every year. Um, so we rewrote the pathway and it's based on the European Society of Cardiology, um, which um, uh, is, um, which uh, published its pathway in 2020. And this is the, uh, the pathway they published. And it's, it's, the, it's a very much an algorithmic pathway now. You confirm the atrial fibrillation, characterize it through a, the 4 scheme, and then treat through an ABC uh, algorithm. And that's, that's very much what our community health pathway is based on. You'll have seen the community health pathways. This is the, the, the new type. Uh, but I actually prefer the old type. I find the, the new one a little bit insipid. So what I'm going to do is, uh, is change over to the, the live pathway so that we can actually um, uh, have a play with it and I can highlight the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the key features of it. Yep, okay. So when we get into the, the pathway, um, the things that we want to look at, uh, uh, um, there's, the, there's these red flags and there's the background of atrial fibrillation, which I've already talked about. Um, and um, uh, the first thing I want to point out is that access to the pathway is based on a, on a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. You do not need a 12 lead ECG to diagnose atrial fibrillation for this pathway. There are a number of other devices that you can use, which include the, the single lead um, um, personal devices such as the um, Cardia Alive Core, which you can pick up for about $250 in this country or $80 in America. Um, and the Apple Watch is also FDA approved. So there are a number of approved devices for the, the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. Uh, so to enter the pathway, if you've, uh, if you've got this diagnosis um, based on any of those devices or on the 12 lead ECG, definition is that if you do a 12 ECG, the whole ECG, that whole A4 sheet needs to show atrial fibrillation. Uh, if you're doing it by rhythm strip, a single lead rhythm strip, you need a continuous 30 second um, uh, recording of atrial fibrillation uh, to satisfy the criteria for accessing this pathway. If you do not have those, if you've got a few beats of atrial fibrillation, a few seconds of atrial, atrial fibrillation, you have not yet diagnosed atrial, atrial fibrillation for the purposes of entering this pathway, uh, in which case you would be looking to um, perhaps have other monitoring occurring over a longer period of time to see whether this person does actually have sufficient atrial fibrillation to warrant um, taking it further. Now, the next thing I, I want to highlight, um, uh, the uh, investigations, I'm sure you don't need me to go through the symptoms and signs. Um, uh, you will assess the underlying causes, which we, which we know about. I'll just say one thing about the underlying causes. Atrial, um, Caffeine is no longer considered to be an, an underlying cause of atrial fibrillation. So if you coffee drinkers out there, um, you, you're safe to drink coffee from that perspective. Um, atrial fibrillation is not more likely to occur with caffeine. If you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, caffeine will not make it more frequent. Uh, however, if you are in atrial fibrillation, caffeine will tend to make the symptoms a little worse. 
uh, that probably doesn't have a long-term consequence. And in terms of investigations, you do need to perform a 12 year ECG to look for un underlying cardiac pathology. And that's the reason for doing that. Um, primary options um, may pay for it if, if you think you're gonna have to send this person to hospital, otherwise they don't. In Northland, we've moved to um, providing uh, funding for 12 lead ECGs for, for arrhythmias if the person um, is unable to pay. So that's usually quintile four and five. And the other thing is echocardiography is now considered to be a standard investigation for the diagnosis of the causes and consequences of atrial fibrillation. So you'll need to look at your local and you, the, the, um, the, the request pages will take you through the criteria. You'll need to look at your local criteria publicly funded at echocardiography or consider the private sector sometimes. Um, but echocardiography is a requirement unless there's a reason not to, such as uh, somebody has significant other life-limiting um, conditions such as advanced frailty or malignancy. And then we get into characterizing the atrial fibrillation. So essentially, um, what's the risk of stroke? Um, how, um, how much atrial fibrillation have you got? So uh, how symptomatic are you? and how naked is the heart from it or, or as a cause of it. So we've got um, establishing that this, the stroke risk, which is the um, uh, chance of score, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, there's assessing the uh, symptoms and there's a, a very simple uh, stroke, uh, symptom score for atrial fibrillation there. Um, assessing the severity of the burden, which, is, um, which there is a classification. So first diagnosed, paroxysmal, persistent, how long has it been going on for? And then finally, we talk about substrate severity, but that's essentially how naked, naked is the myocardium or the, or the valves. And that's 12 lead ECG and echocardiography required for that. And just, just um, then documenting uh, the characteristics of the atrial fibrillation from that perspective. And then really it's moving on to the, um, to the management of atrial fibrillation. And this is, uh, Obviously, refer if, there's, if they're acutely unwell. If it's within 48 hours, consider acute uh, um, uh, cardioversion, and that's a discussion with the, the on-call cardiology service. Treat the, treat the underlying causes, but then we get into the ABC, and that's really what, where I want to focus on now. So um, anticoagulation, A, anticoagulation to avoid stroke. Um, it's a sequential management tool here. You identify those who should be on on anticoagulants irrespective of anything else. Um, so people with mod moderate to severe mitral stenosis with atrial fibrillation require warfarin. People with me mechanical heart valves should be on warfarin anyway, but certainly should be if they're in atrial fibrillation. And people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy currently haven't been studied. Um, so, and they are at higher risk. They require, they can have either a, um, uh, a non-vitamin K oral anticoagulant or warfarin. And then use the CHADS vest to exclude the very low risk people. So that's zero in males and one in females. And then moving on to the um, uh, HESPED score. The CHADS vest is in this protocol. So this, this will take you to a CHADS vest scoring sc score when you do the characterization further up and tell you how to interpret that. So um, generally speaking, if, if it's greater than two in males or greater than three in females, um, uh, strong recommendation for anticoagulation. If it's one in males, two in females, still a recommendation for anticoagulation, but a weaker one. And if it's zero in males, one in females, it's not considered to require anticoagulation. Now there's a, um, a caveat on this, which is here, um, pointing out that Maori and Pacific Island people have their atrial fibrillation typically um, 10 years younger than, than, um, than non-Maori, non-Pacific. Chad's VASC is not validated in, in that population and you should be considering uh, your decision about anticoagulation, particularly for the mid-range group um, when, when you're talking to um, Maori and Pacific Island patients. My view is that uh, if I see a Maori male who's 55, who may well come up with a score of, uh, of zero or one, I would be pretty keen to anticoagulate them. Um, but I'm a stroke physician. So moving on from that, a point now is on the HASBED score. The HASBED scoring tool is not a balancing um, tool for um, deciding whether to anticoagulate somebody. Um, it's not about balancing tool against the CHADS VASC. It is a tool 
to help you evaluate bleeding risk and how to manage bleeding risk. So a number of these seven items are common to the, to the chance desk that has, that has led um, such, uh, uh, it has common um, items in it. The idea is to identify the items, manage, try and manage the risk to these. A number of these are reversible. So managing that risk and then also identifying which patients you're going to need to follow up um, more uh, thoroughly. And I've just done what I was hoping, meaning not to do, which is, um, which is, no, fine. Um, so, um, so the has been scoring tool is not to, to make a decision not to anticoagulate somebody, it's to help you manage the people who have increased, increased breeding, bleeding risk um, despite their anticoagulation. The other thing about has bled, you'll notice falls is not uh, one of the items in the has bled. Um, falls by itself does not change the, uh, your algorithm about whether you're going to anticoagulate. The modeling would suggest you need to fall 300 times in a year um, before the bleeding risk from falls uh, outweighs the benefit of being on anticoagulation. I think that's um, something we don't do all that well. Uh, so that's that's uh, about anticoagulation and certainly um, with the new, new um, oral anticoagulants, we are seeing quite a, um, uh, a, a lot more ability to, um, to manage this. And at the bottom of this, you'll find quite a nice little chart which gives you the comparisons um, that uh, between the um, those, excuse me, I've just done that again. Um, bear with me for a moment. You'll find at the bottom that is a uh, uh, is a quite a nice um, little chart comparing at the uh, main anticoagulants. When it comes to symptom control, the, um, the the key point around this is that generally speaking, um, rate control and anticoagulation is preferable to rhythm control for the reasons that um, rhythm control doesn't guarantee that you're uh, at low risk of um, of stroke, and the antiarrhythmic medications have significant side effects. Uh, in this section, you'll find factors favoring rhythm control. If any of these factors are present, then consider referring for cardiology assessment about rhythm control. We recommend that as a specialist decision. And I think the final thing that I want to, um, uh, to, to uh, cover in terms of key points is that it's really important to have aggressive management of cardiovascular risk and comorbidities. Some of the atrial fibrillation related morbidity and mortality is preventable and it's not just around stroke. So aggressively managing the risk factors and the comorbidities is really important uh, for managing people with atrial fibrillation. And we tend to leave that out a little bit. So um, please um, have a look at that uh, as part of this process. And then finally, I'll just go back to the, um, so there's the key points, uh, diagnosing the rhythm, um, getting your investigations done, the, uh, the 4S assessment, the stroke risk, how bad are the symptoms and how bad is the heart? Anticoagulation, the use of the has bled, the issues around falls and not actually taking an awful lot of notice of them unless people are falling very frequently. But, um, and keeping in mind the increased risk of Maori and Pacific Island people to modify the way that you have your discussion with people. Um, the rhythm control requires careful selection and we would, we would recommend referring to cardiology services if you think uh, the individual in front of you should be considered for rhythm control, which is either um, medication related or, um, or electrical. Or, uh, or, or the more advanced um, te techniques um, and invasive techniques. And finally, aggressive um, cardiovascular risk and comorbidity management. And finally, I just wanna thank the group of people who have, have had some fantastic input into this, this program of work um, uh, over quite a long period of time now. This has been delayed quite a bit by COVID, but, um, uh, but one of the things that you will also be exposed to now, particularly the GPs in the Metro Auckland region, is that we now uh, uh, have uh, developed um, changes in your PMS systems to help support the, the decision around particularly anticoagulation. Uh, and uh, 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 
Kia ora koutou. Thank you, Ellen, for that. That was fantastic. And it, as you say, it's been long awaited, but well worth the wait. And thank you for your work on that pathway. It's excellent. Um, our next session is moving on to what's new when facing the future. Be prepared. I'd like to introduce Cheryl Calvert. Cheryl is an advanced care planning program lead at County's Manukau Health. She's involved in the introduction, promotion and training of the implementation of the advanced care planning in clinical and community settings. She has a gerontology uh, nursing background. Kia ora Cheryl and welcome. Um, so thank you very much for having us. I um, work with County's Manukau Health. I'm the advanced care planning lead here, having uh, moved from um, Auckland about a year ago. Um, I uh, am very excited to have the opportunity to uh, talk to um, the update um, in healthcare pathways. Um, Advanced care planning has been um, in New Zealand for about um, 10 years now, and it has had a number of iterations over the years. Um, what I'd like to talk to this morning is um, what is advanced care planning very briefly, um, where you can find that information on healthcare pathways, and uh, just specifically because I'm in counties, um, what our process is and uh, what our funding streams are. Um, just noting that it will be different in different areas for people. Um, so advanced care planning and is, uh, should be kept as simple as we possibly can for people. It shouldn't be a complicated process. It is a process of uh, thinking about, talking about and planning for um, future healthcare and end of life care with our patients and with their whanau. Um, it is about identifying what um, matters most to our patients. Um, we need to remember that it is uh, person-centric. It is a voluntary process. And as clinicians, we are there to support people to uh, initiate the conversations, to continue the conversations, to uh, help them become aware of what their health conditions and prognosis and pathways might be and also the treatment and care options that they have got. And uh, where advanced care planning comes into process is that it's around listening to what our patients' preferences for healthcare are, and then negotiating that healthcare with them and with our colleagues. So in New Zealand, um, advanced care planning is held nationally by the um, Health Quality and Safety Commission, and uh, they support uh, on a regional and local basis, the DHBs who subscribe to the program as well. Here we go. So in um, health pathways in Auckland Regional Health Pathways, the health pathways team have updated the advanced care planning pages for us this year. Um, we used to sit purely with the end of life um, and palliative care um, information and pathways programs. Um, what we have asked this year is that uh, we also sit within the lifestyle um, information pages. Uh, that's because the focus this year is to try and move away from end of life um, to um, involving everybody with advanced care planning, whether you're a healthy individual, whether you've just got a new prognosis, whether you're a stable, um, stable health condition, or whether you're somebody who is um, in the last year or last six months of your life in palliative. Uh, it also sits under um, legal and ethical um, because uh, often people will have either advanced directives or enduring power of attorney um, when they're having conversations around advanced care planning. So advanced care planning, as I say, end of life, legal and ethical, lifestyle, um, not only is there information on advanced care planning, but also on the education um, that is available to clinicians um, in the Auckland area. That's both information around um, DHB um, driven education sessions and the uh, Health Quality and Safety Commission's national program. The education page uh, is in drop down and has all the links from the main pages on advanced care planning. Uh, Advanced care planning has got um, 
online modules as a basic training level. It has one day training days. Um, and if you're really, really keen and you'd like to become a facilitator, you can join the national program and help support the training to your local areas. Um, just to highlight that although there's the three points um, on the Health Pathways menu, if you actually just tap, um, tap Advanced Care Planning into your search engine there, there's actually 33 touch points. Um, so it's just to say to you, um, I would imagine that um, when you're seeing people in your surgeries, um, it's not just advanced care planning that you might want to discuss, but linking it to the conditions that um, people have. There's multiple opportunities to engage people with advanced care planning. Um, we probably are having those conversations with people already, but we're not naming it as advanced care planning as such and possibly not handing it on um, when we need to and as frequently as we need to as well. It is a process um, and uh, the processes that we use within our DHBs in the Auckland area differ slightly. So um, just be aware that if you're in Auckland or Waitemata, it's different from the process in counties. Um, all of your um, DHBs will have either a local contact point or a local facilitator or your PHOs or and or your PHOs will also have contact people that you can clarify those processes with. Um, our contact details are all on this site and all on the uh, Health Quality and Safety Commission's website as well. Um, funding is um, very dependent at the moment on um, which DHB you are in and what that DHB has negotiated um, from their funding pools. Um, in counties, we offer um, a small amount of funding for the initial support of advanced care planning with your patients. Um, I'm not sure what the situation is with Auckland and Waitemata at the moment, but I believe they don't have funding allocated per se. Um, there is also funding through um, palliative pathways as well. For counties, we do have some eligibility criteria for that, and that is listed under the funding information there for you as well. Um, that's my contact. I am more than happy for people to contact us, as is the um, Health Quality and Safety Commission. If you can't find the people who are local to your area or in your PHO, please don't hesitate to contact um, one or both of us. We um, certainly uh, network widely throughout New Zealand and um, support each other um, in this conversation as well. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Amber Davies and she's going to talk to you around shared goals of care. Thank you Cheryl. I'll just introduce Amber to everyone. So um, Amber's going to talk to us about the Serious Illness Conversion Guide. Um, she's a nurse specialist at Middlemore Hospital who supports clinicians and patients in navigating goals of care communication decisions when recovery is uncertain. And she's a national facilitator for the Serious Illness Conversion Guide. Thank you for joining us today, Amber. Thanks, thanks for having us. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. <clears throat> so just a little introduction about uh, shared goals of care and where you can find this information on uh, health pathways. Uh, a little bit initially about um, what is uh, shared goals of care. Uh, it's been created by the Health Quality Safety Commission to support uh, patient deterioration in hospitals and facilitate high valued care. Um, it's now part of advanced care planning in this process um, and approaches being advocated across the whole of service, um, primary, secondary, and it strongly aligns with choosing wisely. Uh, shared goals of discussion should be informed by advanced care planning um, uh, plans or discussions too. And it's when uh, patient, their whānau and clinicians explore patient values along with care, treatment options available, agree the goal of care for a current episode of care should that patient deteriorate, and a shared uh, decision-making process that occurs between patients and the clinician team, um, and at a minimum, the overall direction for an episode of care, the curative, restorative, improving quality of life or comfort whilst dying and any agreed limitations on medical treatments that might need to be identified. 
uh, hospital shed goal decisions, um, you may already be seeing starting to sort of feature in discharge summaries. Um, <clears throat> what is the purpose of a shared goals of care? So it aims to proactively align uh, whānau clinician goals as part of the advanced uh, care planning process. There's a focus really on providing um, appropriate care, what we can do rather than what we won't do, um, and agree in a direction of care for um, the specific episode of care. So an episode of care, um, and in this context of shared goals of care, means medical services, nursing services, or health related services um, provided to a person for a specific period of time ending in discharge or completion of that person's uh, treatment plan or whichever is later. Uh, this process will support informed individual decision making and ACP and ARC and in the context of uh, COVID management in the community as well as in the hospital setting. Um, so here's a little um, view of the suite of our ACP uh, tools that can aid this process. ACP can um, obviously occur at any time and as the person's plan for their future health, it also contains um, an option for an advanced directive within. Um, ACP, as we said, informs a shared goals of care discussion. We have a serious illness uh, conversation guide, um, otherwise known as the SIG. Um, which can support um, these shared goals of care discussions. Um, the shared goals of care discussions uh, and decisions should be shared with ARC um, and obviously GPs to ensure that it's picked up and used to review or to start um, an advanced care plan or update uh, an advanced care plan uh, shared go goals of care document if things change. Um, there's an increasing opportunity for shared goals of care discussions to start, start in pre-admission clinics for uh, elective procedures and in ARC and as early as possible in an acute admission. Uh, so a little bit about the Aotearoa uh, Serious Illness Conversation Guide. Um, this guide is an evidence-based uh, framework for clinicians to explore uh, what's most important to patients and their whānau. Uh, it's a recommended approach for a shared goals of care discussion. It uh, can be located on the healthcare pathways um, under the ACP uh, clinician resources section. Here you'll find all the resources relating to ACP um, and either through that or talking COVID specifically, um, COVID related adaptations. So what is it? It's a, a guide that lists a set of patient-centered questions designed to assist the clinician on gaining more thorough understanding of uh, their patient's life in order to inform care decisions. Uh, we want to understand more about patients' understanding of their illness, their preferences for information, their personal goals, their fears, their worries, the abilities that they find most important to their daily life and trade-offs they're willing to take for the possibility of more time. Often when clinicians face stressful situations like a serious illness conversation, it helps to have language to turn to in order to make sure the key questions are covered uh, and all important issues are addressed in a patient-centered and efficient way. And this tool has been adapted to support COVID-19 communication and decision-making in the community. Uh, so if we have a little look at our uh, key points so far, talking about shared goals of care as a process, uh, be prepared for discussions, be familiar with the Serious Illness Conversation Guide and Shared Goals of Care Forms. Um, part of that is around sort of checking our bias as well, finding any, um, look for any advanced care planning um, documents that may have been done before, um, and have a check in with the wider team really about um, what might be appropriate for this person if they were to deteriorate talk with patients and find out using the serious illness um, guide to support your decisions for that person. Um, and around ending that discussion with a recommendation for uh, shared goals of care approach for this person. Obviously, it's a really important and helpful for the wider team to have that information documented and shared. Uh, and that information to inform the care and treatment often during an admission if the person does deteriorate. So our aim is to really sort of support 
um, a whole of system approach. So how does this fit with the shared goals, uh, fit with advanced care planning? So it supports, as I said, it, the clinicians to be person and centric, to engage in sort of authentic uh, shared decision making, to the recent um, New Zealand uh, research has used uh, the SIG structure to support shared decision making in their perioperative uh, complex decision pathway in the Bay of Plenty. Um, and this structure was well received uh, by both patients and clinical staff and was found to be a really useful tool. Provisional audit findings for the clinic found that just over half of patients that were seen uh, chose a non-operative course and while 39% decided to proceed with surgery and were supported to undertake perioperative advanced care planning. And the final four patients uh, were undecided at the time of audit. Uh, so documenting um, this process, the Health Quality uh, Safety Commissioner has designed a form that can be used and we're in the aged care facilities um, also, it's been adapted uh, for COVID, and I'll show you that um, shortly. And so, obviously, documenting these conversations and decisions um, can occur at many different places. Uh, having a specific form um, is a, helpful to ensure that the clinicians document the preparation discussion that they've had on the back of the form and the specific goal of care uh, on that front. So. <clears throat> it's important that the summary of that uh, discussion is captured on the form so when the clinicians are needing to take action based on this um, specific goal of care that's been decided on, they have context um, to inform that goals of care of reference. So a summary, the things to remember is a shared decision is made, it's documented clearly, only one specific goal of care is um, chosen. There's a medical review if the person's condition changes and a new form is needed if the decision um, also changes. Uh, this is a, a view of the shared goals of care, uh, COVID-19 in the community, based again um, on those uh, decisions around um, restorative uh, and uh, symptom management or comfort in the, in the community. And so for patients who may um, have serious illness and, and contract COVID-19. Uh, next you'll we'll pass on to Tammy, who will put all this together and show you what it looks like in action. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Cheryl. So introducing Tammy now. Tammy uh, is working down in Nelson and she's currently the clinical lead for the Shared Goals of Care and Advanced Care Planning Working Groups with the Commission. Hi Tammy, welcome. Hey, kia ora koutou, good morning. Thank you for the introduction. The, um, the whakatauki of the Shared Goals of Care and Advanced Care Planning Programme is Martina Ma Mano Ka Rapa Te Whao. By many, my, by thousands, the work will be accomplished, unity and strength. And I think no other programme like Shared Goals of Care and Advanced Care Planning bridges that primary secondary care divide because what is undertaken by both sides of the sector is vitally important for the other. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give two examples of clinical cases where this divide I think has been bridged really well and I really want us to show us what good looks like. Um, and one is just a justification for why this is so very important. And the second one, I'm just going to touch on cardiopulmonary resuscitation, which is a specialist interest of mine as a cardiologist. Um, when I consider, uh, uh, you know, the evolution of communication style and why this is why this work is so important, I think about the pendulum swing from the very paternalistic style of, of days gone by to now what I perceive as almost a maternalistic style to decision-making in medicine, where patients are offered almost an a la carte menu or suite of interventions, some of varying use in their particular condition, and they're expected almost to navigate comple complex decision-making themselves. And it's very much akin to a mother trying to sit down with a child and saying, you can have carrots, uh, vegetables, some cheese sticks or chocolate, and, and hoping that they choose the right decision um, with some guidance. 
I think the truth of communication styles lies somewhere in between, which is why shared goals of care as a shared decision making process is so vital. And I hear this time and time again, every time I do a workshop, there is always a question that comes up. But yeah, we, do, we, we just don't have time for this. This lady presented to um, hospital. Um, I'd known her well prior to um, this uh, hospital presentation with a small bowel obstruction secondary to a sigmoid tumour. I had previously referred her for a primary prevention internal cardioverted defibrillator when her ventricular function failed to pick up after appropriate medical therapy. But she has a normal suite of medical problems that we see in uh, septinogerians in 2022. And the surgeon came to me and sort of said, Tammy, um, First of all, I always laugh when this happens because they say, you know, I'd like to take this lady to theatre. She's, she's got a bowel obstruction due to colonic cancer, but she's got no evidence of metastatic spread. Um, and, and can you make her fit for surgery? And I just always think, crikey, what do you think I do? If I could have made her better by now, I would have done. Um, but he said that, you know, I, I can cure this. So is she fit for surgery? And at the time, we just um, developed the serious illness conversation guide, and I just recorded some training videos for the commission. And I just took this new guide and I thought, OK, I'll give it a go. And so I asked the surgeon what he thought was the risks of each procedure. Thinking about the intents that we're supposed to be discussing, curative, restorative, symptom focused or care of the dying patient. Um, and so he said, look, you know, I, I actually don't think her cardiac function is up to, to uh, chemotherapy. But um, I think that with a, a sigmoid colectomy, there's a 70 percent chance of cure, 10 percent chance of serious complication rates and 20 percent chance of hospital prolonged hospitalization. And I said, well, what about something else like a loop ileostomy? And he said, well, that won't cure her. But he did acknowledge that it had a lower complication rate and, and a lower chance of prolonged hospitalization. Um, and when we started talking about just pure palliative care, he started to get very, very nervous and said, but this lady is wearing a leather jacket when she came to see me. Um, so I was sort of mused like that. I must make sure that my fashion is up to date when I hit my older age. Um, as is per my normal practice, everybody who I refer for a, a cardiac uh, defibrillator, I encourage them to write an advanced care plan. And in, um, in the South Island, our advanced care plans are digital and available on the electronic health record. And as with everything, when you try to encourage people to make an advanced care plan well ahead of time, you're not making a decision, you're preparing to make a decision later on down the line. And when I reviewed the plan and thought about this, there were some things in here that I did find really useful. She definitely was very keen uh, to spend time with her family. And ahead of time, she had also very much put herself right at the forefront of decision making and said, actually, I want my family to do exactly as I've said, even if it makes them feel uncomfortable. And so this matriarch of the family ahead of time was signaling to everybody concerned that she was the decision-making authority in her family. So I sat down, having read the advanced care plan, knowing her, picked up my new serious illness conversation guide and, and went through that and identified that her priorities was around her daughter, actually, that I didn't know her daughter had been in an abusive relationship and was about to remarry. She was quite philosophical about the long term and she was quite lonely since her husband had died. She acknowledged day to day difficulties and she thought she was on the verge of needing care. She was keen to insulate her family during the wedding preparation. She really wanted them to enjoy this special time. But when we spoke about what she was prepared to go through for more time. She, she acknowledged she was really existing now and not living. And she was quite clear that for her time was not a priority. So when we discussed this and discussed the options available to her, she actually uh, 
decided and, and preferred to have a loop ileostomy and and to be able to be out of hospital and to free that family up from the burden. And the advanced care plan really in this domain didn't directly inform the decision, but some of the commentary that Iris had made along the way really helped me educate the family and, and support the surgeon actually in the decision making. I would think that the surgeon took twice as much talking to as the patient because he was really, really frustrated. He said, but I can cure this. And I said, you can cure this, but you can't cure Iris. She has significant burden of health and surgery, substantive surgery will make that worse. She uh, did manage to get home um, the same week. She did manage to attend her daughter's wedding and she died about six months later in hospice. We don't have time not to do that when we think about collectively in the system that providing the right care to this patient actually saved the system a lot of time. The second case is, is about cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And I think our focus, our assimilation of out of hospital and in hospital cardiopulmonary resuscitation algorithms has really confused or blurred the margins in our mind. And I think in hospital, it's actually a very low value intervention. Out of hospital, it is vital to bridge people to defibrillation, to preserve their brain function by manually emptying the heart with chest compressions whilst we seek to restore normal sinus rhythm. But in hospital, the median time to defibrillation is about one minute and defibrillators are everywhere. The majority of people who have a cardiac arrest in hospital are the end result of the dying process where the heart is the last organ to die, not the first. So this is Brian who presented this year with esophageal cancer. Um, and uh, six months into his treatment, he was helicoptered to Nelson Hospital with complete heart block and hemodynamic compromise. Uh, the doctor in at the initial hospital in, in Wado Blenheim um, informed Brian that he was not for cardiopulmonary resuscitation and he needed to complete the paperwork to um, send the patient in and into hospital transfer to Nelson for a pacemaker. And he informed Brian of this. Brian was very, very distressed and was very angry at this decision and didn't feel happy and was very, very keen to receive all medical care that would be life sustaining. So what did they do next? They sent in a lady doctor as well to try and have a talk to Brian to persuade him how terrible cardiopulmonary resuscitation was and that he really didn't want it and went through various options. And I think this was, to me, was the perfect example of the paternalistic versus the maternalistic. So the, the paternalistic style telling you, not engaging you, the maternalistic style was just talking you through the options and hoping to persuade you that really you didn't want cardiopulmonary resuscitation because it was very nasty. Brian was still pretty adamant he wanted cardiopulmonary resuscitation. When I took him over to Nelson and he came to us on both isoprenaline and an adrenaline infusion. So I started to think about what was the right level of care and whether he would should have CPR, should he require it, which would include external pacing, permanent pacemaker and isoprenaline, that would be an A, or whether he would be just restorative where we would try and get him home and we would uh, do some things to keep him uh, to keep him going, but we would not do cardiopulmonary resuscitation or whether we do, and I've done this before, we just do a symptom focused and say, look, if, if you deteriorate and die with complete heart block, then we won't stop that process. But if you have, if you're still alive with complete heart block and you feel pretty unwell with that, and you're not clearly dying right now, then we will consider just plain permanent pacing as a palliative procedure, or, or whether you start somebody in the syringe driver. So, Brian also had had an advanced care plan. It, it wasn't um, signed off yet because he was in the early stages of his um, cancer diagnosis. His, he was worried about the future in terms of his life. He'd, he'd had quite a varied and interesting life. 
Um, he'd been a POW and was currently writing up his memoirs. He was awaiting for the memoirs to come back from the publisher. And he was very keen to see them distributed uh, to his family overseas. He lived quite remotely in the Marlborough Sounds, and, but was well supported by a neighbour who was currently off doing the Otago Rail Trail. So I sat down and we went through the Serious Illness Conversation Guide after reading the ACP and his priorities were completing his memoirs and circulating them to his family. He wanted to die at home in the Marlborough Sounds um, and his, he was waiting for family to be able to arrive from the UK from COVID isolation. He was again quite lonely since his wife had died and he was isolated from his friends and family in the UK and his neighbours. But he was quite a religious gentleman and prayer was certainly very helpful. And he was definitely adamant he wanted to finish his book to complete the things on his agenda. He wanted to die, but just not today. So through that process, we spoke about how we would continue the isoprenaline and defibrillate um, and with a goal towards permanent pacing. And if he had a cardiac arrest, we would keep him in a monitored coronary care bed so he would have prompt access to defibrillation, but he would not require CPR because he had prompt access to defibrillation. Mm. And he agreed with that. He actually did a rest and was defibrillated twice without CPR, was transferred the next day to the pacemaker lab, had a pacemaker inserted, went home that evening. And I would say that if we had undertaken CPR on him at 86 with palliative esophageal cancer, there is no way that he would have gone home and completed his goals of care. So just briefly, um, CPR and resuscitation are not synonymous. CPR is not the three letter acronym for resuscitation. Resuscitation is an intent to restore life and CPR is a subset of that. Many treatments that constitute resuscitation in one context constitute best medical care in another. And what I'm developing hopefully with the commission is an algorithm to allow us to consider better what CPR is for. And it's really only to maintain organ perfusion whilst the cause of um, cardiac arrest is being reversed. And it's, Effectiveness is determined by three factors. Patient factors such as frailty, advanced cancer, or um, metastatic cancer or organ dysfunction, but also the mechanism of cardiac arrest. So in hospitals, cardiac arrests due to cardiac arrhythmia, due to general anesthesia, due to anaphylaxis are reasonably easy to reverse in the state of cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest due to sepsis, pneumonia, or multiple organ failure are not able to be reversed in the stage of cardiac arrest and CPR should not be undertaken. And then also we need to consider where his care is optimized. What are we going to do to prevent the second cardiac arrest? And often we don't consider whether the factors uh, around the mechanism of deterioration or whether care is optimized. And I would suggest that about 80% of people coming into hospital should not actually receive CPR. And if we could change the culture and make not for CPR standard as part of our normal day to day practice, then I think we open up the opportunities for these patients to receive other forms of resuscitation that are evidence based and may help them in their healthcare journey. CPR decisions are in the ACP, and I think it talks to what I'm talking about here. So option one is around, I would like the treatment aimed to keep me alive as long as possible, and I would want CPR to be attempted, yes or no. I think if you say no, that does not mean that you don't want to receive defibrillation. I don't think that means you don't want to receive other forms of resuscitation should you have general anesthesia. It just means you don't want chest compressions and rescue breaths. If you're actually further along your journey and you do not want to receive any form of resuscitation, then that's a two. And similarly, um, if you're even further along and you really are looking at symptom focused care, then that's three. I would encourage people to, to use four though, a, a lot, because 
illness is contextual and I would offer this I would offer um, a well 75 year old CPR for um, a myocardial infarction but that second same person presents three weeks later with pneumonia and I'm not sure I would offer them CPR so I'd really like us to encourage the idea that these these decisions are often contextual in the current illness particularly when we're thinking about rolling out ACP to more fitter people or people earlier in their journey. So in summary, ACP is overarching and often advanced directives are, are not so important or, apl or applicable. ACP is about preparing us to make a decision, not to make a decision today. Patients when completing the CPR section need to be reminded about what the purpose of CPR is. CPR is just chest compressions and rescue breaths for the purpose of maintaining organ perfusion whilst the cause of cardiac arrest is being reversed. And DNA CPR should not alter their access to other evidence-based interventions and some forms of resuscitation. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy, for that. That was fantastic and very informative. Thank you too to Cheryl and Amber for being here today. To finish this section, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. James Jack who is going to talk to us about POI discussions. So James is the medical director and palliative care physician at Totra Hospice here in Auckland, where he's worked full time since 2012. He's one of the co-founders of the Palliative Care Virtual Community of Practice, Palliverse. Kia ora James and welcome, thanks for being here today. Kia ora kato, kato pato. Hi, I'm James Yep, and I'm speaking to you on behalf of the Specialist Hospices of Auckland. I'm here to introduce POI, the Palliative Outcomes Initiative. And before I start, I'd like to share a, a story that I wrote. So I'm sure like myself that some of your fondest childhood memories centre around food. The smell of fresh ruin of bread, crisping in the oven, spicy lentils simmering away in a pressure cooker, or it could be apple shortcake baking on a cold winter's evening. My late auntie Helen was a great cook and a fantastic baker. When I was little, I'd thumb through her recipe book and ask, can you cook this for me, auntie? As I grew up, auntie's health worsened and the last 20 years of your life were spent in and out of hospitals. By the time I was training to become a palliative care specialist, auntie Helen was very, very unwell and ended up spending the last six weeks of her life in hospital. Plugged into various 24 hour infusions. Despite my inquiries over the previous two years, a referral to palliative care services only occurred in the final three days of her life. My auntie, who had loved her home and garden, never had the opportunity to spend time there again. Had auntie Helen known that her time was very short, she might have made some very different choices. She was never given the opportunity to do so, and our family missed out on chances to create nicer memories with her at the end. Unfortunately, late referrals are still happening today, right here in the white, wider Auckland region where people continue to miss out on the same opportunities. Stories like Auntie Helen's keep driving myself and my palliative care colleagues to make a difference. So that's sort of the why of the POI story. So you can find uh, links to the POI webpage from the palliative care section of the Community Health Pathways clinical editor note uh, highlighted in yellow. If you click on that, it will take you to this website, which has been active since November 2007, launched back then, and we're here to stay with our contract confirmed for at least the next two years. So we'll see what happens once we get into the health reforms later on this year, but we're intending to stay here because we feel that it's important work that we're doing here. So this website is a very rich source of lots and lots of information. Uh, you can find out how to complete a palliative pathway activation conversation. And there's also lots of our resources, some of which I will highlight during this short presentation. So as I said, why, why are we doing POI or why have we been doing POI? It's about the aging population. And we all know about this. We work with this population each and every day, and it's a growing population. It's a population which is needing more and more palliative care. So these are the projections for primary palliative care need. This was actually done before, prior to COVID, but by 2036, there'll be lots more requirement for primary palliative care involvement. 
also, sorry, going back a slide. And there's also going to be a huge growth of palliative care need in the residential care facility setting. So that's why POI was set up to increase capability and capacity in the primary care and re, uh, residential care facility settings. So where does POI happen? Well, it's happening all over Auckland. There are a, uh, local POI teams have been operational providing support to the ARC sector and also GPs all over the wider Auckland region. And if you want to go to our website, you can go to www.poiproject.nz. That can take you there directly if you're not going through the health pathways. So how, how are we doing it? Well, we're sharing our regional recipe, which provides a clear and consistent pathway in order to identify palliative care patients earlier. That's the crux of the model. We want you to be able to identify palliative care patients earlier so that they can be considered slightly differently. You may or may not send the patient to hospital for further investigations if they are possibly only having a short period of time left. You have to consider how you want to use that sort of time for your patients. So we've developed a regional recipe, but it still gives us room for local flavors as in we are still able to cater for local palliative care programs that are already in existence. So it's a whole system of approach, recognizing that palliative care doesn't just occur in hospitals and hospices, it's actually in the community settings, especially residential care and primary care. So what is it about? Well, it's, it's a complicated diagram that, you, that I'm not going to explain. You can have a look at the POI website yourself and it goes into greater detail. But the crux of the issue is that there is a palliative pathway activation conversation which involves GP or the residential care facility staff talking to the patient and their whānau about what may come ahead. This is for patients who you think possibly may only have six to 12 months left to live. So on completion of such a conversation, this usually takes about 45 minutes. There's great guidance available in the uh, documents contained in the POI website. So it's a 45 minute conversation. There will be a payment which is processed through the local POAC system. So it's $150 plus GST. So you get to spend some time talking to the patient and the family about what's important at this stage in their life, possibly if they've only got six months left to live. So this includes lots of practical things, which I will touch upon uh, very soon when I talk about the case. So we are committed to this program continuing. We've had to flex a bit, had, had to adapt because COVID meant that we couldn't actually get into residential care facilities to support the staff or into the GP practice settings. So we have developed a bit more of a consultation liaison service as well. And we are providing lots of virtual support. So we're very willing to continue being innovative and creative and flexing to the uh, community's need. So I'm going to talk about a case which will sort of illustrate some of the tools that's um, involved in the POI program. So let's talk about Bill, 76-year-old man who's had COPD for over 10 years. He's been living in a residential care facility for the past two years. He's had multiple hospital admissions for management of pneumonia in this year. Previously, he only had to go to hospital maybe once a year, but each time that Bill goes to hospital, he returns a little bit less well, not quite up to his usual baseline. So current symptoms include dyspnea at rest, anxiety, cough, fatigue. Residential care team consider that Bill may benefit from a paid approach to his care, but are unsure if it's too early. They don't know when to refer. So I'm going to be talking about uh, a number of tools which may be able to help you to decide when to refer. So... First one off is the Australian Karnofsky performance status. So this is a functional ability scale. So 100% is you and me right now listening to this webinar, 0% is dead and everyone else is in between. So at six months prior to Bill's current presentation, he was at around about 60%, able to care for most of his needs, but requiring occasional assistance. Now he's in bed for more than 50% of the time. So he's about 40%. SPIC tool is a really good tool, supportive and palliative care indicators tool. You can go to the website and download it. It's even available as a phone app these days. And look at the SPIC tool 
Uh, you look for two or more general indicators of deteriorating health. This can indicate that a patient is actually a palliative care patient. So looking through Bill's um, history, performance status is getting worse. So there's a red cross there. Two or more unplanned hospital admissions in the past six months. Weight loss, cachexia, persistent troublesome symptoms, ongoing dyspnea, cough and fatigue is what's troubling Bill. His BMI is only 19. He's living in a residential care facility and possibly he would be asking for more help. So Bill fulfills those criteria. And there's also some specific disease oriented criteria. If you look at the respiratory disease ones, Bill's just neck at rest. He's also requiring continuous oxygen therapy. So the uh, residential care facility would like some help to support Bill's care, to optimize his care and also to plan for his future, which possibly may be quite short, possibly less than six months. So phase of illness is another useful tool that we have. And according to this tool, Bill is in the deteriorating category. Things are getting worse. He is not stable at all. He may well be facing his end of life situation very, very soon. So POI, palliative pathway activation conversation will include important stuff like legal stuff, capacity issues, EPOAs, wills, advanced care plan completion prompt. This will Emergency letter might need to be written as you can see on the right hand slide. So advanced care plan completion prompt. So the plan will be sent to local hospice POI team and they'll provide a proactive advisory service response to the plan. So this will include support for the residential care facility or the GP and stuff about medications, but also about the other non-physical aspects of health. So that's in a nutshell is a very quick summary of POI. So please check out our website. We look forward to working with you in the future together we can make a difference. A last minute plug for my book. If you want to read more stories like Annie Helen's, you can check me out on pallyverse.com or else check me out book out, out next month. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. And thank you for sharing that very personal and moving story. Really appreciate that. Um, so we're just going to let James swap over his slides and he's coming back to head the what's new and legal consideration section, talking to us about the end of life bill, which many of you will be familiar of having come uh, into law recently. Uh, James, just before we head into the next session, there was a question about integration of POI and ACP into the practice management systems that we use in general practice. Do you know what's happening in that space, please? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, currently, the POI interface can be accessed via uh, my, my health record, also uh, MedTech, you can get in through MedTech and through, through my practice. So it is, has become much more seamless than when it first started out. It was a bit clunky having to go to a separate website. But the major uh, PMSs now have a button that you can push and can go straight into the POI uh, interface. So that's made it easier and has increased uptake. But we still have a separate web interface because residential care facilities don't use PMSs. Magic. Oh, you've changed your T-shirt. Awesome. Right, we're into it. Thank you so much. Okay, so my next task is to talk about the End of Life Choice Act 2019. This passed into law and became active on the 7th of November 2021. So it's no longer a bill, it's an actual act of law in New Zealand law. So you might be wondering why is a palliative care phys physician talking about advanced, uh, about assisted dying? Well, like many of you, I started off in my career wondering why was I born in this era? I would rather have been a paternalist after having graduated from med school. I just couldn't understand why people didn't do what the doctor said, why they didn't fill out their scripts, why they didn't turn up to clinics. But over the past 22 years as I've grown up and matured, I've become a patient-centered care advocate and strongly supportive of patient choices, not just when it comes to assisted dying, but all sorts of other choices as, as well. And so, as you know, eligible patients only can access assisted dying through the, the criteria of the End of Life Choices Act 2019. So there is now a legal option for end of life care available since the 7th of November last year. So we're just about six months into it. So I wanted to see for myself 
what was going on. So I have attended a number of these um, assisted deaths because I wanted to make sure that there was an adequate standard of care provided by the assisted dying service to my patients who might choose to access assisted dying. And if you want to read more about my care philosophy, check out paleoverse.com. And of course, yeah, that book's coming up uh, next, next month. So you can check that out. But it's been long thought out, long considered over many years. And this is why uh, we are able to support this service. So what do you have to do yourself? Well, all here healthcare workers have legal obligations under the End of Life Choice Act, regardless of your intention to participate in delivery of the service or not. This includes you need to know about the act and you need to know how to respond appropriately to patients who may raise questions. And it's not a matter of if your patients will raise questions, it's when they will, because it is on people's mind. It's especially if they've been given a diagnosis of a life limiting illness, they will be considering all options that are available legally to them. So not if, but when. So who can actually access it? Well, the eligibility criteria are pretty clear from the ministry's websites. To be eligible, you have to be over 18, you have to be a citizen or permanent resident of New Zealand. You have to suffer from a terminal illness that is likely to end your life within six months. So these are people who are dying already, who may be dying in the next six months naturally. So you have to be in an advanced state of irreversible decline in physical capability. You have to also be experiencing unbearable suffering. That's suffering determined by the person, the patient themselves, suffering that they feel cannot be relieved in a manner that the person considers tolerable. You have to be competent to make an informed decision about assisted dying. So this competency point is really important. Sorry. An informed decision is defined that the person must be able to understand the information about assisted dying. They must retain the information about assisted dying in order to make the decision. They must use or weigh up information about assisted dying when making their decision. They must communicate the decision in some way. Do they have the capacity to decide? That's the key question. That's the attending medical practitioner and the second opinion, the independent medical practitioner uh, needing to decide if the person is not competent or if they're not sure, they need to refer on to a third opinion, a psychiatric opinion. And if the person is not eligible through any of those criteria, if they don't, don't meet any, any of those criteria area or they are found incompetent, they cannot be assisted to die. It's very, very clear in the act itself. So where can it take place? Well, the ministry has designed it, the service, so that it takes place in the patient's own home. But you and I all know that not everybody has their own home that they can live in. Some people actually are homeless or they are in rental accommodation and their landlords or landladies may not be keen to support their tenants or else um, they might be living in a residential care facility, which is touted as their forever home, but the residential care facility may or may not be open to hosting an assisted death. The, this is the Community Health Pathways webpage, and you can see in the Five Choice Act right at the top, Clinical Editor's Note has highlighted that the Metro Auckland DHBs will not be providing assisted dying services. However, they will provide a facility of last resort, so if there's nowhere else that they can go, they can they can contact the chief medical officer through these email addresses. Uh, Hospice New Zealand have been very clear in their stance that they will not support assisted dying, as have all of the other hospices in the land. But at Totra, we have a different opinion. And as I said, the care philosophy that I share, the care philosophy that is supportive of patients' rights to choose legal options is something that we support at Totra. So we've gone out on a limb and we have actually provided a hosting venue. So this is a place where patients and families can actually come prior to their assisted death. They would come and meet myself and my small hosting team. They would have a small tour of the facility. As you can see, there's a living room space which can fit up to about 10 people. There's seating for 10. There's access to a little kitchen and a private courtyard so people can plan who will actually be in attendance with the visiting attending medical practitioner on the actual day. We don't have any attending medical practitioners on staff. I'm not an attending medical practitioner myself, but we have hosted other visiting doctors who have come in. 
as you can see, the bedroom space has adequate um, space for family members to actually be there. So they can hold the person's hand, they can sort of be around them, so they can say their goodbyes in a private fashion in a sort of dignified manner. So this is quite private and separate from the rest of our hospice. So not, not everybody will need to know what, what's going on at, at the time that this is happening. So just going back, so what methods are used in New Zealand? Well, the Act talks about which lethal medications. They can either be taken by ingest, ingestion, a person swallows an oral medication, or ingestion of that same medication through a tube, which could be triggered by a medical or nurse practitioner. Most of the patients, most of the people in New Zealand have gone for intravenous delivery, triggered by the person themselves. So they might be able to give themselves the first injection if they wanted to, or else it would be injection administered by a medical or nurse practitioner. As you might have seen in the news in the past six months that the service has been available, there have been 92 assisted deaths in New Zealand. So how does it feel for the patient? Well, it's, have you ever had a general anaesthetic? Because you might know what it feels like. I myself have had a uh, couple of surgeries, gave me some pre-medication, became nice and relaxed, nice and sleepy. Then they gave me um, an injection of a general anaesthetic and told me to count backwards, 10, nine, I didn't make it to eight, I was comatose. And so that's what I think it would feel like for the patients. And that's what I've seen with the assisted deficits that I've actually witnessed. Medication one is given, patient becomes relaxed and they may fall asleep within minutes. You may hear some snoring. Medication two is injected and then patient goes into a deep coma, usually within seconds. And then medication three is given and the patient stops breathing again, usually within minutes. So it's quite a quick process. It's relatively peaceful and painless. And that's what I've seen so far. So you have to ask yourself a question, where do you personally stand? Everybody's got their own personal view, everyone's got their own voting history, but when patients come to see you, they are looking for your professional view, your best professional self needs to answer. So you've got a duty to inform yourself, go to the Ministry of Health website, there's lots of information in print and accessible formats. You can talk to the Ministry of Health Secretariat yourself, so prepare yourself, you have to assess what level of involvement you want, what conversations are you willing to have. There's good training available on the ministry website. Also, you need to understand your employer's own policies. So when a person raises a death, you can either say that you're a conscientious objector. Again, there are different levels of conscientious objection. If you have an objection, you need to tell them, then advise that you can refer on to the SCANS group or refer to another practitioner, or else you might be lacking skills or experience and you feel that you're not able to provide the service yet. But you still need to take care of them, still need to try and ensure that good palliative care is provided to the person. This may, may involve a referral to hospice. So there's lots more information on the Health Pathways websites. There's got lots of good links to national resources. And please, please have a look. There's some good training modules, including uh, other things. So if you've got any questions, please contact me. I am by no means the expert. Or else contact the Skins Group. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, James, for that overview. That was excellent. Really appreciate it. I'd like to introduce Nairi Kurs. Nairi is a GP in Auckland. She's a jo Joyce Cook Chair in Aging Well and Professor of General Practice in Primary Health Care at the University of Auckland. Nairi works at the Auckland City Mission and she's an expert advisor on many steering groups. Kia ora, Nairi, and welcome today. Uh, kia ora, Tvano. Um, it's great to be here. What a fantastic talk from James. I'm still thinking about all of that and it's a very nice segue now into this talk. I've got two talks, so we'll do the first one and then the second one with a short break in between and take questions at the end. Great. So cognitive impairment, I'm Nairi, and the pathway has been updated. So cognitive impairment, just a few question, comments about dementia. Prevalence of dementia uh, is going to double by 2040. That seems pretty scary. What's most important are the costs of health and social care for people with dementia are actually greater than those for cancer, heart disease and stroke combined. So why don't we all talk about dementia all the time and why don't we all consider ourselves experts? 
Um, I've been working away at this question for 20 years and I haven't answered it yet, but it's not really that scary. There'll be about 15 patients with dementia in the average practice and um, about half of them won't yet be recognized and you can expect about one to two cases a year. Our demography is changing. Um, the, the prevalence over age 80 is about 20%. So we all know that the, the number of people around who are going to be 85 and over is going to um, pretty much go up. So dementia, very simply, cognitive impairment is a complex multifactorial syndrome. It is a combination of a whole lot of things, which uh, the clinical features are similar, memory loss, plus one, at least one other impaired cognitive domain. It's not rocket science. It is contributed to by many different um, causes. The most common is Alzheimer's disease. And then we've got stroke related dementia. And then we've got the other things. Here is the pathway. And the health pathway is actually being updated recently. It is very good. Um, it has lots of links. Oops, sorry. It has lots of links to the assessment tools that you need. It has lots of reminders about a comprehensive patient history. This is the most important thing you can do for your patients and their families who might be worried about dementia. It has the cognitive screens that you need. So they're just at the tip of those lovely links which uh, work so well. But basically your job, so here's the prevalences, Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, mixed Lewy body dementia. The pattern of deterioration is different. The gradual onset, hard to work out when it was. Vascular dementia generally stepwise. Mixed dementia, this is actually the majority of people now we think. And Lewy body dementia is a very interesting, fascinating syndrome. syndrome early visual hallucinations, early psychotic features and neuroleptic, neuroleptic medication, which we all try not to give. Um, has disastrous consequences. So what isn't dementia? This is your job to sort out the difference between acute confusional state or delirium and depression. So dementia, the patterns here, I won't talk about them because the clinical knowledge you all have and know there's some very good resources on the Goodfellow site about diagnosis and different ways to interview I find it quite useful to, because I know my patients that you can uh, try to sort out what's, what's not normal and what, what's normal and not normal. But you generally do have to think about these things. How are their thoughts and perceptions and emotions and sleep? This is, uh, you know, bread and butter general practice stuff. This information will be available on my slides, which you can access when you want to. So how do you know that you're normal? Again, <laughs> just thinking about a healthy older person. You know, word finding difficulty is there. I myself have trouble finding my car in a complicated new parking area now, um, but occasional lapses in memory are normal. That's the functional stuff that you really have to think about. So uh, uh, do they know where they are, what time it is, who and who they are and, where they, and what, what they're, going, they're doing? Is their judgment of problem solving okay? Solves everyday problems, gets by, fine. Outside the home, they should be independent in their functioning. And inside the home, most people have activities and interests which they do participate in and are maintained. And they're fully capable in their personal care. Now, some people I work at the city mission, their personal care is not always good. What you're looking for is change over time. Um, and so, if you have early dementia, you have loss of memory for um, recent events. Your orientation, sometimes you lose the plot about what, where you're going and what you're doing. You have difficulty with complex problem solving. And outside the home, you generally have already restricted the activities that you, that you um, participate in and you need the help of other people so you're not as independent. You, however, can appear quite normal and expect to be participating and brought along to things and fully participate in life. At home, you might um, have more difficulty with your hobbies. One chappy that I saw in a retirement village had a huge um, model airplane in his lounge and we were, he had been the chairperson of the Model Airplane Society for many years in that district and now he had forgotten how to repair his uh, model airplane, which had been a passion for him. 
personal care needs some prompting. Sometimes show up in the wrong clothes. Know they're being picked up for a wedding and come downstairs in their, in their gardening clothes. Um, looking disheveled if somebody had always been spick and span. Again, you're looking for change over time. So here's the cognitive assessments which are available on the, on the pathway. They're quite straightforward. The GP COG, give them an address to remember. You can give your own address or use the one that's, that's at the bottom of the link. What is the date today? It should be relatively exact. Draw a clock. And we all remember about that, getting the numbers in the right place. Give them a time, 10 past 11. No, 10 past 11. Uh, 10 minutes to five, something where the two arms have to go somewhere different. What's something in the news? Um, now, I usually do this as I'm just gathering rapport with our patients. So you have a chat about something that's been happening lately. And potentially, they might not know what you're talking about. It does need to be of interest to the person that you're talking to. Mini ACE, and so that is very useful for you. The mini ACE a little bit more detailed. The RUDAS is very good for people who have low levels of education and are from a non-English speaking background. So this applies to quite a lot of our patients and it is much more education and culture fair. The IQ code is pretty essential. So we all know when we're talking to the person, uh, they'll give you their best, but actually you need some verification when you're thinking about cognitive impairment. The verification comes from other people, somebody who knows them well. So that IQ code is simply asking the person who has known them well, whether they actually are losing things, whether they have forgotten and they don't remember things very well anymore and how that is impacting their life. It is a functional aspect, it is a functional assessment of the person. The health pathways have been updated and are actually very, very useful. So the, the your good history taking, the informant history, cognitive functions, you do need uh, to do your blood, the blood tests and you want to get an image if you can of the head. In some areas this is available and in others it's less available. It is always useful, potentially, if it's not going to change management, it may not be worthwhile, but there are a small percentage of people who you discover something unexpected. Okay, so this is the diagnosis. So you've got a mini A score, an IQ code score, or a RUDAS score. The very, very important thing here is that these should be taken under interpretation. And that is that the clinical diagnosis of dementia is made by the clinician after a clinical exam. The cognitive testing is supportive information. It is not enough to do it by itself. It is the clinical history that is the most important. Okay, the cognitive assessment, as I mentioned, should be culture and education fair. Macarena Dudley is developing the, has developed the MANA tool, which is adapted specifically for Māori and is much more acceptable to Māori. It will be coming this year later and, they, and it will be added to the, um, to, the, to the pathways. The RUDAS is what we use in the meantime, was developed in Australia, in Australia for uh, people from other, other uh, non-English speaking backgrounds. The essence is, though, your good clinical history, your examination, yeah, which has to be focused on neurological and cognition and your investigations. When you're making your diagnosis, you need to think about the type, the personality, the person's, um, the person's propensity to falls and their supports at home. Management. Okay, so reframe this from a catastrophe, please. It is not a catastrophe. Person with dementia has been like they have been for a few, uh, for a few um, months at least, if not a longer. Nothing will change very fast. Many people are very, very anxious when they're depressed, uh, when they have dementia. They need reassurance, they need consistency, they need routine. You need to try to understand the beliefs and attitudes and fears that are going on with the person and their whanau. A, um, think about a global assessment. What can they still do? So reframing it from a catastrophe to a disability. We're very familiar with, re, with enabling or re-abling people who are disabled. Let's do that for people with cognitive impairment. 
if they are still participating in work, many people can participate in work for quite some time. We will talk about driving in the next and the next um, talk, and that is important. Manage their comorbidities. That's at all of our jobs in primary care. Review the support that they need and and support the carer. And there is good information uh, under the links for carers' health and carer support. Um, Alzheimer's Auckland, Dementia Auckland, um, and the Alzheimer's associations throughout New Zealand and the Dementia Associations throughout New Zealand are there to help support the carers. There are some specific programs in some places. For the person with cognitive impairment, exercise is still very important for maintenance of cognition. Ongoing cognitive challenge, ongoing participating in productive activities, cognitive stimulation, in, in age residential care and the community cognitive stimulation therapy is available and that um, can be very useful for, for people with dementia. Okay, the EPOA, James went through this very, very well. To make a decision about who is going to take care of your affairs in the future, enduring power of attorney. So um, you have to be competent to make that decision. You have to understand what that means. Okay, so I, uh, you have to choose somebody to take over that role, whether it's your lawyer or whether it's your sister or your daughter. I try to encourage older people to choose somebody younger because that tends to work out better in the long term. They have to understand what the EPOA is. They have to retain the knowledge about the EPOA. They have to demonstrate that they can use information about the EOA, e EPOA and that at the time of signing, they have to be able to remember what it's all about. A law, this is a legal document. A lawyer signs the EPOA. So that usually is put in place. I always try to encourage people to put it in place before the person loses the capacity to make those decisions. There's generally two types, health and welfare, and financial, and, and, uh, financial matters and other management. And so at a time when the person is obviously struggling with managing those things, that EPOA has to be activated. And this is the step that people, oh, you've got an EPOA. And then of course the bank won't um, take any actions or do anything different with how to look after the money until the EPOA is activated. So that means that probably the family will come to you for a letter. And then you have to decide, who, whether Mrs. Jones is now lost the, the, um, the capacity to make those decisions. The client must lack that, that competency, look, lack incompetency, have incompetency, sorry about that slide. So, and then they must, they, so they don't understand what the issues are related to health and welfare, related to financial management, and they were unaware of the consequences of poor decision-making. So then there is some ascertainment by a medical practitioner, yourself usually, can be asked the, uh, for to the older people's mental health people to help, but they do not have the capacity to do it all. And then a, a letter or a statement from the medical practitioner goes to the lawyer with the EPOA document and the EPOA is activated. The main problem is that is often started too late. And then once the person lacks that capacity, you need to go through a process. Now I can see Louise's back. So I'm two, two, one slide away from my summary. So your management responsibilities, optimize management, there's good information on the pathways there. Always review the medications consistently and um, in an ongoing basis. The medications for Alzheimer's disease in particular and Lewy body disease are denazepil and potentially rivastigmine. Be very careful about heart issues. Remember that ECGs are needed for denazepil. And so um, five milligrams noctate to start, titrate to 10. If it doesn't work, you're supposed to stop it. The whole negotiations around stopping it are difficult. Okay, so in summary, dementia is common. It's not overwhelming. It's a journey, you'll go along those journey with your patients. Use cognitive testing wisely and don't forget to support those carers and reframe it as a disability. Okay, so everybody get up, have a bit of a walk around. Um, I'll stop sharing and just find my next slides.
till we um, sit down and have a chat about fitness to drive. Yeah, just one quick question before we move on. Um, yes. Breaking the news about the dementia diagnosis to your patients, do you tell them is the question? Because often patients get distressed and um, potential for breakdown of relationships with their GP with that. So what are your thoughts? So my thoughts are uh, that it is a journey. And I think everybody does have a right to know. The usual, Usually the people who have very little insight and are very resistant to any change or anybody, any worries about their independence being threatened are the ones that it's very difficult. I, th I think you have to try to build a relationship with that person and try to help them understand that they, they, they potentially aren't doing as well as they, as well as they can. Having the diagnosis of dementia opens up the access to services from Alzheimer's um, associations and dementia associations. So I think it is important. I'm somebody who, you know, over the years of my training, uh, patterns of care have changed, but I do think you have to tell them. And I think you have to tell them in the best ways you can work out and you have to have their support people around them when you do that. And again, reframing it as a disability is a really good idea. Excellent. Thank you. We'll carry on. And next talk is Fitness to Drive. Thanks, Nairi. Okay. So if this is a picture of some lilacs participants from my longitudinal study, and they all drove to this meeting in Apotiki. So um, you're, uh, you'll all have great experience of renewing driver's licenses and have lots of discussions about this. We had some focus groups a little while ago as uh, part of the Pathways to Driving study led by Rebecca McLean in the South Island. And um, there was so much open debate about fitness to drive and how to assess it. It is a bit of a minefield. So just a note, driving is really important. Loss of the driver's license and stopping driving is often associated with depression, isolation, increasing dependence. That process was usually already happening and then the driver's license loss seems to be the, um, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. In rural areas, I think in New Zealand, we are one of the highest ongoing driving um, countries in the world because we're very regionalized and there's a lot of people living rurally. People have long driving histories and I got my license on my 15th birthday and people in the country generally have been driving since they were 10. So on the farm. So just remember that driving in rural areas is really, really important for well-being. There's uh, 650,000 people driving over the age of 65 now. That's out of 750,000. So that's, um, um, you know, three quarters. At age 75, there's about 60% still driving. There's 1,500 people in New Zealand over the age of 90. Please look out for them. And there's nine people over age 100 with their driver's license. Overall, when we were all testing all the time, remember when everybody had to have an on-road driving test at 80, about 4% failed that test. So it was a very blunt instrument. Driving is risky. <clears throat> so... Most older drivers are very experienced and very responsible. However, the crash rate per kilometre driven is the highest in the old, oldest age groups. And those older people are much more easily injured by road traffic accidents. It's actually safer for them to be in the car than, as, than a pedestrian. So being a pedestrian is risky and we have a new uh, variety of road traffic accidents from mobility scooters. Um, so the most common crash is when you're turning right and you fail to notice and areas where there is very low vision at night driving is usually more problematic for older people. This just shows that that our younger drivers, you know, 15 to 20, lower proportion of, um, of those drivers, but they have the majority of the crashes. This is why most of the preventive actions are here. And then, of course, the percentage of drivers usually have less crashes. And here, because of the number of kilometers driven oh, and, the, and the rarity of older drivers, they don't provide a lot of crashes to the national database, but per kilometer driven, they have a higher rate of crash. The driving assessment pathway is very good. Your Bible is, of course, the um, uh, the fitness to drive 
information from the NZTA and I've read it and I think it's very, very useful. You can, there are regulations which are outlined there. There's a screening test. You can always recommend an NZTA on-road test um, and there's important notes about dementia and driving. So on the, the pathways are very, very useful. The medical assessment, there's a form. I now know where they are in my practice, but you've got to have some of those. It's not, it's very difficult to find online. I always encourage people to think about the whole person when you're doing it. Um, and introduce the idea early if you think the person is going to lack capacity in the next little while. So there's your resource, the medical aspects of driving from the NZTA and the link is in the, in the thing. So here are your options. Now at age 75, 80 and every second birthday after that, people will need a medical certificate to support the renewal of their driver's license. And the renewal of their driver's license if they do not do that renewal, then it expires. And your choice, which is the vast majority, is that they're medically fit to, to drive. You can give them conditions. This is something when I started my practice, you couldn't do. So the conditions and discussion with the person and with your judgment might be that they only drive during the day in their local area. There's a real mixed bag about um, conditions because of course, you know, young kids on bikes don't know the conditions of the older person and they're on the road. So um, use conditions judiciously. They also, you can choose to ask them to have an on-road driving test. And this is the same cost as, this, as the 17 year olds who are sitting their license now. Just go and have an on-road driving test. There's a place where you can make that referral. And that is actually a very good gold standard because they will demonstrate whether they can drive or not. That is if you have any queries and it is also a way of passing the buck. Another way to pass the buck is if you want the confirmation of a specialist. So people with diabetes who are using insulin, you can get a letter from their specialist. I get in trouble because I sometimes sign the form and say people might be fit when potentially they aren't. I definitely should refer more people for that on-road driving test. Okay, this is quite a useful, useful thing. Have a discussion with the person, show them this on your thing. So what would you do when you got here? Okay, what's this and how does it work? Um, that's a good conversation starter about driving behavior. And this is the cognitive test that is under the, uh, next to the link with the driving assessment. It's slightly different than the ones we talked about, the GP COG and that. It covers the same areas. I think if you think a cognitive test is necessary, you should do it. You should record the result. And if it's very low, you should worry about it. It's the people in the middle that is much more difficult. So I just will talk about that in a little bit more. But what do you need to drive? You need to be able to see. So visual acuity is always a mandatory, mandatory thing, but it's not actually the acuity that's the issue. It's this thing called the field of view. The conditions, cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration, and diabetes. This is the view with cataracts. This is the view with macular degeneration. This is the view with glaucoma. I think you can see why these people potentially shouldn't be driving. And I think this is diabetic retinopathy. Um, so you can see you really need to be able to see to drive. So you need your vision, you need arm and leg function, you need, you need dexterity and you need reaction times. And this is where the field of view comes in. So the field of view is a test, we, it's very quite difficult to do without gear, where the, whether you can see something in your peripheral vision and react to it appropriately is tested. It's about reaction times and it's about being able to see across your whole field of view. You also need judgment, do the right thing. Need to be able to stay alert, so collapse or seizures, et cetera. So the easy decisions, seizures, syncope, critical angina, strokes with hemiparesis, those are easy. Cognition is a gray area. I've got several people who, even though they have mild to moderate dementia, are very safe drivers. They've had their on-road driving test. They usually drive with somebody else because they get lost. So um, it's not mandatory that when you have mild dementia that you can't drive, but you need to think more carefully about it. Cardiovascular disease, it's about the stability of the condition. 
any impact on um, consciousness ever, exercise capacity, and again, reactions. Be careful with the long-acting benzodiazepines. That's the crash risk. And be careful with people with Parkinson's disease or an old stroke. You also think about musculoskeletal if it stops you getting in and out of the car. Okay, so let's just look at a group of people. So 527 people from a memory clinic in Ireland. The mean MMSE is 19, which is quite low. The age was 74 and 73% had a diagnosis of dementia. 26% were still driving. 63% of those, 112 people were daily and 31% of them reported an accident. 70% of them didn't. 70% were considered safe by their informant. And then the things that went with um, stopping driving, yes, cognition was important, older age, living in a city, those things all predicted stopping. So it wasn't gender, or it wasn't whether they had another person, and it wasn't closely related to cognition. So these are the things that you need about your cognition, memory, spatial ability, executive function process information. Okay, so this is my last slide. I just like to say that these are the things from the literature that predict um, crashes. Having had a crash before. So put these things in your conversation when you're renewing. Have you had any near misses? Have you had any, um, have you had any um, little you know, slips or, or scrapes? If there was a serious error, and also people who are not questioning themselves. So those diggers who are out there, oh, I'm going to drive for as long as I want and there's nothing wrong with my driving. So the coin catch reaction time is quite interesting. You flip a coin and they have to catch it. I've started using this. It's kind of a weird thing here. Catch this for me. Um, and then the spatial ability when they really have, have trouble putting things together. Attention, information processing, spatial orientation, and the trails mark the trail making um, test, which is a little bit more complicated. If you have a simulator, if they go in the simulator and they fail the simulator, that predicts a crash risk. That field of view thing, forty percent restriction in the in the useful field of view doubles your crash rate over the next year. The use of long acting benzos, if they have at least moderate dementia. And then if they fail their on-road driving test, those that predicts future crashes. Okay, older people are here to stay. Let's make it fun. And thank you for hanging on in here to, to the end of this most wonderful day that Louise has organized for us. Thank you so much, Nairi, for being such an inspiration and in giving us confidence in those two areas. Really appreciate you being here with us today. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Juliet Soper, who's a paediatrician. Uh, she undertook her medical study, uh, undergraduate studies at Auckland and has been overseas in Canada for the last 10 years working in child protection. She's currently working as a member of the Bururuhau, a multidisciplinary team in child protection in Auckland as a consultant paediatrician. Kia ora, Juliet, and welcome, and thank you for being with us today. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, as Louise has said, my name's Juliet, and thank you, Louise, for the introduction. I think um, just hearing some of what Nairi had to speak about and the following speaker, there's a bit of a theme of difficult conversations in this uh, uh, part of the program. So we're going to talk about sentinel injuries, and uh, you know, my goal today is that when you see a child with a sentinel injury, that uh, you will recognize it um, and that you'll be confident in an approach to a sentinel injury and you'll know how to get help if, if you need it. Um, and I hope that by the end of this 10 minutes, you feel we've achieved that. Sentier in Latin, of course, means to perceive uh, and, and, and a sentry is, is a, a soldier who, who stands in a watchtower to look out for harm coming. And really that relates to what a sentinel injury is. Depending on where you sit in the medical system, if, if you're the person recognizing the injury, it's really a medically minor injury, but we know it precedes a presentation with a more severe life altering injury due to child maltreatment. So 10% of children who uh, have a, a bruise or, or a medically minor injury under the age of six months will present 
um, with life-threatening injury subsequently. If you sit where I sit um, at Starship as part of Te Pururuhu, we of course see children with those life-threatening injuries. And when we look back in their medical chart, there's often documentation or another family member tells us that they'd previously noticed bruises on the child and perhaps not done anything about it. And that's why this is an important talk to share with you today. Um, I hope you can see the top of my screen because I have a bar across there, but I wanted to talk a little bit about characteristics of sentinel injuries. These are visible and easily detectable. They are not the reason the child's come to see you. You might be doing your well child check. You might be seeing a child for bronchiolitis or an upper respiratory tract infection and you remove their, their t-shirt and you see bruises on the chest. They're typically a pre-mobile child because children who don't cruise don't bruise. So we're looking at children who really developmentally aren't able to injure themselves. Um, these are injuries that are poorly explained by a caregiver. So if a caregiver gives you a really clear history of uh, some sort of traumatic injury that caused the bruise and you think it's plausible, that's okay. Um, you get to use your judgment there. But if a caregiver says they don't know how the baby got the bruise or it came from a very short fall or you know, some other mechanism that's speculation rather than actually knowing what happened, that should be a flag for concern. When I say a medically minor injury, 80% of the time these are bruises and they're bruises anywhere on the body. Sometimes around the face where perhaps uh, feeding difficulties and colic can, can lead to the face being held too hard. Um, sometimes around the chest where a baby's thorax may have been squeezed uh, during other events. And um, sometimes these babies have lost the frenulum uh, due to, once again, perhaps to a bottle or forceful feeding. And about 7% of the time, uh, it's actually uh, musculoskeletal deformity that's noticed uh, that's completely unexpected. So swelling or deformity in a limb. So all things that are not the reason for the presentation, but in the middle of your busy day, oh my gosh, what do you do now? And before I answer that, I think it's important to recognize how important this is. I wanted to share this study from Wisconsin with you. Um, it's by Sheets et al. And basically they took 100 children uh, who presented with significant head injury. They took 100 children who presented with non-head injury related child maltreatment. So children who presented with fractures or abdominal trauma. They took 100 children where they could not determine whether it was due to child abuse or whether the injuries were accidental. And then they took 100 children where they were very confident that these were accidental injuries that occurred through typical accidental trauma. And when they looked at these charts in great detail, you can see there's actually a dose response, if you like, in that the more severely injured children had a greater chance of having uh, sentinel injuries recorded in their medical chart, whereas those children who had an accident didn't have any prior history of bruises or frenulum tears or those other injuries. The other important piece to notice is that the blue line in the graph is the timing of the sentinel injury. And the life-threatening or life-altering injury occurs six to 12 weeks later. So this is a window of opportunity when if we do report, these families can be offered support. Perhaps it's maternal mental health that's needed. Perhaps it's uh, help with colic or feeding, uh, but there's opportunity to intervene. Sheet said Ellen, Wisconsin, they looked in the chart and about half of the time, those children who did experience child maltreatment, about half the time, 42% of the time, no medical provider was aware of the central injury. And obviously we can't intervene then. About 20% of the time, the medical provider actually was aware of, of the sentinel injury and had taken the steps of referring the child to child protection services, to the equivalent of Oranga Tamariki in, in the United States. And that's on Oranga Tamariki or, or, or on the child protection agency to do something. But this is where we can do something. About a quarter of the time, 
the medical provider had documented the sentinel injury in the chart. Some of the time they mentioned the bruise in their examination findings, but never provided an analysis, if you like, never provided a, a thought about what it might mean. And, and in a number of these occasions, they determined based on their best judgment at the time that it was accidental or self-inflicted. And I think you have to be really careful. Babies really uh, cannot cause bruises and injuries to themselves. So be cautious of that. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a point on how to address this, how to approach it. And my four step approach is do what you do every day, a detailed history and physical. Remember to document what you see and what you don't see. Consider the possibility of maltreatment. Does the mechanism provided explain the diagnosis? Use your judgment. You're good at what you do. And if you need help, you can always phone a member of our team for, for support in that. Inform the parent or caregiver of the possibility of maltreatment. I think it's always important to remember they want the best for their child too. Uh, and I think their relationship with you in particular as general practitioners is really important and you need to be honest, open and transparent with them and then ask for help. So if we take each of these in turn, particularly on your history and physical, if you haven't already heard of it, remember 10-4 faces P. Or if you can't remember all of that, just remember 10-4. Bruising to the torso the ears and the neck in a child under four years of age is exceptionally uncommon from accidental injury. It can happen, but it's uncommon. Any bruising in a child under four months of age is concerning. In fact, this is a pretty good diagnostic test. I mean, we don't use it in isolation, but I've given you the sensitivity and specificity uh, on that slide. Um, so torso, ears, neck, under four years of age, or any bruising under four months. The other features, if, you can, if you're good at remembering mnemonics, the frenulum, the ear, the cheeks, the eyes, the sclera, that subconjunctival hemorrhage, and any patterned bruising, of course, in any age group is, is concerning. You then need to consider the possibility of child maltreatment. And in particular, I've already mentioned that children who don't cruise can't bruise, and so pre-mobile children should really be a flag. If there's not a plausible explanation, uh, and, and if it meets those uncommon areas for accidental injury. Remember that the most common differential diagnosis for inflicted trauma is actually accidental trauma. And so, you need to take a history of the beginning, the, the middle and the end of the fall. What, what was happening and could this have been accidental? Occasionally there's medical mimics and occasionally there's actually anatomical variants or, or um, normal variants that, that are mistaken for an injury. This is the piece that I think a lot of people find really hard, but but you shouldn't. Your, your job is to consider the possibility. It's not to diagnose child abuse. And, and I feel my job is the same. Uh, obviously, I work with Oranga Tamariki and police and perhaps can be a little more certain when I have additional information. But based purely on medical advice, child maltreatment becomes one of the possibilities. What I say to families when I've been in this situation is that one of the possibilities for this bruise, this fracture, whatever it is I'm seeing, is that someone's hurting your child. Do you have any reason to think that someone might be hurting them? I have had families at that point say, well, actually I am, you know, my, my partner's pretty violent and, and we're really going through a rough patch at the moment. Or sometimes you have people say, I can't believe you're saying that. No, I don't think anyone has. Um, Regardless of what they say, like I give them a chance to talk at that point and then I, I sort of say, look, I hear what you're saying um, that you do or you don't have concerns. I am going to ask Oranga Tamariki and our medical team that specializes in assessing children who have been hurt by someone to help us work out what is causing the screws. And I find parents are then actually quite willing to work with you and to come back to you. 
Of course, at that point, you can pick up the phone and call us. Uh, we're available 24 seven and happy to give advice over the phone. We're also, if you're in the Auckland area, of course, we're happy to see the children. You are required to make a report of concern to Oranga Tamariki, and you can do that by phoning the 0508 number. Um, unfortunately, that number often takes 40 minutes to answer. Um, you can also send in the PDF report of concern. You can email it to them. I'm aware of time, so I'm going to flip over the ice mnemonic, but I can maybe explain it in an email later. Um, the multi-agency team, of course, when you do call for help, we each have a special role to play. And I just put this slide up because as medical providers, we don't have to make the diagnosis. When it comes to sentinel injuries, you just have to raise the possibility and the rest of the team uh, will help you. So I hope that's a bit of a whirlwind, but I hope it's helpful when you see a young child with a medically minor and unexplained injury in your practice. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Juliet. Just a quick question. When we do um, put a, a report of concern through, would we expect as a general practitioner to get something back from OT to say that they've acknowledged it or they've seen the child? I have never had that, but I have had that question asked. Oh, look, I'm newly back in New Zealand and okay. I have I have had an email back from Oranga Tamariki acknowledging the reports. Of cons I've only put in two since I've been back and I have had an email from them saying, thank you, we've received it. They don't necessarily share the outcome of their investigation with you, um, but they do acknowledge receipt. Um, I think as health professionals, we should always be available to have them phone us and I have had them phone me. Um, so if you put your number in there, uh, they will do that. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And welcome home. And thank you for your talk. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, everyone. So our last topic for today is on gun laws. And it's my great privilege and pleasure to invite um, Senior Sergeant Matt Nosley to the floor. Matt's the current pro product lead for the New Zealand Arms Transformation Programme. This work was set up partially in response to regulatory reform in the aftermath of the 2019 terrorist attack. Matt's been in the police since 1998 and his career has been general policing duties and uh, he is now a detective. I'd like to welcome Matt. Um, yeah, so my, my name is Matt Nosley and I am a product owner SME lead for the Arms Transformation Program. So I've got 10 minutes just to take you through a little bit about what's going on and how um, our work may uh, connect with the work that you do and um, just a little bit about how that might go. Um, so, well, the first thing is uh, to know that the New Zealand licensed firearms community uh, numbers around 240,000 people, and that does exclude dealers. So it's just under 5% of the population. And um, the Arms Act actually stipulates that each one of them has to have a registered health practitioner. Um, and of note uh, around this population is that the Canterbury region has the highest proportion of license holders in the country. And um, by way of comparison, so the greater Auckland region, we're on a par with Southland, um, which is smaller than Canterbury again. So depending on where you are in the country, uh, I guess it maybe is depending on how many people on your books um, may actually be license holders and, and, and you know, you'd be requiring to let you know. Um, in terms of license holders in New Zealand, it's actually the 50 to 59 age group that holds the largest number of license holders and then followed by the 60 to 69 age group. And uh, we actually have seven license holders who are over 100 years old. Um, so yeah, they're doing well, obviously, to hold their license at the other, the other side of um, 100 years. And uh, you know, the figures and the demographic, what we see is that um, you know, with younger people, they get their license and as they move um, through the ages, yeah, they, you know, each break bracket, we tend to see more and more license holders, but yeah, the demographics actually are slightly older. So the New Zealand Police, um, we are the ones that are charged with overseeing the Arms Act 1983 and historically this has been one of uh, many roles um, that the organisation has had to carry out and um, so March 15, uh, so the March 15, 2000, uh, the March 15, 2019, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, terror attacks. Obviously, the Royal Commission of Inquiry found that um, we needed to make some changes as an organisation. And so, in the last couple of years, we've been working very hard 
on uh, understanding how those changes might work. And we're now in the process of setting up a new branded business unit that is going to be dedicated solely to the, our regulatory oversight of the Act. Um, and in this week's budget, we saw that the targeted government funding, it's about $280 million, I think, whereas we've been spending about $8 million a year. So it's a significant increase in funding to do what we need to do. And a lot of that is about setting up our, our tech and getting started. Uh, it's important to know that this unit is still responsible to the Commissioner of the Police. Uh, the Commissioner of Police still holds the overall responsibility um, for the Act. And uh, going forward in the future, you're going to hear from this unit. Now, what this unit is called is not the New Zealand Police. At the moment, we provisionally call ourselves the Armed Safety Control Unit. Um, but in due time, you'll hear from us. Uh, we'll have a different name. It won't be the police as such. Um, but it's, you know, as long as you understand that it's all one and the same thing. Um, so you can have some assurances there. Uh, some key points about the Arms Act for you. It's about safe use and possession of firearms. And there's a key principle in New Zealand, and this is actually a principle within the Act, is that it is a privilege and not a right to use a firearm in New Zealand. So sometimes out of the community we get, um, or some parts of the community, maybe it's a tone about it being a right. It's not. As a regulated entity, once they have a licence, it is a privilege, and it's a privilege that is subject to regulation. Uh, and a key thing about the Act is it defines what sort of a person um, it, uh, it, it, the, it is to be a regulated member of the community and the term is called the fit and proper and in the act it's actually quite an extensive um, list of things uh, when someone applies for a license or when they're applying to renew their license um, they have to let us know who their health practitioner is and what will happen is in due course you'll get a routine notification from us that someone is applying for or renewing your firearms license, so that can then um, be noted on your records and that you're aware of it. And um, what we find is that for the bulk of people, for the bulk of the licensed community, it's um, not a big thing and often you won't hear from us. However, we may liaise with you if your patient or your client has come to our attention regarding their fit and proper status. And this may be for reasons that you might not know about. And um, there may be, you know, uh, a reason why we need to talk. It may have, um, you know, been for something, it could have been a sudden um, mental health episode for something or for some reason or something like that that perhaps you weren't aware of because it was an acute um, sort of episode, but then we need, we maybe we need to talk. And um, so you may hear from us occasionally about something that went on that maybe have has a medical dimension to it that you weren't immediately aware of. Um, so key points for yourself, so you do have an obligation under the Act um, to consider notifying us if you've got concern related to your patient's suitability to hold a firearms licence or have access uh, to firearms. So um, that's a big one, but it's important to know that there is a good faith protection about these notifications under the Act um, for those registered with the Medical Council or the, uh, the Nursing Council. and. Um, if you had any doubt about what to do first, um, you could liaise with the Medical Council or the Royal College of New Zealand General Practitioners around guidelines around doing that. Um, it's what I've found from personal experience, it's more often than not that we're reaching out to you to talk about issues. Um, and in terms of those issues that you may raise, um, any question about whether this person um, is uh, fit and proper and should you know, continue to hold their license or perhaps there is an issue around looking to suspend or revoke their license or further conditions on their license, that actually rests with the police. Um, so it doesn't actually rest on you, it's not on your shoulders. So there, there may be occasions where we're seeking a medical opinion, but it's a decision, it's something that the New Zealand police has to stand up and own in terms of making decisions and, and looking at addressing that. And I think in the past, and what I found when I was running the Auckland offices, that some of our staff would go, oh, I've got a medical cert, it means that I could do this. And that perhaps they would tap out of working through um, exactly where we were at with this person. And, um, you know, certainly that's not the case anymore. So um, it's really having an assurance that that is the case. And if you felt there was a situation where you were being unfairly asked to almost make the decision, then, you know, I would suggest, you know, either elevating it or, or talking and seeking help and we can work that one out because it is something that we have to own and perhaps historically we haven't. So yeah, just a couple of key points. Look, you know, um, if you have a look at the Act that says, you know, um, you've got to consider notifying us, 
Um, and that would be, I'd, I'd suggest probably through the website or a call to the local office. Um, there is good faith protection about those disclosures um, and it's written into the Arms Act. Um, and if in doubt, obviously seek advice and we're um, you know, building guidelines through the college and that, that fit and proper determination about their licence rests with us and nobody else. I do want to acknowledge that with um, rural GPs in particular, it can be a bit harder because you may know these people in the community as well and uh, you're in quite a tough spot. So, um, you know, I, I, I appreciate on occasion that's a, a tough job to do. Yeah, where to go? Um, so um, definitely to our police website and part of our uplift that we're doing at the moment is making that website better and more usable, but there is a section in there for health practitioners that you can go to. And then of course, there's the legislation. You, know, you can have a look at these things yourself. Um, through the Community Health um, pathway team, Pathways team. I understand if you're doing a search on that, don't look for gun, look for firearm. Um, if that goes into the search engine, that will take you to some advice as I understand it. And of course, you know, through the Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners, who I know at a higher level, um, are doing some work around guidelines and that relationship with us. Um, so look, it's a very, very <laughs> broad topic, very, very quick. I hope there's a couple of key points there. Um, I know that we don't have time for any questions, so thanks for listening um, and thanks in advance for playing your role in making sure um, that our country is just safe for one patient at a time um, in terms of their, you know, um, their privilege to hold a licence and in terms of um, just making society a bit better uh, bit by bit. Um, Matt, there are a couple of questions if you're happy to answer them. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, so the first comment is that as a general practitioner, we're often not informed that a patient has a gun license. So it's tricky to know when to contact authorities. So that's an, more a comment than a, than a question. Um, the next one is around, oh, this is quite a long one actually, bear with me. Um, the comment from Richard, the legislation is fraught for doctors. We've had a case where a patient nominated a GP in the practice to complete the report, even though he'd never consulted that GP. This was then completed by an appropriate doctor who recorded concerns of multiple instances of mood disorders. The license withdraw was withdrawn. Um, the patient then complained. So... Uh, this, took, this took 20 hours of clinician time, which was not um, paid. So it is a complex issue, isn't it? And um, yeah, any comments on that? Um, so I'm just, yeah, just looking at it, putting the doctor at risk from retribution, potentially. Mm. To be dispute the clinical records and request a correction. Yeah, yeah. Um, Fraught. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it is a tough thing, isn't it? Um, so I, I don't really know what to say about that because, of course, if someone gets a bit, um, you know, they're looking to litigate um, or they're looking to contest something, you know, there is this role of, you know, natural justice where they've got the right to be heard independently of, um, you know, of, of the police decision in the court. The other thing, too, is that the commissioner of police if they receive a um, an opinion from a medical can practitioner can seek an independent separate um, medical opinion as well and I don't know if that happened in this case but sometimes taking that away so you know it breaks the you, you know it breaks that fixation on the fact that it was just this one doctor and actually we've got something independent here but as I say within the community and our license holders there are some people and there's been a long history of this who just simply think it is their right to have a firearms license. But the key thing is, of course, is that um, the firearms are confiscated, so they don't have access to them. You know, and I know that's probably a small comfort, but that is a key thing, and it is very, very tough. And um, yeah, you know, acknowledging that that's 20 hours of time that could have been spent on something else too. Um, yeah, that's yeah. And then just a comment about depression in people who have their firearms licenses. No, I mean, it would make sense to me that if somebody has a stable mental health condition that perhaps they can have their firearms license, that shouldn't be something for um, to be a contraindication to having a firearms license. Yeah, uh, I have two patients recently talk about police removing people's licenses and firearms simply because they're known to. Yeah, I find often that what I've found is that if there is, if we have not been called independently, so like if someone is depressed and they threaten to kill themselves, 
and we get called and perhaps we have to intervene under the you know our emergency powers under the mental health act and there is a um ongoing issue of depression that is being treated that then you're starting to look at grounds as to you know is it safe for this person to have their firearms license but if someone has depression and they um you know, it's been treated and they're stable and we're not seeing those episodes independent of the fact that they've got a condition that they've been treated then we're more likely than not um to not um to t take the license from someone just because they've de got depression it's not an automatic disqualifier and um within the last year what we've done is we've centralized um our team of people who make decisions around this so previously what we had is you know 12 policing districts around the country with varying staff with experience and varying you know um, skill levels making decisions all independently of one another so historically this might have been the case but certainly since march last year we've gotten a lot more centralized and consistent around that decision making process but um i have seen and i've been involved in decisions in the last year where people um, have been otherwise fit and proper yes they've got depression yes it's been disclosed um yes they're getting treated and they're stabled there is no problem with their fitness data proper um, proper status. So I think that one's evening itself out. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much for your informative um, and important talk, Matt. It's been really nice having you with us today. Yeah, really thanks. appreciate your time. Do I have time for one more comment? Sure. Sure. Just I see, Rebecca, you're talking about um, driver's licenses and firearms. Yes, that's likely where you're going to hear from us for a conversation. But the point you raise is, yes, right, we would have a chat. Um, if they can't drive, should they have a firearms license or would they look to surrender it? But yeah, but thank you very much. Sorry, I know I could talk all day and I'd love to chew the fat, but 10 minutes. So thank you very much for listening and uh, go well, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us today. It's been an excellent um, day and there's been some excellent practice changing tips and I hope everyone's got a greater awareness of their health pathways. I'd like to just acknowledge our uh, sponsors, the Auckland Regional Health Pathways, Counties Manukau District Health Board, the Auckland Faculty of the Royal New Zealand College and the Goodfellow Unit. Also to Sue and Indigo who helped me work on the programme. The recording of today will be available uh, later in the week and I'd like to thank you for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Namahi and good afternoon.